I'm saying it. Saying it. Saying it. What's going on, everybody? I hope everyone's having a fantastic evening, a fantastic afternoon, fantastic pre-noon, no matter where you are in the world. I'm Hassan Piker. This is the Hassan Broadcast coming to you live from sunny California, Los Angeles, folks. We're live and alive, and I hope all the boys, I hope all the girls, and I hope all the MBs are having a fantastic one. Uh, you said America deserves that. Because today's a beautiful day. Today's a wonderful day. Today is Thursday, folks. Thirsty Thursday, January 11th, 2024. And I am a little late, and I honestly don't really have a good excuse. Uh, and I apologize. But today is a, a beautiful day. Today is uh, uh, Genocide Court Case Day. That's right. That is right. And, of course, we're going to be talking about that quite a bit later on in the broadcast. But before I get to that... This is the part of the broadcast where I tell you a little bit about my personal news. By the way, South Africa on top. Shout out to Little Bear. Shout out to all the South Africans out there. Okay. Sudafrica, mate. I mean, it's like, it's like a lot of people think that I don't do a South African accent because, like, I can't. But it's because I don't do a South African accent because I won't out of respect. And then you might say, well, what about the Irish? And then to that, I have no answer. Okay, I think in honor of the ICJ court case of Israel doing genocide against Palestinians brought to the International Court of Justice by South African government, I have to learn how to do a South African accent, like almost as good as the Irish one, which everyone agrees is very good. Hey, my friend, I think he's becoming an anti-Semite because of the tunnels, and I think he's believing the Twitter post about them being child trafficking. What do I do? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's so bad. Oh my God! It's a classic, classic Elon Musk Twitter moment. Um, what do you do, honestly? I, I mean, just talk to them about how that's ridiculous. Like, I mean, first and foremost, like, sure, the the uh, Hasidic Jewish community does like very weird stuff. Like, but that's just a, a small subsect of the religion. Like, the overwhelming majority of the religion is like. The overwhelming majority of the Jewish religion is is not only like nowhere near as fundamentalist, but like straight up just either secular or reformed in, in general. So, yeah. One of my friends too, but he's dumb as fuck and he doesn't understand words. That's crazy. Um, that's not good. I feel like if you're dumb and don't understand words, it's going to be difficult to change your mind, right? Like, I don't know. But, um, anyway, this is the part of the broadcast where I tell you a little bit about my personal news on what's going on in my life, okay? Oh, what's happening in the world of Hassan, Hassan, I'm Parker, dude. Kaya and Tarek? Yeah, that's tomorrow. Anyway, Taylor Swift, PSYOP? Yeah, we're going to cover that. 
Don't you worry about a thing, baby. We got that Jesse Waters, Taylor Swift, PSYOP story locked down. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, as far as personal news goes, I haven't been doing much. Um, I have not been doing much in my life, in my world, in the world of Hassan Hassan Piker. Um, just a lot of uh, Better Call Saul watching. What did I do last night? Uh, it's because it's I stream late. It's because I stream late. That's the problem. Um, when I stream late, no Discord notification? I don't know. Whenever people say that, there usually is a Discord notification. You just haven't heard it. Anyway, did the YouTube vlog get taken down? I didn't see it earlier. Yeah, it did. Um, yeah, that debate was so bad. Yeah, I'll say it like this. I did, uh, I did a YouTube multicast last night for the first time ever. A simulcast. As just simply, like, uh, a way of trying it out. As a way of testing it out. But it was... On perhaps the worst thing that I could have simulcasted, the debate, because that debate was so awful. And I feel like it gave me psychic damage. And honestly, the psychic damage that I got from that debate has basically continued to this day. Like, I feel not all there. I feel tired. I went to bed at around 1130, so I shouldn't have... Didn't you also get banned for it? No, I did not. The return on investment on the content was poor. Yeah, I, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll, I guess, like, a couple things to say about that. Um, as far as the simulcasting goes, as far as simulcasting goes, is it worth it on YouTube? I don't know. There's definitely advantages. There's definitely advantages to the YouTube, uh, uh simulcasting. But, like, what I'm primarily looking for in this process is, of course... What I'm primarily looking for in this process is a way to draw more traffic to my Twitch stream. I want to draw traffic to my Twitch stream. That's my goal, right? And I don't think when I do it on YouTube, it does that. And for the most part, I think that uh, the people that were, I mean, the people that were watching on YouTube were just the Twitch streamers. Because like, as soon as it ended... As soon as it ended, like, the Twitch viewers, uh, went down. It went down to 10k by the end of the debate. While the YouTube debate stayed at, like, 22k the entire time, pretty much. The YouTube stream did. And as soon as it ended, like, it immediately shot back up to, like, 15k. Because everybody was just, like, watching on YouTube for fun, I think. So, yeah, I don't know. How many were mobile viewers, too? You didn't exactly announce it. What do you expect? No, 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 I'm not. I'm... I'm not like complaining or anything. I, I don't know why you have a contentious attitude here. I was just simply describing what I, uh, what my experience was, you know? And, and yeah, I think it's pretty good for 20 K on YouTube out of nowhere. Unannounced is pretty solid. So yeah, apparently it also helped. I mean, I got 10, 10 K new subs. It seems, is that what someone in the chat just said? It helped on that front. It seems like, so yeah, like subscribers on youtube are followers for those of you on twitch that somehow don't know that i don't know if how you would not know that but there's also the fact that you didn't tell people to go to your youtube and your twitch stream title people had to find out by coming to chat asking where the audio or is a pin message etc yes because i didn't want to push the audience or i didn't want to push the traffic to youtube i wanted the youtube traffic to come back to twitch but of course when i'm simulcasting and there's more more of a value add on youtube that's going to end up causing people to go watch my youtube instead so um it's not like the best experiment i would say right so yeah can i have the ad revenue for yesterday please pretty please this is such a funny question because like i think a lot of people don't understand that most of my youtube is just afloat with money i have that i make off of twitch like i, I a lot of people think that like the, my youtube is like a profoundly um, you know, successful money-making operation. And that is certainly not the case. I'm, um, I'm routinely demonetized. Uh, it's, uh, it's not great. So yeah, especially because Twitch was muted. Yeah, no, it wasn't, it wasn't the best. It, it was not like the best. If, if my goal was to drive traffic to Twitch, which it is, my goal always is to drive traffic to my Twitch channel. That's why I don't mind having the YouTube ha Hasanabe industrial com uh, complex operate. So, um, in any case, in any case, regardless, um, 
the, your whole vlog got taken down from YouTube when I was mid watch lol. Yeah, I know. Um, that's that's uh, easy. You just contest it, uh, and and like it's it's still technically considered like it's under fair use uh, boundaries as far as I understand it. They just don't care like that much. They just hit it regardless. Um, hold on, hold on for it being. Ludwig is literally texting me about this too. Um, I found an industrial complex channel over two years ago and it funneled me into Twitch and I never knew it was. Yeah, exactly. That's my goal. My goal is always to, to bring that in. Also, congratulations to Will Neff for his uh, hot sauce release. My boy, he did it. He sold the damn thing. He sold the damn thing in under five minutes. Cool. It's sold out! Five minutes! Also... I think uh, this used to be a video game platform, and I'm sick and tired. Let me tell you something. I'm sick and tired of these goddamn e-thoughts on my video game platform, okay, shaking their booty. There is nothing that I hate more than seeing this kind of man ass. I'm sick and tired of it, okay? Twitch needs to take action. Twitch needs to take action and initiative against these goddamn e-thoughts, okay? These goddamn e-thoughts are out of control. But yeah, no, the sauce is really good, obviously, uh, as you guys know. Um, and and I'm, I'm very happy for him. I'm, I'm very excited that my man is, is doing incredible things. If you got banned, would your fan channels get banned? Um, what? Banned on YouTube, you mean? I don't think so. I don't mind it. You could do some of this too, Hassan. Have you said of being a hater, lol? Yeah. So, you do know yesterday she was breaking TOS since for simulcasting both platforms supposed to have the same experience so that there isn't funneling. Dude, this is my favorite type of person. The guy who, like, comes in here and is, like, what, defending Twitch terms of service or something? And it's like, I, I don't understand it. Like, don't worry, dog. Let me do me. Okay, you do you. If you would like to, you can go and, like, take it up with the authorities, I guess. But, like, I, I don't understand why you're, like, why you're for free, pro bono, like, defending what you think is the concept of a Twitch Terms of Service. I was just asking, sorry. Okay, well, then don't ask like that. I mean, I, well, you said you do know yesterday stream was breaking TOS since simulcasting for both platforms is supposed to have the same EXP so that there isn't funneling. And for the record... No, my goal is to simulcast to funnel it back to Twitch. That's how I started off. Simul People don't know this, but I started off simulcasting on Facebook. I had a big, I had a big audience on Facebook. It will give you a bottle of the hot sauce. Will, have, will has given me many bottles of the hot sauce. I've already finished two bottles of the hot sauce. So I started off uh, uh, streaming on Facebook, and I would like draw traffic back to to YouTube, right? And basically. What I ended up doing was the same. What I wanted to do was the same. I, I had streamed on YouTube before. I'd live streamed on YouTube before. Like I, I started live streaming on Twitch or like around the same time just to, you know, uh, see what was what. But overall, I, I, um, I think like YouTube live streaming has its benefits, I guess, from an audience perspective, but it certainly has a lot of, it certainly has a lot of negatives. I think it has more negatives on the streamer side. It's just harder to control. It's harder to moderate. It's just simply worse, uh, uh, worse user experience for uh, the content creator overall. Um, what time is Jeremy Scahill coming on for us commuting chatters? Yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, Jeremy Scahill uh, is a legendary investigative reporter, one of the goats, like um, up there with, um, let's say if Glenn Greenwald never, like, Let's say if Glenn Greenwald just retired in like 2000, when would it be? Like 2016, right? Co-founder of The Intercept. Um, like Jeremy Scahill is, is like if Glenn Greenwald retired in 2016, except he didn't retire and he's still awesome. Uh, and I love him and we are going to, uh, we are going to have him uh, on. Actually, I guess uh, Greenwald still has some good reporting after 2016, to be fair. He did the car war stuff, too. His team was pretty good on that. Uh, credit words, do Glenn has done good work on Israel? Yeah, brother, but, like, you know. So, YouTube live stream pros and cons. Pro, myth, con, Ludwig. <laughs> Agreed. Um, overall, 
We'll see. I'll keep doing more uh, tests like this. I think the the utility that I see, because considering my goal o- always is to just like draw traffic back to my Twitch stream, like unconditionally. That's my major goal. I think it was relatively successful at the end of the YouTube live stream when the Twitch stream traffic doubled immediately. It went from like uh, 10K or not doubled, but like it went from 10K to 15K like that as soon as the YouTube live stream ended. Now that could be because that many people went from Twitch to YouTube to watch it on YouTube because they wanted to see the full debate. Or it could be because, uh, you know, that, like all those people that went to YouTube came back to Twitch, but then also some new people from YouTube came back. Um, But yeah, overall... Brother, answer the question. 1 p.m. Jeremy Scahill will be coming on 1 p.m. Pacific. 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, If people are watching on mobile, then they have to switch between the two and watching one pauses the other. Yeah, that's true. Please through chatter. I mean, they're right. Um, Jeremy Scahill also is the host of the uh, my one of my favorite podcasts, Intercepted. Um, You need to do the inverse of last night where YouTube is muted, but on Twitch, you're live reacting to the new Cardi album. Yeah, something like that could work. Um, Anyway, regardless. Uh, you know, I tried, uh, and overall, I don't know if it's worth the hassle. I don't really, um, I mean, I care about my YouTube page, obviously it's, it's good to have a, a a broad array, a diverse, uh, uh, you know, it's good to be on every platform and it's good to be successful on every platform because it feeds into like, uh, overall having, uh, you know, having your message be heard by more people. There's also the bigger, the number, better, the person, the better person type uh, attitude online and everywhere else. So like, obviously that factors into it too. It gives you more legitimacy. People are like, oh yeah, a lot more people watch him. So I agree. I know we all hate Jason Whitlock and he got last night. Timestamp 33.20 for the best bit. Oh no, I'm going to do the Jason Whitlock coverage too. Don't worry. Um, I've been excited for this. Um, not the biggest, not the biggest fan of, of um, what's his face. Uh, uh, Stephen A. Smith. But, but having said that, he torched, he ethered Jason Whitlock. Uh, Jason Whitlock, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a Candace Owens-style person. He is a, uh, I guess, kind of a sports commentator, but like more so he's just known as like the black guy that will say the most unhinged white supremacist things on Fox News. So that's like... Yeah, he's on the failed in his own individual uh, pipeline and media and then immediately turned heel and like slowly but surely or maybe organically became more and more reactionary guy. So that's right. Let's do it. All right. Let me blast off real quick. Um, Let me blast off real quick. Uh, In 30 seconds, explain what the fuck Fetterman is saying about white farmers of South Africa. Yeah, uh, I don't think he was like, who knows what he was saying? Who knows what he was saying? Uh just just saying stuff um okay icj genocide case against israel uh, jeremy scahill taylor swift fox news claims taylor swift government psy op icj case trump town hall the disastrous CNN GOP debate and more. Okay, so yeah, the ICJ stuff is like if you were to take, um, oh yeah, Trump civil court case too. That's another one. Trump town hall, Trump civil case. Kind of an ah word how little the U.S. media covered the ICJ trial hearings today. Didn't say shit. Um, they're covering it a little bit, but. The reality of the matter is, chat. Of course, they're not gonna. Of course, they're they're not gonna cover it that much. Um, did you watch Lady Ballers? Don't. It wasn't fun. Bad. Just so boring. That is what I've heard. That's what I've heard for the most part. Um. So yeah, let's get started. Do we have a good blast off meme for this? Do we have a blast off meme that's not tunnel related? Idea of losing in Gaza. I mean, they're losing in the same way that you know, a colonial occupier would lose in the sense that, you know, um, this is a classic uh, resistance technique, which is for every, you kill 10 of our people, for every 10, we kill one of yours. 
you get tired first. It's the Ho Chi Minh strategy, right? Death of the death of an Israeli occupying force soldier has significantly larger consequences on Israel than the death of a Hamas militant has uh, as it pertains to uh, keeping up the resistance against the devastating occupying force that is Israel. So Palestinians have not really anywhere to go. We also don't have a single meme. What's going on, guys? No, not a single meme to, for the blast off? What's happening? Kind of shocking. I'm shocked to the core, chat. Some conservative podcast here brought you up to Hunter Biden outside the Capitol. Wait, what? Is this a poop sock? What is this? Oh, God damn it. Apex Twizzy. You deserve it. You deserve this. Uh, you deserve a day off. Take a day off. You've been, you've been testing my patience nonstop. I should have never clicked on your link. I didn't even realize what your username was, and I accidentally clicked on your link. I should not have done that, and I should have just continued. I should have maintained my composure. Now you take a day off for this reason. Do we have a good meme to blast off with or not? That's the question. I don't know what this uh, One Piece related edit is, but oh, I guess this is cute. This is cute. Hey, Tony Chopper, which uh, is web the the way that like certain images online don't let you don't let you save it, and then you just have to go and and then you have to go and like screenshot it, and then the screenshotting process on MacBooks are just like significantly better. IDF is taking L's, but the Goon Scott is taking W's. Oh, dude. Yeah, I know. Big day. Um, big day today. Here, let me blast off real good. Let me blast off real good. Okay. Let me blast off so hard. The IDF uh, Coom Squad, the IDF Goon Squad is up my ass trying to extract semen from my cadaver through a, in their words, cavity. That's right. Everything I just said, you might think is gross to bring up and say. However... It actually is the case. It's what they're doing. Not even a joke. I wish it was a joke. It's not a joke. I promise you, it's crazy. Here it is. Here it is, folks. Fox News claims Taylor Swift government psyop. ICJ genocide case against Israel with Jeremy Scahill. Trump town hall. Trump civil case. The disastrous CNN GOP debate and more. Get in now. This is the blast off. Let's get started. Oh, the ratings are in. Oh, very excited to see this. Let's see if I was right. Fox News' town hall with Trump averaged 4.3 million views between 9 and 10 p.m. last night. CNN's debate with the same and Haley averaged 2.5 million in the same hour. Both totals would be higher when repeats and streams are counted, but Trump is the clear victor. I told you. Oh, God. It does, it, this is one of those cases where, like, it does feel good to be right because it's not, like, one of those, like, super high-stakes moments. Okay? But I told you. Also, overall, disastrous. This is a disastrous performance for debates in general, I suspect. Anyway, what a phenomenal disaster. What an absolute, absolutely just unimaginable disaster of epic proportions. You need to adjust for average viewership, though? Absolutely not. <coughs> Here's why. Okay? Here's why this is an unimaginably disastrous. Hey, but it's not quite 2x the number of viewers. Everything's coming up liberalism. What do you mean? You should consider having some guests for the next simulcast. I feel like that could help out somewhat. Maybe. San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted call for a ceasefire. People are downplaying it, but I don't know. It's still a significant sentiment. Yeah. Um, sure, we'll talk about it. Of course, you write about insignificant things like this debate. Never write about stuff that actually matters, like Russia invading Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I told you overall what was going to happen. I told you that CNN is doing this content play. It seems CNN's desperate attempts at captivating, or it seems like CNN's desperate attempts at trying to capture a conservative audience is a massive failure at what cost. Definitely an analog here for the Democratic party and its consistent capitulation to right-wing sentiment desperate attempt at capturing right yeah it seems seen as desperate attempts at capturing a conservative audience a massive failure definitely an analog here for the democratic party and its consistent capitulation to right-wing sentiment 
I'm just saying, stop doing it. Be your own person. Be your own person, okay? Do your own goddamn thing. Um, Finkelstein believes the ICJ judges will ultimately vote according to the whims of their home country. American judge will be beholden the USA interest instead of voting impartially. Do you believe this is accurate? I mean, there's, I, I believe there's only one instance where that, I mean, not one instance, but like there has been an instance where the American judge has actually not voted with American interest in mind, but you know, it can go along like that. I think there could be a good reason why CNN did not offer any pushback. Trump fans are not watching. It's mostly liberals watching. CNN allowed them to show the worst of the Republican Party to scare liberals into voting for Joe Biden by showing how bad Republicans are. I disagree. I, I think that is like a level of copium that is a QAnon level almost. No, I think that CNN very openly and very actively is trying to, and, and they've said this already, uh, tailor their content towards a more conservative audience in mind. I think that they are hemorrhaging viewership like every news outlet that covers the news and does politics, myself included. Um, that's obviously partially because, you know, news and politics is nowhere near as interesting for many people. I think the fact that I have been able to maintain any audience, uh, any audience whatsoever, especially in the demographics that I normally uh, retain viewership in is a profound achievement overall considering that like CNN is having a hard time and they capture the audience that cares about the news right I talk to the 18 to 35 year olds which is an audience that doesn't really care about the news overall this is not an audience that is really in tune with what's going on in the world so the fact that there's still like plenty of people in here interested is legitimately uh in my opinion a, a a profound success overall we planning on talking about trump's new york court appearance yes we are um spelling mistake in your tweet oh i don't care whatever yeah i said disastrous but with an e when there's no e there okay um democracy now is picking up a bit of traction in viewership recently yeah but that's i mean that's neither here nor there right that's not like a that's that's a blip on the radar. So, um, what was I saying? Where was I? <sighs> Seems like Fox is definitely targeting their focus toward a younger demographic these days. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> a younger demographic, so what? Instead of 85-year-olds, they're looking for, uh, what, 80-year-olds? Give news. Whether in politics, I'm here. Talk about drama online or your personal crap you lost. <laughs> Thank you, the diggy man. Ironic, because if I was talking about drama and online stuff more frequently, I would most likely have uh, a, a much larger audience. That's what most people online care about rather than the real news. I try to balance it as best as I can. So anyway, regardless, Kimstar Arc when? Yes, I do know. For the record, let me answer your question, Kendall. Does bro know his notification caption is still like this from January 6th? Or are we just doing an insurrection every day? The answer is, yes, I am familiar. I mean, that chatter only was talking about themselves and not about other people. Plenty of regular chatters dip out the second this turns into drama. Okay, hit digital offliner. And plenty of new chatters coming. Everybody always thinks, like, when they tune out of the stream, Sean and his followers are actually just cowards. Well, when uh, plenty of people just, um, plenty of people think that, like, once they tune out of the stream, like, it's over, the stream ended. For everybody. It's it's done. Career ender. It's all good. All right. Where was I? Where was I? All right. Let's, uh, before I get to the ICJ stuff, obviously, uh, I'll start off with some, some light stuff here. Trump delivers remarks and closing arguments in a civil fraud trial, which of course led to, uh, his closing arguments actually being stopped by the judge because God damn it, folks, this is a banana Republic. Okay. Let me tell you. They do not want honest, brave, patriotic men to speak truth to power, okay? That's right. Some people, like Judge Engeron, are terrified, are terrified of the, of the honesty and bravery exhibited by someone like Donald Trump. Sis. This, of course, came after the, uh, the, the uh, closing argument, but I suspect this is what he wanted to say. He, he, he pulled a... He basically pulled a like a like a shower argument moment after. Now he didn't have to go to this civil case. He did not have to attend this uh, uh, case 
proceedings at all. He did it anyway. So what did he do? Well, um, his lawyer asks uh, for permission to have Trump speak. And Garan says, do you promise to just comment on the facts and the law? Trump doesn't even respond and immediately starts talking without agreeing to Judge Angeron's uh, question. He starts saying uh, this. I'm going to read it out to you. This is a political witch hunt. We should receive damages for what they have taken our company through. They have no documents. They have nothing. The only thing they have, Trump concedes, is the uh, triplex, which was a mistake. I'm not sure the dollar amount would have been that far off if you want to know. But, Trump con continues, I am an innocent man. I have been politically persecuted. This statute is vicious. What has happened here is a fraud on me. The amount of taxes I've paid over this period is close to $300 million. They don't want me here anymore. I have a problem. They want to make sure I don't run again. Trump goes on without any interruption from Angeron or her team and attacks James, Letitia James, accusing her of election interference, says... You have your own agenda. Trump angrily says to Angeron, you can't listen for more than one minute. And then Angeron, the judge, finally pleads with Mr. Uh, Kise, or Keys, I don't know how you say his last name, and says, please control your client. Trump nonetheless accuses Letitia James, the Attorney General, of going after him for political gain. Again, or not Attorney General, sorry, Letitia James is a DA, District Attorney, right? I think Letitia James is the, the district attorney of New York and not. Or no, she is the attorney general. She used to be a district attorney, and she is the attorney general now. Um, So, yeah, from the southern district of New York. All right, so, anyway. um, And then he, he says Letitia James is going after him for political gain, including an allegedly failed run for governor, at which point Angeron shuts it down. But it's too late. Everything Trump wanted to say was said. And now, having said it, he has left the courtroom after insisting James should pay him for the havoc she's wreaked on his company. So some of the uh, some of the the asks from prosecution are, I believe, three hundred and seventy million in damages for um, the the uh, false, like for the false representation of the property value in general. Uh, another ask, I think, is to permanently bar Trump from doing business in New York, and on top of that bar his children from also doing business in New York for at least five years. Those are, those are, the, those are the asks from, from uh, Letitia James. And considering how <laughs> unimaginably and ruthlessly brutal he has been to both the judge, who literally received, apparently, death threats and bomb threats before the final day where he was supposed to hear closing remarks from Trump supporters, I don't know what will happen. But what I do know is that's probably not a good thing, okay? I mean, I think unconditionally, across the board, bomb threats and death threats, not great, right? Like, and I'm not even talking, like, top of the hour bad. Like, top of the hour ad break, not great. Bomb threats, really not great, okay? Like, if Judge Angeron was watching a three-minute ad break at the top of the hour, I'm sure he'd feel some type of way unless he was subscribed, at which point he could avoid it. Bomb threats and death threats, on the other hand, definitely not good, okay? Especially when you're, like, a judge. Here's a three-minute ad break now. By the way, you can avoid it by subscribing for $5 or for free or by getting gifted a sub, Judge Angeron. So, that's so brave of you to say, yes, bomb threats are bad. Thank you. Okay, exactly. That's, you know, I... You come here for the brave takes. Anyway, let's hear from our brave boy, though. Before experts, and do I think any of it mattered? I certainly hope so. But for anybody that was been in the courtroom for the last 11 weeks, you heard that there was not one fact against President Trump. There was not one piece of paper that showed anyone committed fraud. And don't forget that Section 6312, a consumer fraud statute, has been wrongfully used against my client, innocent defendants, the organization and every employee of the Trump organization, which has single-handedly changed the New York skyline, including the building we are in today. Yes, this is uh, the person speaking right now is Alina Habba, uh, also known as the gamer lawyer. These are special properties. Real estate is an art, not a science. <laughs> That's awesome. She's great. I'm, uh, you know, when I hear stuff like that, I understand why Trump uh, selected her to be the, the trial lawyer here. But you know what else is an art? 
You know what else isn't a science? Political motivated individuals. She's using this to paint a canvas. Awesome. That Donald Trump is a fraudster because they can't beat him in the polls. They can't beat him in the polls, so she ran on Trump because that was the only way she could win. And now today, after 11 weeks, after three years, we have concluded that he indeed committed no wrong. The Trump Organization committed no wrong, and the kids have been dragged in just like the other defendants, and it is wrong. The kids. I love thinking about, like, uh, Trump's sons as just the kids. Let's see. Trump, sons, age, ages. Yeah, it's like, yeah, look at this, dude. You got, you got one that's 40 years old and the other that's 46. She's not talking about Baron Trump, who's 17. She's talking about, she's talking about the other two fail sons. Not Baron. Baron uh, must be protected. He's like 6'8". He's going to be a baller. He's the next, uh, he's the next out. Okay. He's going to five-star camp. That's the, that's the next uh, Jokic. Okay. That's the next Joker. So um, the idea that uh, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump are just kids is pretty awesome. America needs to step up, and there's only one person who can do that. My client, Donald Trump. President Trump, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've gone through years with uh, this person. She's a political hack, the attorney general. Uh, the judge is obviously extremely friendly with the group. Why'd you and call her the uh, gamer? Because she games. She has a gaming laptop. Uh, may surprise people on a positive side. We'll have to see what happens exactly. But uh, we've proven this case so conclusively. Uh, we've asked for directed verdict many times. Uh, they don't have any facts. They don't have any evidence against us. Millions and millions of pages, years of... Do they think they can just uh, talk their way out of all these charges? I actually don't understand. What is this? When the world thinks you're a gamer because the court's live transcript feed computer is placed in front of you? Wait. Trump's lawyer sports gamer laptop at $250. Wait. No, she's not a gamer? That's... I love how trashy she is. I would risk it all. Yeah, she that makes me sad. All right. Um, I mean, it's a big benefit for her, to be fair, because it's like, I, I will admit, when I thought she was a League of Legends player, that made me think less of her. Not the fact that she's Donald Trump's, like, probably worst lawyer, but the fact that she, I even, the fact that we even speculate that she may be playing League is, like, definitely a way worse mark on her. Um, so... Anyway, getting back to the matter at hand here, though, uh, there was you asked like, oh, do do you think he? They think that they're going to talk themselves out of these charges, and I actually don't really know how rich people operate in this circumstance. I like Alex Jones defamation suit, right? Alex Jones's defamation suit led him to, uh, uh, you know, have to pay like a billion dollars. And, and he's still in operation, and it seems like he's still doing it. And and it's the same for, like, Donald Trump. Like, I don't know if he has a lot of money. I don't know if he has, like, a you know, I, I don't know how many billions he actually does have, right? So, like, what's he thinking? He's just going to give 300 He's going to make this payment? I guess he'll, like, hold it up in courts um, with appeals for as many years as he possibly can, Right. Hassan, you are rich. Stop LARPing as a socialist. Sarcasm. Yes. Um, yeah, I am. I mean, I don't know how rich Trump is. I might be just as rich as he is, to be to be honest. But that's not necessarily because I'm super caked up. It's just he's a broke boy is my suspicion. So I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know why they do this kind of stuff. Like, they get, they get involved in uh, these legal battles. And then they just get these massive trial awards, right? And it doesn't make any sense, like, what the goal is, what the momentum is, how you deal with it after the fact, what the repercussions are if you don't actually pay, or what the payouts look like by the end of this process when you do actually pay it uh, off or you're forced to pay it off many, many years in the future. I don't know. I mean, these guys are... Like, the second defamation suit for E. Jean Carroll was was one of those questions I had like it was was why it's so easy to just not defame this person immediately after you lost the defamation suit which Trump did he went on CNN and he defamed the person who he had recently lost a defamation suit to in the exact same way and for me like I don't know what the purpose of that is like do you 
is there is it worth it? Is it worth it? Like, or does he think he's just gonna get away with it? I don't really understand that at all. And I don't understand this at all either. I mean, I get it. This for him, this is like a three hundred and seventy million dollar penalty that he is going to use as yet another as uh, yet another instance of like political persecution. He's being attacked. He's being attacked for his uh, political beliefs. That's what he is using this for. He's using this as another stepping stone or a, a soapbox moment, I guess. Like, look at me. The, the elites are coming after me. And they're not just coming after me. They're coming after you. I'm just in the way, right? That sort of thing. So I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't really know what his goals are here. Litigation and all politically motivated. She campaigned on a, I will get Trump. If you've ever seen any of the, uh, seen any of her clips, they're horrible clips, actually, the anger. She's got serious Trump derangement syndrome. There's no question about Letitia James, the corrupt attorney general of New York. So we've proven our case. There's not one witness against us other than one person who is a, a deranged. He's got a lot of problems. He's a man who's uh, been convicted of lying. He's a felon, convicted felon, and uh, not a good person. Seems like his goals are to be president. Yes, I think that his goals are to be president no matter what uh, the cost. And partially because, you know, I, I think he seriously thinks that he might get legal repercussions if he doesn't make it. If he doesn't make it out the mud, he's worried. If he doesn't become the Republican Party's candidate, or if he doesn't actually, um, if he doesn't actually take it to the general, and if he doesn't have the, the base of support and the institutional powers within the Republican Party and all of its organs, all of its instruments, like Fox News and like all of those think tanks, come to defend him, he might get cooked. Or at least he thinks he's going to get cooked, you know? Because, like, normal presidents, what do they do? They go in, they're out, uh, they're in and out, they do the president thing, okay? They do a bunch of war crimes, and then what do they do? They retire, and they go hang out with billionaires like Richard Branson, and they do podcasts, and they do Netflix specials. I'm talking about Obama, obviously. Like, Trump is not interested in any of that, right? Like, <laughs> or, or Jeffrey Epstein with Bill Clinton. They paint like George W. Bush. Overall, they just kind of chill out. They write books. They make a couple million dollars doing speaking tours here and there, speaking engagements. Trump, on the other hand, is... Brother, you've been saying this is the day he will face legal repercussions for years now. You sure this time? Um, my friend, if you think I've been saying this is the day he will face legal repercussions and not just he thinks he's going to face legal repercussions, I think you've gravely misunderstood what I'm saying. I've always maintained the position that he thinks he is going to. Just now, earlier, just, just a moment ago, I said, Trump thinks at the very least he is going to face legal repercussions, whether that is true or not. The idea that I'm one of these like blue anon style, this is surely going to get him now uh, type liberals is pretty funny. I like that. Person, but that's their only witness, and he's now crashed and burned. They have no witnesses. And by the way, that witness took back everything that he said. He took back everything he said in court, took it all back. So they have no case. It's a shame that a thing like this is able to happen. Uh, businesses leave New York. Uh, she went after Exxon, and they decided to move to Texas. And uh, hundreds of millions of dollars they pay in taxes. I paid over $300 million of taxes over the last number of years. $300 million, And uh, they don't recognize that. They don't recognize anything. So not it's think of up. it. Not one witness. Millions of pages of document. Years of this nonsense, and now it goes on. And one other factor, we won this case already in the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals voted in favor of us. But this judge has been very, very slow to accept that opinion, because that's not the opinion that he wants. But we won in the Court of Appeals. That's the boss of this judge. He has to know that. And it was a conclusive victory, statute of limitations and other things. And that case has already been won. So. That's the story, and I thought we'd come down to 40 Wall Street, which is a great building, and you'd get a chance to see one of the nicest buildings in New York and a convenient place, and I don't have to pay any rent because we have it, and it's been a very successful building. But it's a shame to 
have to have gone through this for years and years and years. And now we'll see if we're going to get an honest verdict. We didn't have a jury. We had no rights to a jury. It's a statute that's never been used before for a purpose like this. I just watched a certain broadcast, and they said, you know, they've been looking. Has it ever been used before? This is a statute that's a consumer fraud statute, never been used for anything like this before. And it's a shame. It's, uh, it's really a, uh, it's a witch hunt in the truest sense of the word. It's election interference. And uh, it just came out. I, this was just. Yeah, dude, it's like, I mean, it, it's pretty funny to consider everything election interference. Like, if you, if you are caught doing a crime or something, right? If you've, like, defrauded people, right? All you need to do is run for president. And then you could just say, they're coming after me because I'm running for president. And there's probably enough people, as long as you have the dumbest ideas of all time, there's going to be enough simps and stands on whichever respective stand Twitter space that you were occupying that will believe you and go, no, that's right, actually. It's awesome. Just right now, Letitia James visited Joe Biden in the White House numerous times during the Trump witch hunt. And this just came out about once you're over the age of 35, you should just do that all the time. Just do crimes and then run for president. Ten minutes ago, I got it. And so it's all it's all a conspiracy to try and get Biden, who can't put two sentences together, trying to get him into office. So I just want to let you know that uh, we have our best poll numbers. We have the best everything despite this and maybe because of this, because the people of the United States, all of those people back there, but the people of the United States really get it. They get it better than anybody else. Yeah, please. I have to pee. That you should not please. Be could not be for guilty of sex to kill a political. Well, you're talking about a totally different case, the immunity. I say this, on immunity, very simple. If a president of the United States does not have immunity, he'll be totally ineffective because he won't be able to do anything because it will mean he'll be prosecuted, strongly prosecuted perhaps, uh, as soon as he leaves office by his by the opposing party. So a president of the United States, I'm not talking just me, I'm talking any president has to have immunity. As an example, Biden could come out and you could get him on the border, you could get him on what happened in Afghanistan, a horrible, most embarrassing moment in the history of this country. You could get him on a lot of different things. You could get him at taking cash from countries. You could get him on the prosecutor, not prosecuting his son or the company or whoever it was, Burisma, uh, in, in Ukraine. You could get him on that, uh, where he, it was a quid pro quo, if you remember that. Uh, if they don't drop the prosecutor, we're not giving him a billion dollars of U.S. funds. Uh, if you don't have immunity, you can, you know, I mean, you won't be making any decisions. So you have to have it. And I like it to the, fa the fact that uh, police have to have their control back. They have to have respect. And you can always have a bad apple. You can always have something happen. This is my favorite type of argument for crime and policing in America is that because they quite literally have everything that they possibly could get, because cops, as I jokingly say all the time, live in like a Nordic-style social democracy while the rest of us are not in that at all. You know what I mean? I mean, unless you're like, a, you know, uh, unless you've reached like the top 1% of wealth when you're functionally a god king, and um, I know this, obviously you're going to be like, says you, but, you know, yeah, exactly. Uh, you're in the United States of America, if you're like working a regular wage job, okay, you don't have any of the amenities, right? You don't have any of the labor protections. Whereas, you know, if you're a cop, you, it, it's like, it's as though if you are like a steel mill worker in Germany, right? You get the health care, you get the pension, you get job security, you get all of that. So because they have all of that and then some with qualified immunity offering them so much protection uh, to be above the law, you finally arrive at a position where if you want to say like, what can we do to improve cops, uh, you know, living conditions or, or uh, job conditions, you basically have to say they don't get enough respect from the American population. Because when you talk about nurses or when you talk about any other real job, for example, when you talk about nurses, when you talk about teachers, when you talk about any number of real jobs, like there are so many obvious issues with that profession 
that you can point to that desperately needs fixing. Nurses are understaffed in hospitals deliberately by hospital administrators, right? Teachers are underfunded. They don't get paid enough. Uh, and, and the public school system is, is fundamentally broken. Uh, so it's like, you don't see teacher flags on the back of pickup trucks. No, my point is because they have, because cops have basically everything, because cops have basically everything they want, everything they need. The only thing that remains that they don't have in that situation is like the respect of the American population. So now you, that, they, that's what your complaint is. Like, oh, the police are not being respected enough. And it's like, well, how are you going to enforce that? What are you going to make it illegal to like, to say mean things about cops is now a hate crime or something? Like, it's just so dumb. But at the same time, you have to, you have to stop crime in this country. It's very much like that. It's very similar to that. But you have to have immunity for a president. Legally, you must compliment a that. cop. I've read a lot of legal reports lately and scholarly reports that are saying you really have to have a president of this country has to have immunity or they're not going to be able to function in office. Yeah, Bob? President Trump, who stays away from the Iowa, what percentage of your time these days is spent on your campaign? And what percentage is spent on your legal issues? Well, see, my legal issues, every one of them, everyone, civil, and the criminal ones are all set up by Joe Biden, crooked Joe Biden. This is something that's never happened in this country. Even when you look at this, this is all about Biden and her meeting. They're going to they're going to turn policing into a protected class and it'll be considered hate speech. No, it'll be the only hate speech. OK, the only time the only time hate speech is real is if you are criticizing a cop. OK, or the state of Israel, not Jews, the state of Israel. You can be anti-Semitic, and that's fine. That's not real hate speech. But if you criticize the state of Israel, that's hate speech. The two, the the real, the only two real hate speeches in the United States of America is criticism of the state of Israel and criticism of police officers. Okay, every other group, marginalized identity, you know, uh, ethnic background, none of that is, is is what constitutes for real hate speech. I mean, even Elon Musk is trying to do the cis is a slur thing, right? Yeah, he's trying to do the cis is a slur. The real hate speech is against white people, is against cisgender people, it's against cops, and it's against the state of Israel. So even the civil ones, this is civil, they're set up by Biden. Uh, every single just about case that I'm involved in is set up by Biden. They're doing it for election interference. And in a way, I guess you'd consider it part of the campaign, because if you really look at it, they are doing this. It's never been done like this in this country. It's like we're a third world country, a banana republic. But every one of the things that you write about are Biden indictments. And uh, I don't know, you know, I just when got a poll. We you, just had a poll. What do you what do you mean? Biden indictments? Poll. It just came out and we're leading massively in Iowa. We're leading very big in New Hampshire. We're leading because the people understand this stuff. These are all set up every time somebody sees me in court. Remember, Joe Biden and his thugs that surround him did it. They're trying to get a man in office that can't put two sentences together. And they're doing that. But so far, we seem to do very well. Hi, come here. Yeah, well, that's another one that's uh, sponsored by Reed Hoffman and some Democrat operatives. I never saw this woman in my life other than they have a picture with her and her husband. Uh, John Johnson, a nice guy who was a newscaster many years ago. I remember him, and she said horrible things about him uh, since. I mean, horrible, horrible things, called him bad names. Uh, I have no idea who this woman is. I have absolutely no idea. The whole thing is ridiculous that this is even a case. This should never have happened. But again, this is sponsored by the Democrats. That's another case. All sponsored by it's a demeaning kind of a thing, and that's what they want to do. It's called election interference. All right, please. And yeah, I'm going to go to it, and I'm going to explain. I don't know who the hell she is. I have no idea. They called me up years ago. Horrible. And they said, do you know about this woman 25 or 30 years ago? She doesn't even know the date, the time, the month, the season. She has no idea. And if you read it, if, if you watch, Take a look at the Anderson Cooper interview of her. And if you take a look at that, Trump is so innocent. But we have been given a very unfair trial there, too. I don't get very fair trials in New York. Have you made a decision about whether you're going 
going to just say you're going to show up yeah. when they begin, whenever they begin. Sure, the, the sure. Document sure. I, I would do that. Well, the documents case. I I'll be there no matter what. Biden, and he didn't have the Presidential Records Act, and I do. What I did, nothing wrong. What he did, a lot of people say substantially wrong. Uh, you can't have two tiers of justice in this country. But no, I want to go to all of my trials. These are all, again, these are all set up by Biden and the Democrats. This is, they are, this is. Big TD goth girl, thank you, thank you for the 10 gift of subs. This guy said man, woman, camera, child was a big achievement. It was perhaps the biggest achievement. Okay, Loki though, uh, looking at the state of affairs with respect to Brandon, it, it is technically kind of a big achievement, especially when you consider like whether or not Biden could do that currently. I'm just saying. Think about that. This is their new form of cheating. This is like last time. This is their new form of cheating. So far, I think it's gone very much against him. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, during the hearing, you said that you actually, uh, Exxon actually left. No, they took, they took the rest of their divisions out. Yeah. I mean, they were they left the earlier. The they were treated very badly in New York. You could have had them in New York. They could have been paying a lot of money. Uh, but it wasn't Letitia James. Oh, no, I think uh, if you take a look, you read the case, study the case, you'll see that they took big divisions out after that. They originally left, and then they took the rest out. You just said you're going to, you could get President Biden on various issues you outlined. I didn't say I could get him on anything. I said he is using the weaponization of the DOJ and the FBI to go after his political opponent, and you just can't do that. Thank, thank you very much. Coward. I'm just saying he said he was going to do that and then didn't, okay? Let's go. Which is like, can we give Kaya subs? Yes, of course. All of your gifted subs technically do go to Kaya anyway, regardless, because you know, that's what I spend my money on. Um, This is such a tired old argument. He keeps saying Biden is demented, mentally inept, but he's in the same sense saying Biden is, oh, Kaya! I said, place. Who's this? Better recognize. Why can't Biden do that if he has immunity? What do you mean? He said that Biden can be prosecuted because of border policy. So that's the, that's the thing. Nothing, nothing that Donald Trump says makes sense. Because on the one hand, he's saying as president, he should have immunity from crimes that he has committed. Meanwhile, all of his defenders said during the impeachment process, let the courts handle it. And then now that the court is trying to handle it, his lawyers are saying, no, he should still have immunity as president. While also, simultaneously, he's saying he should have immunity, but also Joe Biden is prosecutable as president. Because this is, ultimately, this is a, a, uh, a weird bind that people find themselves in. And if, they, if they're looking for, like, honesty or moral consistency here, you're not going to get that. There's no intellectual honesty here. It's just about self-preservation, okay? It, it's always... It's okay when I do it. It's not okay when anyone else that I don't like does it. That's the whole point. Nah, bro. He said if presidents don't have immunity, then Biden could be prosecuted for X, Y, Z. Yes, except he's also advocating for Biden to be prosecuted. That's the whole point. He's saying I should have immunity. If you don't give me immunity, then Biden could be prosecuted. And actually, as a matter of fact, Biden should be prosecuted. Do you not see how stupid that is? Like, think about that for a second. Just for one second. Now, of course, dude, of course, liberal academia won't agree with him. <laughs> yeah, liberal academia. Um, now, now, obviously, Kaya's collar might be on too tight. You are delusional, my friend. That's not the case at all. Her collar is literally so loose that it can come off. She's just fuzzy. She's a fluffy. I've talked about this quite a bit, and I guess, uh, you know, it bears repeating because there's always new people in the chat who are unfamiliar with this process if trump can be prosecuted for things he did while he was in office as president which he should be because every man should be equal under the uh rule of law right in the criminal justice system then so can previous presidents and in a just world i agree with that and that should extend that should extend to actual war crimes as well things that presidents have done at the behest of American empire. However, what is this? What is this? What is going on? Now, now it won't, but there's also a way where Trump can get prosecuted given the uniqueness of his crimes. Because Trump's crimes, 
okay, Trump's crimes do not pertain to advancing American empire's interests. Like, I mean, he's done that as well, obviously, but he's not being prosecuted for those things. He's being prosecuted for advancing his own personal interests, oftentimes at odds with uh, American hegemonic power. That is the problem. There, that's the reason why, you know, Nixon could get into legal trouble and legal scrutiny in the same way that Trump could get into legal trouble and legal scrutiny, and even in the way that maybe even Bill Clinton could get into legal trouble and legal scrutiny, um, but not in the same way that uh, Barack Obama could, right? For drone striking, extrajudiciously murdering an American citizen, which, by the way, Trump also killed another member of uh, that person's family, for the record, who was also an American citizen as well. So, um, but of course, no one cares about that, and everyone cares about the the civil fraud that he's engaging in, uh, that he is engaged in, according to the criminal justice system, or the January 6th insurrection, or a litany of other issues. His only current defense is, what about him? It's so insane. Well, like I've said, debate lords are lawyers. Lawyers are debate lords, and the more you level up in your debate lord uh, mentality, the, the higher you reach in the, in the justice system. Uh, Supreme Court's uh, Supreme Court justices of the United States of America being like the the uh, maximum, like the maxed out debate lord status. So for that uh, for that reason, yes, I do think that uh, you know what aboutism is is not exactly valid in a court of law, but it's still used and people use it all the time. They do it specifically to, I guess, change the minds of a jury. But there was no jury in this situation because maybe somebody just somebody failed to file the right paperwork. I don't know who. Anyway, let's continue. Let's see what, uh, you know, uh, CNN has to say. Let's get the latest from inside the courtroom now with CNN's Paula Reed. She's live outside the courthouse for us. Paula, a, a bit of a surprise that the judge would allow Donald Trump to address the court. And nothing is surprising here, Boris, but things certainly are taking a turn in the last few minutes. We know yesterday uh, there were negotiations. Uh, we had learned between the Trump team and the judge here about possibly allowing Trump to participate in closing arguments. Now, this would be highly unusual. Closing arguments are an opportunity for lawyers to summarize their case. And the Trump team would not agree to some restrictions that the judge laid out, uh, insisting that Trump stick to the material and relevant information and not attack the district attorney or the judge. So things had been business as usual here. The closing arguments went forward. Trump's attorney, Chris Kyes, summarized his argument. Other attorneys got up to summarize theirs. But then Chris Kyes got up just a few moments ago and asked if former President Trump could address the court. And he then launched into what our colleagues who were inside described as a monologue, telling the court, quote, the facts are the financial statements are perfect. There are no witnesses against us. The banks got all their money paid back. There were great loans. This was a political witch hunt. That is really how Trump and his lawyers have framed this entire case yeah. as a politically motivated and manufactured allegation. He's like, everybody now, won. Trump says, win, when win, you bank say, won. don't go outside of these things, we have a situation where I am an innocent man. So there's, he's referring to the restrictions that the judge tried to put on any participation that he would have. He said, quote, I'm being persecuted by somebody running for office referring to the district attorney who did promise to investigate Trump when she ran for office. He's insisting that I have to go outside of these bounds. So here he is making his case to the court, but also arguing with the judge and any restrictions the judge wanted to put on him. Now, I want to bring in our colleague, Kara Scannell, who is right next to me. Kara was inside the court earlier for oral arguments. Now, Kara, you called it. You knew that Trump couldn't get through the day without participating in some way. I mean, is this surprising? I mean, that's the whole point. That's the reason why he went. He didn't have to go. He did not have to attend this uh, court proceeding at all. He wanted to go specifically so that he could say some stuff, okay? Because that's the whole reason. There is no, he's using this as like a campaign stop. I think, you know, nothing in this trial has been surprising. Everything that we think is going to happen according to certain courts changes and it doesn't happen. So it doesn't surprise me at all that the judge allowed Trump to speak because part of the reason he gave initially Strategically speaking, do you think these trials are a good idea? I feel like it helps keep his base together. I mean, I I don't I think it's perfectly valid for whoever to be prosecuted for, you know, defrauding institutions, okay? If if you are greatly greatly overvaluing your real estate properties 
to a degree that is like beyond comprehension because this stuff happens all the time, especially in real estate. Okay. There's a lot of uh, tricksters, but the idea that like you can do it in the way that Trump did, where you look at like a property that is uh, maybe maximum a hundred million and value it at like one point, whatever billion, then yeah. when you're getting out loans while simultaneously, when you're paying taxes on said property, you devalue it and you say, this is actually costing me quite a bit as a depreciating asset, then at that point, I do personally believe you should get a little bit of legal scrutiny. I mean, that's crazy. That is the entire point of the court system, right? So I think that's fine. It, it's, it's ridiculous to just look at this and go, well, I don't know what the political uh, uh, backlash of such a thing is going to be. Uh, well, it don't matter, right? I, I think as far as like the pure politics of it all, there are some court cases that are uh, relatively sillier, right? The the district attorney one launched in, in New York about like the hush money. I mean, there's still clear wrongdoing there, but it's not as like, uh, it, it definitely is a charge that was amplified because of Donald Trump's own personal doing um, about, uh, or no, I'm not talking about, that's document mishandling, sorry. The, the, the other New York state case, that one is like definitely uh, the weakest case against Donald Trump. That probably does, uh, you know, play a role in making it seem as though uh, the government is after him or whatever. But, but ultimately, it doesn't really matter, right? His base doesn't believe anything. Like, what do you do? Do you let him get away with everything? You can't do that because that's a dangerous precedent. Um, and also... If you, if you uh, let him get away with it, it doesn't really change anything. If you at least attack him uh, in, with the court system for very clear-cut violations of the law, then, you know, you atrophy him a little bit. You piss him off. You take his attention away from campaigning. He can try and campaign off of this as best as he can. But ultimately, there's still a limit to how many, uh, to how much of the audience he can capture of why he would allow Trump to speak as he said he had more on the line in this case than anyone else. And since there is no jury, he said it was only fair to let Trump speak. But of course, as you just laid out, Trump went beyond the contours of what the judge wanted to be permissible. I don't think tons of moderates and normies are really following any of this stuff. Yeah, there's also that other side of things. I, I, I talk to my normie friends quite a bit about this to get a better feel for what's going on in the world of normal. And uh, obviously, if you're in here, you're probably not a normie. You're probably a little bit more tuned in to what's going on. And I don't think they care. They don't really care. They just, like, see Trump as a bad guy who is corrupt. Or they just don't really pay attention, like, on the more uh, Republican-adjacent side. On the center-right of normies, they still think, like, Trump is a loudmouth and brash, and they don't really like him that much. And then on the center-left side of things, on the liberal side of things, uh, they are just not paying attention to this at all. Everybody collectively thinks two things, okay? The broadest majority of voters, if you were to ask them, in my opinion, this is my personal assessment, if you were to ask the broadest majority of voters, they would tell you two things. Joe Biden is incredibly old and probably shouldn't serve in office. I don't think he's mentally fit to serve in office. And Donald Trump is brash. He's corrupt. He's a bad dude overall and quite I wouldn't say problematic, but just like rude and annoying and a distraction, right? That is the the two sides of the American political uh, spectrum right now. And those are the guys who are the guys who go out and vote when, you know, when the time comes. So that's the, um, that's the situation at hand. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people have just completely checked out of the political process and don't even care. They don't even, they're not even following, you know? here by talking about a witch hunt by making this a political case and not arguing just the facts in the case you know but for closing arguments for the bulk of it they were mostly delivered by chris Kais, his attorney and he did stick to the facts in the case and he went through the evidence that was presented saying to the judge that the attorney general's office did not present any witnesses who testified that there was fraud here and that has been a this election probably going to be pretty anemic turnout a turnout oh 100 this is a this is a race to the bottom right? It's a race to the bottom Two two candidates, both candidates that are slated to become their, their party candidates are uh, very unpopular. Um, and even unpopular in their own parties as well, to a certain degree, obviously I think Trump, if he, 
reaches uh, the candidacy point, if he gets out of the primaries, which I think he will, he is going to be able to uh, capture the base again. But is the base of support enough for him to win? I don't think so. That's the problem. The Republican Party's, uh, you know, passionate supporters are are not enough to win a national campaign. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you have Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, which has all of the opportunity to have profound victories all around the country, casting it aside. And it's it's crazy. It it always it, it feels like they are. Um, you know what it feels like? It feels like the Democratic Party is playing down to the level of their competition. It literally feels like if you had like a retired basketball player, a professional NBA player, okay, who's well past his prime, but like he could still he could still easily dunk on a bunch of like kindergartners, but he's just like nerfing himself for no reason whatsoever. That's what it feels like. And of course the stakes are much higher than a you know, than a basketball like a recreational game of basketball. UIT did a segment that proposed the point is to be silly and ridiculous that people check out. Actually made a comparison to the rise of Hitler. The propaganda has always been conorable down to his hand movement in his speeches, but now he's even quoting the mf -er? No, I don't think... I don't think so. Um. Anyway, uh, but uh, I, I don't know if he's like... I think Trump... If Trump was, you know, that interested in Hitler and trying to repeat Hitler that much... That would require him to care about anything outside of himself. And I don't think he cares about anything other than himself. Like, I don't think he's ever fancied another individual, whether it be Hitler or not. Like, sure, or he, he has a lot of uh, political opinions that are adjacent, uh, dare I say, Hitlerian. But I don't think he's the type of dude who's going to sit there, read a book, and, like, desperately try to craft his own persona off of, like, Adolf Hitler. You know what I mean? I think he's telegenic. I think he knows what hits. I think he knows how to read the room. And he is a great marketer for a very specific audience. And I think, you know, he understands what the Republican base of support is looking for. But sometimes his own personal narcissism gets in the way of that. Like when he kept talking about January 6th over and over and over again. Or when he kept talking about how the election was stolen from him over and over and over again, and he legitimately pushed lar like larger swaths of the Republican base away from himself. Like Part of the reason why the, I guess, suburban whites that normally would vote for the Republican Party reliably, uh, normally uh, that there would be normal Republican voters are, are moving away from the Republican Party and voting for the Democratic Party a little bit, is because... You know, I think they got sick and tired of hearing him constantly say the election was stolen from him. That's it. This is embarrassing, but look how bad Haley kills Biden. <sighs> yeah, well, Haley needs to make it out the mud, and I don't think she's going to be able to. So that's not a thing that you need to worry about at this moment. And yes, uh, Nikki Haley is like a dream Democratic Party candidate for many Democrats, I think. <laughs> I'll be honest. Just like your dream should be to avoid the top of the hour ad break, which is a bad, not a good, but a bad segue because uh, we are going to now move on to the International Court of Justice from the American Civil Courts in New York to the International Court of Justice. I am bringing on uh, Jeremy Scahill to come on board and talk to us about the International Court of Justice where South Africa has started its case against the state of Israel. All right, let me turn off my camera really quick. I'm going to start the video call now. Hello? Okay, I can't see you. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, I can see you now. Can you hear me? You won't be able to see me yet. But can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, I can hear you as well. All right, perfect. I'm going to turn off my camera on here. We're doing live production. Um, no problem. So, you know, it, it, it's a little bit wonky at time. Oh, wait actually you know what let me see if i could just do the virtual camera on here let's see do, 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 do. boom there it is okay now know. you'll be able to see me okay let's do the pop out all right jeremy scale ladies and gentlemen um hello uh first time caller long time fan same here 
Um, I'm very uh, okay. You don't mean that. That you don't have to say that. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, is there any way to like raise your microphone volume a little bit? Is this the microphone that you do the 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 podcast on as well? Yeah. Hold on here. Oh, I've cranked my, up I, your volume. I, this is the first time that I've used uh this Discord uh platform. Hold on a second. I know this is totally embarrassing. I said on Twitter that my parents love your show. Um, that was also, I assume, fake news. My mom is watching right now, and I'm. Oh. I, it's totally. Totally. I told her not to click on anything. Okay. Yeah. No, the, don't, don't. Is do this that. better? I made it louder. Yeah, it is better for sure. Um, all right. All right. So some things happened, uh, this, uh, this past day, uh, or I guess last night from where I'm at, I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the case against Israel started case being genocide. And, uh, you've covered it. You wrote an article on the intercept on, uh, on the matter. And I wanted to talk to you about it. Uh, there's obviously some other stuff that we could talk about, but I think that it's important. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, overarching goals here are obviously uh, South Africa laying out the case that I think they did a pretty good job with uh, on, on uh, why Israel is uh, committing acts of uh, genocide upon the Palestinian population, something that they've basically brought about themselves. So there are two different things I want to ask you. One, um, what is the difference between the International Court of Justice versus the ICC, the International Criminal Court? Let's start there. Yeah. I mean, on a political level, the International Criminal Court has always sort of been viewed as a U.S.-dominated tool. Um, and much, for much of its history, it operated in an ad hoc manner. So you had uh, the war in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. So the, the United States... Uh, advocated for setting up an ad hoc tribunal rather than um, implementing a permanent international criminal court. In fact, the United States does not recognize uh, the international criminal court as having jurisdiction over all countries. It prefers for nations in Africa primarily to be subjected to the jurisdiction of something that nonetheless is called an international criminal court. And in fact, both Democrats and Republicans alike throughout U.S. His history have undermined the U.S. actually fully accepting that an international court would have jurisdiction over the United States. One wild thing that's totally true, but a lot of people don't know about it, is that in 2002, George Bush signed into law um, a, a piece of legislation that had widespread bipartisan support call, uh, that, that came to be known as the Hague Invasion Act. Yeah. And what that law, what that law says, and it's still on the books, by the way. Yep. Interestingly, Joe Biden voted against it. Um, but that law is still on the books. And what it says is that not only does the United States not recognize the International Criminal Court as having jurisdiction over the U.S. and its allies, but that if there is ever an attempt to prosecute any U.S. personnel or the personnel or of any... Yeah, or, or extradite or bring any type, sort of proceedings at the International Criminal Court against U.S. personnel, not just soldiers, any U.S. personnel, or personnel of allies of the United States, that the president of the United States is authorized to initiate an invasion of the Netherlands to, to liberate any uh, U.S. personnel uh, being prosecuted or charged with um, war crimes. They've had so it come. The IC they've had it come. So the ICC is... is overwhelmingly a court that is used by powerful nations to prosecute the Yugoslavias and the Rwandas of the world. And the vast majority of the cases that have been prosecuted there um, have been against um, involving African nations. When we talk about the International Court of Justice, this is the official world court that was set up uh, by the United Nations um, in the aftermath of World War II. And the United States actually has been convicted at that court of terrorism. It was convicted in the early 1980s for the mining of the waters around Nicaragua when the United States was fueling the dirty wars um, in, in Central America. And the U.S. was actually convicted at the court. One tidbit of history, though, is that the chief, the president of the current tribunal that is hearing the genocide case uh, that South Africa brought against Israel. The, the, the current judge in that case, who is the, the head of it, is an American judge named Joan Donahue. Joan Don so the Americans have the presidency of the court right now that mm -hmm. is hearing a genocide case against its, uh, its dear friend, uh, Israel. So Joan Donahue, if people watched it today, you saw her. She was the one that was presiding over it. Um, she was one of the lawyers for the United States when they were convicted of terrorism at the World Court for mining the harbors in Nicaragua. And she now 
is the, the, the president of that uh, tribunal. Now, having said that, the International Court of Justice is widely viewed as a much more neutral uh, uh, sort of uh, force when it comes can I, to international Can I interject justice. here real quickly yeah, and ask ahead. you a question? Do you if, I don't want to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Nicaragua court case also still had an American judge on it, obviously. Yeah. And the American judge actually ruled against the United States interests in that court case, as far as I remember. So, like, that is a unique so, so situation. What, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, th I'm throwing that out there because, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, certainly the United States would like to, uh, you know, assert its influence over any uh, judgment there. But that's not always how American lawyers operate. Not every single American, even though this judge uh, is close to Hillary Clinton, even though she... Uh, was one of the lawyers defending the United States in its own uh, case before the, the court. Doesn't necessarily mean that she won't be fair. Um, but what we do know is that the Biden administration has already preemptively said that this case is without merit um, and has yeah. said that the charges of genocide are ludicrous and have no basis. Um, so they're already doing a sort of preemptive defense of Israel. But the United States is not in control of the International Court of Justice the way that it is able to assert its influence over the ICC. So um, now, having said that, even if this court uh, rules that, so first of all, people should understand this. What South Africa is asking for right now in an urgent manner is not to convict Israel of genocide, not to even find that Israel is engaged in genocidal conduct. What South Africa is arguing is that there should be a trial of Israel for uh, genocide. And they walk through the genocide convention in meticulous detail. But what they're actually asking for is for the court to issue what they call provisional measures. What does that mean? It means that they're saying there, that if this court has jurisdiction, and if there is enough evidence to take it to trial, that the court should order the defendant, Israel, to halt its military operations because failure yeah. to do so in the event that it's true that Israel is committing genocide would mean that it is, it is now blood on the hands of the court for refusing to stop an ongoing criminal activity when they, when they have the authority to do so. So a lot of people think like, oh, you know, Netanyahu's going to be on trial. That's not what this is about. What this is about right now is, is that South Africa, as a signatory to the Genocide Convention, has the right to bring a case. Any country could have done this that's yeah. signatory to the convention. It's significant that South Africa brought it because of its history with apartheid um, and terrorism in its own country, an apartheid backed by the United States. It's also significant that the South Africans had um, a very uh, brilliant lawyer from Ireland, and Ireland has been very outspoken, perhaps more than any European country, um, in standing up for the Palestinians during this uh, this slaughter. So what what the South Africans asked for today was for the court to issue provisional measures instructing Israel to cease its military operations in Gaza, um, pending litigation on the question of whether or not Israel is committing genocide. Yeah. So and and today they uh, laid the facts out, which uh, are are so public and so broad. And one distinction here, if I'm not mistaken, is that the the ICC has the capacity to convict uh, people, whereas the ICJ yeah. is just for UN nations, and it it is a it's a nation versus nation uh, thing. So, like, and this is why up. this is why, for instance, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a no. I'm glad that you're that you're raising this point. So, for instance, many of the leaders in the former Yugoslavia stood trial as individuals, including. Um, heads of state, Slobodan Milosevic, the, the former president of Yugoslavia and then Serbia, uh, died during the course of his trial, actually, um, well, at yeah. The Hague. And, you know, Very famously. But what's, yeah, well, yeah, and you also had that thing where the guy took the, 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 it looked like he was taking a shot of whiskey, but he was actually poisoning himself and died. I mean, this happened also at the International Criminal Court. So the, yeah. it's a crazy scene there. But this is, so Israel is basically, their defense is basically going to amount to repeating October 7th, uh, like eight bazillion times, October 7th, October 7th. And one of the lawyers for uh, the South Africans, who actually was a, a rather old British lawyer, was tasked today at the court with sort of preempting some of Israel's arguments. And what he said was, um, Israel is going to seek to say um, that, uh, that Hamas should actually be on trial here instead of Israel. But what this lawyer pointed out, he didn't make an emotional statement. He said, Hamas is not a nation state. Hamas is not a party to the genocide well, convention. They could. 
Israel could technically, if they wanted to, try to. I, I, from what I understand, they could technically go to the ICJ, but that would require them to recognize Palestine as a nation state. I think with a tacit uh, recognition that like Palestinians have autonomy, and and that goes against their overarching interest of dominating them. Am I not correct on that? There, there, there is that, but also there's there is a radical oversimplification of what Hamas is that takes place in the international discourse. You you have Hamas as a political entity, and then yeah. you have uh, the military wing of Hamas. And you know, I'm not I'm not trying to to nitpick here, but facts actually matter. And and Israel's entire narrative is that this is not a governing body; this is a terrorist actor. Yeah. Um, and and so what the lawyers for South Africa said today was there are proper venues to prosecute the war crimes that Hamas may have committed, um, but this isn't it. And and what they and and then went further and said. The United Nations recognizes that Gaza is still occupied territory. Israel disputes that and says, oh, we pulled out, we removed our settlements. What the United Nations has found repeatedly is that Gaza still constitutes an occupied territory because Israel is, an in, is entirely in control of its land, its air, its sea, all uh, uh, basic necessities of life that come in and out of there. When, when Israel's defense minister said early on in this, you know, we're going to shut everything down, the electricity, the food, et cetera, he meant it because Israel knows how to do it because they have been doing it for a very long time. So, you know, while Israel is going to try to uh, make Hamas the defendant in this case, I don't think that that is going to fly even with the American judge. As much as the United States and the Biden administration constantly goes back to October 7th as being a justification for, you know, the mass killing of tens of thousands of people, the maiming of tens of thousands of people, the extraordinary level of death of children, the fact of the matter is, and the South African lawyer said this, retribution is is no uh, justification for genocide. You 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 yeah. can't wage a war of revenge. And if international law is going to matter, then facts are going to matter. And so Israel's entire defense that we have the right to do whatever we want because of October 7th actually is not consistent with any basic principles of international law. It's just it's just yeah. a fact. Yeah. Um, as the belligerent occupier, a case uh, it can't even be made to to a right to defense against uh the people that you are uh, the belligerent occupier over as well so there is the the notion of like i mean I, this is my assessment of the situation is what i've been yeah. saying at least is like on october 7th inside of the boundaries of what is known as israel proper yes the israeli occupying force the israeli defense force did have uh the right to defend its citizens like a like a police force would right Whereas everything beyond that, especially the the Gaza operations, would constitute as a uh, as a as something outside of the bounds of of a right to defense that Israel does not have. It's it's a as a belligerent occupier. It, it doesn't... Well, also, you know, I mean, there, there, look, uh, if you, it, I, I I find myself saying this when I argue with people. I mean, I heard you on the show earlier talking about conversations with normies. I mean, I also I'm surrounded in my entire life by by normies. My family, we're from the Midwest. I talk to people all the time. And the thing is, like, the, the way that this has been portrayed, for, the first narrative on this was that 1,400 civilians were killed. That was the first draft of history that was promoted by the Israelis about what happened on October 7th. Um, when you actually start to review the details, it's, mu it's much more complicated. We're talking about uh, just under 800 civilians that were documented to have been killed. We're talking about a couple hundred soldiers that were killed. Um, Hamas attacked a number of military installations. Certainly war crimes were committed that day, uh, yeah. without question. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's utterly uh, atrocious to take, uh, a, you know, old people, uh, babies. There, there was, you know, there was one 10-month-old uh, that was taken hostage. I mean, no one with a, with a heart and a brain would be defending that conduct. And no one with a heart and a brain should be defending the conduct that Israel engages in uh, regularly when it uh, arrests children, um, you know, and puts them in military tribunals. Um, so if we want to talk about facts, then we need to understand which groups did what on October 7th, because you had Hamas, you had Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and then you had um, what appeared to be independent actors that came in. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we then have to break down once, once the siege was laid, uh, to the kibbutzes and to the music festival. What did the response of the Israelis look like? If you read the Israeli press, in many ways, it's much more uh, open and transparent about what actually happened on October 7th than the American press. There is a very serious discussion right now in Israel about how many Israelis were killed 
by the Israeli military yeah. when they responded to Hamas. And there, I mean, it's this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is in mainstream Israeli newspapers. Why not? And my art. And my yeah, why, you know, why not? Haaretz, um, you know, I mean, the, the major TV networks have been interviewing witnesses who describe the Israeli forces shelling it. You have a history in Israel uh, uh, of there's a number of doctrines, the Hannibal Doctrine and others I'm sure you've talked about before, where there are times when Israel prefers to actually kill its own people before they can be taken hostage. Um, there are other, uh, the Hia Doctrine and others that say that it's it's acceptable to kill your own civilians if you need it to shut down a terrorist operation. Um, so I'm not saying that I know all of the facts. What I'm saying is none of us do right now. And, and there has been a lot of inflammatory, incendiary allegations made because if you say it was Hamas, you can accuse them of anything. You can say that they were literally eating people's body organs on that day. And there's a significant portion of the Israeli public and unfortunately the American public that will believe it without requesting a single shred of evidence. John Fetterman. Look at Joe, yeah, well, hey, I'll, I'll do you one better. Joe Biden. Joe yeah. Biden is out there. He, you know, not once, not twice, but th at least three times Joe Biden has said that he saw pictures of babies that were beheaded by Hamas. Not even the Israeli government has continues to make that assertion. I went through, I read the names of every single Israeli civilian that has been identified as being killed. There was a little girl who was uh, 10 months old that was shot while she was in her mother's arm uh, arms. Um, she is the only uh, child under one that was documented to have been killed that day. There were a number of other children. The Israelis initially said 40 babies were beheaded. They told stories about living children being placed in ovens. There yeah. is no evidence, that, but the most powerful person in the world, Joe Biden, uh, or at least Joe Biden, the body of Joe Biden is filling the position of the most powerful person in the world. He keeps repeating this propaganda. They laid siege to Al-Shifa Hospital, telling us there was the Hamas Pentagon underneath it. And then when the Israelis actually went in there, the Baghdad Bob of the IDF takes cameras down there. And what do they find? They find something that looks kind of like an old underground operating room with an air conditioner that wasn't even attached. And it looked like no one had been in there for a very long time. You know, I wouldn't be shocked if Hamas guys hung out in hospitals. I know from reporters that, that often people would like meet people to do interviews there. There's a difference between that and firing RPGs from the roof of Al-Shifa. There's a difference between that and actually having a Hamas Pentagon under Al-Shifa. So the United States said, we have our own intelligence that indicates that that's true. The entire thing was a fraud. It was, it was a fraud intended to, to give cover to Israel to lay siege to civilian targets. So to bring it back to what we're talking about today with this hearing, I didn't learn a single thing that I didn't already know from what the lawyers for South Africa said today, because everything they were saying is in the public domain. Yeah. But what was chilling about it was to hear it in a court that under the law has the authority to say to Israel, this must stop immediately. And, and, and that actually is worth something, because it's going to call the question to nations around the world on whether they believe in international law, or they think that the United States should continue to be the emperor over international jurisprudence, where it dictates who the law applies to and who it doesn't apply to. One final thing, it was really chilling when they started reciting. And, and if you read their 84 page filing, the South Africans, n over the course of nine full pages, they are citing quotes from Israeli officials that are clearly genocidal in nature, um, you know, not just Benjamin Netanyahu invoking the biblical tale of Amalek and, you know, kill all their children, their women, the, 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 the babies, the livestock, but others talking about genocidal intent. And what they did is they, they played some of those by video, they read others, and then they connected it to soldiers on the ground clearly understanding those as official orders. That is genocidal intent. And, you know, I was struck by the, the thought, because I've followed all these statements that these guys have made, these criminal genocidal statements, but hearing it in that court today, I realized the reason that Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant and all these other people feel so comfortable making such shocking genocidal statements publicly is that they have the confidence that nothing will ever happen to them as a result of making those statements. It doesn't even register to them that anyone would be able to hold them accountable because the bully of the world is their backer.
the United States. And already these toadies, you know, John Kirby at the White House, National Security Council, you know, Matt Miller, a guy who has no soul and no conscience out there every day shilling for the genocidal operations. Who's done such guys, a poor, piss poor job that even the IDF had to at a certain point be like, all right, right. You're, get, you're getting ahead of this and you're causing political pressure for us internally inside of Israel by by yeah. speculating on like potentially the, the reasons as to why Hamas is not releasing some of the female IDF soldiers, which at the time was once again, like you've mentioned, uh, presented as though these were also female civilians and not like active enemy combatants that they'd uh, held captive as prisoners of war, uh, as as hostages, and and that uh, they were refusing to release them. And, and, and Miller famously speculated that it's because uh, Hamas wants to, or either has harmed them or wants to harm them further, and that's why they refused, and that's why the negotiations fell apart. This was so yeah. out there and caused uh, so much political turmoil in Israel that the IDF had to correct the American State Department. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 totally true. I mean, when 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 you have people like Benjamin Netanyahu saying, hey, tone it down a little bit, you know, like that, that that says something. You know, it reminds me, though, Hassan, of 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 this story about Biden from uh, which I think is one of the most revealing stories. I mean, for, first of all, people should understand Joe Biden's been in office longer than almost any American politician, you know, 50 years, senator, uh, vice president, president. And and, you know, since 1973, he's been a totally committed uh, Zionist. He calls oh, himself, yeah. you know, Israel's best Catholic friend. But in 1982, when the Israelis invaded Lebanon, a guy named Menachem Begin was the prime minister of Israel. And he comes to Washington because the Reagan administration actually, even though they were, you know, Reagan was an incredibly pro-Israel president, but they were concerned about the mounting civilian death toll. If you go back, is at one point Reagan even even told the Israelis that it's starting to look like a holocaust. He used the term holocaust. So con contrast that with you know Biden today. But Biden at the time was a senator. So Menachem Begin comes to Washington and he gets grilled by all these American senators over the rising civilian death toll. And Begin then goes back to Israel. He talks to reporters and he tells reporters, but there was one senator who stood up. This is 1982. One senator who stood up and gave an impassioned defense of our invasion of Lebanon and said that if he was in the same position in the United States and he was dealing with an, you know, a threat like that, he also would support the killing of women and children. And Begin says, you know, that senator was a guy named Joe Biden. And I told, and Begin himself was a war criminal from 1948 in the Ergun militias, you know, as part yeah. of the original Nakba. So this guy is saying, I had to tell that senator, no, 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 those aren't our values. So Biden, even back, back then in 1982, was going further than the Israelis in, you know, at, at, at least in this meeting with Begin, in defending the killing of women and children. You know, no one should pretend that Biden doesn't enthusiastically support what's happening right now. His entire career indicates that that's exactly what, what he believes. And also Antony Blinken has never met a war in the Middle East that he just wasn't, you know, fucking in love with. Yeah, um, he, is, he has been a, a very enthusiastic supporter. And I think he's ideologically stuck at a different time. Like, I think uh, maybe because of his brain capacity diminishing or whatever, but like, I do think that... Uh, that that there is a a a diminish like there our soft power and our influence around the world as the United States of America is like waning a little bit uh it, right now and and yet I feel as though there th this is the reason why there's so much a division even in the State Department as far as what we see in the media with people coming out and saying like we got to dial this back even Anthony Blinken who like you correctly pointed out uh has never met a war he doesn't like in the Middle East was. On, uh, after meeting with Hakan Fidan in Turkey on October 8th, had actually tweeted, uh, knowing full well what was about to happen, the scale of the atrocities that Israel was about to commit, had tweeted out uh, to a, a cessation of the hostilities and then quickly deleted it. And, and I feel like this is, uh, there's a reason for that. And the, I, I think that they're internally, they recognize that letting Israel operate in the way that it has with impunity has made it, uh, has has made America look weaker uh, in the eyes of the rest of the world. In my opinion, I feel as though this um, this also is a grave threat to those who want to maintain the American empire to a certain. Well, degree. look at, I mean, yeah, I mean, a bunch of things there. I, I I think are really smart points. I mean, also with the you know with the war in Ukraine 
and the fact that the United States and it's NATO, um, you know, and particularly Germany now has totally transformed itself into uh, into a, a war machine where it is exporting uh, military hardware. It's um, it's starting to flirt now with troop deployments. It's becoming a very aggressive. It's 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 sort of like a mini. It's it wants to become apparently like a mini America in Europe right now. Um, what what though is what's lingering on the, on the sides of this? Look at China. China has has for many decades operated in a much smarter way uh, than the United States on the continent of Africa in its approach to international conflict. Um, you know, China is now under Xi Jinping making a run at sort of being a a, a global diplomatic force to try to uh, make peace between different countries. So, I mean, I, I I think that the United States is flailing in its imperial project in in many ways. Um, but what you're also seeing, like in the case of the the Gaza war right now, you know, there's this um, axis of resistance that's been formed, as 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 it's called in Iran, where you have the Iranians, you have Hezbollah in Lebanon, you have Hamas in uh, in Gaza, um, you have the Ansar al Islam uh, uh, Ansar Allah in uh, in Yemen, the Houthis. Um, who, who that, that's a whole other story unto oh, itself. Yeah. I've spent a lot. I've spent a lot of time in Yemen. You know, the the Yemen declares you know war against Israel and is has implemented a, a very successful blockade um, to the to the point where the United that they have the most powerful you know Western military forces in the world now deploying to go after the you know the poorest country in the Arab world. Uh, you know, and and they are defiant, utterly defiant. By the um, way, this Nasrallah, just broke. Yeah. Uh, this just yeah. broke, actually, uh, according to the political editor of the time, Stephen Swinford. Britain is now expected to join the U.S. in carrying airstrikes on Houthi military positions in Yemen tonight. Rishi Sunak briefed cabinet on imminent military intervention this evening. Sir Keir Starmer, labor le uh, labor leader, and Sir Lindsey Hoyle, the common speaker, have also been briefed. So, um, so they are finally, uh, I guess, uh, even the British are finally. Uh, getting involved in, in trying to combat this blockade, which I think is but, moral I mean, and just, by the way. That's my personal perspective on it. You don't have to agree with, like, Ansar Allah's uh, uh, political positions or whatever, but uh, ultimately I do think no, that, and I, that yeah. they're doing well, uh, the right thing. I mean, look, at, I, 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 mean, I asked really early on in this slaughter in Gaza that the Israelis are conducting, I talked to uh, Rashid Khalidi, you know, the, 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 one of the most important uh, Palestinian intellectuals in the world, the professor at Columbia University, and I was asking him, you know, about Arab nations and, and, and their position just sort of watching this happen. And he, you know, he said it's been many decades before any of them, ha since any of them have been willing to do anything. So for Yemen to do this um, is, is quite extraordinary. And, um, you know, in the eyes of many in the Arab street, they're, they're uh, utter heroes for what they're doing. Set aside, you know, who the Houthis are or what's happened in Yemen. Just the fact that everyone is watching this mass slaughter and saying, you know, where are the Arab nation states? Why is no one confronting um, Israel? It, it it actually matters. And look, uh, what's what's happening in Lebanon is is really concerning. You know, the Israelis are um, intensifying their attacks. Hezbollah is uh, also carried out a strike against a fairly significant um, Israeli military base. The Israelis have had to evacuate tens of thousands of their own citizens from the border with Lebanon. And uh, let me tell you something. Hezbollah ain't Hamas. You know, Hezbollah is a much more serious um, fighting force with much yeah. more sophisticated weaponry. I mean, Hamas largely is manufacturing its own weapons. I mean, obviously, it gets weapons smuggled in. I, you know, there's no question about that. But Hamas is is you know is at a stage where Hezbollah was you know ten plus years ago, and um, you know so Hezbollah is also the only force in in recent years to defeat Israel. And if the Israelis think that they're going to be able to fight a multi-front war without a constant U.S. rearmament, um, they're sadly mistaken. Because you know the reason that Antony Blinken keeps having to circumvent congressional review to push through emergency shipments of tank shells is that the Israelis can't sustain this without the United States. So when people say, oh, what do you want Biden to do? He's not the president of Israel. Uh, no, he's the arms dealer of Israel. Um, he's the political yeah. defender of Israel. If Biden yeah. wanted this thing shut down, it would be shut down. That's what happened in 2021. Biden said, basically said to Netanyahu, One okay, phone call. you've let 
you let it yeah. burn enough. Um, and you know, within 48 hours, there were there was a, a peace deal being brokered between you know with the Egyptians and and Israel. Even this time around, um, when uh, when Yoav Gallant, who famously the defense minister said, uh, the, we're fighting human animals, and that's why we have yeah. to shut off their food, electricity, and everything, like all aid going into Gaza. Um, had to back away from that position at least marginally early, like a month into the to the ethnic cleansing campaign. And when and when uh, Israeli media asked him why uh, he is allowing aid to go into Gaza, albeit limited aid, but still any aid to go into Gaza, he very famously said, and this was like often not really reported in uh, in American media, but he very famously said, well, "What am I supposed to do? They America asked us to do that. What am I going to do? Say no to America?" Okay. And that is the reality, and that's precisely the reason why Israel, in my opinion, does probably more media, more Western-facing media in English than it does in Hebrew for its own domestic audience. And there's proof for this as well. Benjamin Netanyahu has actually appeared on Western television more times since October 7th than he has on Israeli television. So... Uh, there's a reason for that. It's because he already has uh, a, a tremendous amount of support for the actions in Gaza. He doesn't have a lot of support overall. Obviously, the overwhelming majority of the Israeli population want him to resign immediately. Um, but yeah, I mean, his constituency as... is along the Potomac. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's you know, and, and I mean, one other interesting uh, you know thing about that, and and it, it doesn't really get talked a lot uh, about a lot, um, but Israel. I, I think Israel is actually militarily losing the war against Hamas. Um, and, you know, people might say, oh, what are you talking about? You know, Israel's waged a very effective campaign against the civilians of Gaza. They, they've done it. They've, they, they really have perfected the art of mass murder of oh, women yeah. and children and the elderly and killing, you know, 200 plus, uh, you know, medical workers, uh, destroying all of the hospitals, causing starvation, uh, causing uh, endemic diarrhea among children. They're really successful at the war they're waging against the civilians. Um, but if you actually are monitoring both the Israeli propaganda and Hamas's media channels, Hamas is constantly posting videos of them blowing up, um, of their operatives blowing up Israeli tanks, uh, killing Israeli soldiers. There's there's one video where the, the a Hamas operative pops up from a tunnel hatch in the middle of a camp where um, Israeli soldiers are just sitting around, hanging out, and they film them around, just showing we can access you anywhere, anytime. Yeah. The, these these tunnels that they have under Gaza, hundreds of kilometers of them, the Israelis captured a video from an engineering corps of Hamas building some of these tunnels. And, you know, they're use, they have to use equipment that um, doesn't register seismically to dig out some of these tunnels because the Israelis have such extensive surveillance around it. Um, but there's a video of Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas, his brother Mohammed, driving a car through the tunnels. And he's sort of like, you know, take a right here, then a left there. Um, you know, the Israelis have not penetrated even a fraction of these tunnels. And so the point I'm getting at here is that um, this is going to hit a point where Hamas is not going to be defeated. Um, you know, Israel desperately needs to, to kill Mohammed Daif or, you know, the, the military commander of Qasem Brigades or Abu Obeda, the, the spokesperson, or yeah. Yahya Sinwar. They have to kill somebody so they can say, ah, we did it. Here's our victory. But the reality is that they're not even militarily defeating Hamas right now. They yeah. are militarily exterminating and expelling uh, the Palestinian population, forcing them into a smaller and smaller killing cage. That's what they're doing. But, you know, top Israeli defense reporters are starting to hint at this, that this isn't going well for Israel uh, on a tactical military level. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's the classic... It's the classic uh, struggle against an occupying power as well, uh, just like Ho Chi Minh has said before. And I think like even I, either it was the PFLP or the DFLP leader at the time who said, like, you kill 10 of us, we kill one of yours. We're not going anywhere. You it's going to end when you get tired. Right. And, right, and, and remember, that is the dynamic. And remember that that, you know, people will say, oh, yeah, well, look what happened to ISIS, you know, in Iraq. Hamas is not ISIS, you yeah. know, and and Hamas, you, you, no one wants to really talk about this, but why why does Hamas exist? I mean, part of the story has to do with, you know, Netanyahu um, and, and other, you know, extremists in Israel wanting Hamas to exist because they viewed it as the best way to prevent 
a Palestinian state, if you had people that were perceived as extremists or violent jihadists or, you know, what have you. But the reason, the act, the political reason why Hamas or Hezbollah or any of these groups exist is because of the occupation, is because yeah. of settler colonialism, um, is because of imperial agendas, is because of exterminating people from their lands. And the people of Gaza in particular, and I'm sure you remember this, Hassan, in 2018 and 2019, the Palestinians organized a massive nonviolent series of marches that, that spanned yeah. months. The Every Friday, return, it was yeah. called the Great March of Return. And Israel uh, responded with utter force to those nonviolent demonstrations. In fact, Israeli snipers, some of them who gave their actual name, have openly admitted in the Israeli media that they were keeping account of who could kill, who could shoot the most kneecaps of Palestinian 42 protesters. in one day, one, uh, one right. IDF sniper uh, openly yes. uh, stated. So, the IDF and, and, itself and took ownership I mean, over it. The IDF so, itself took ownership over it yes. when they tweeted out and then quickly deleted, even though Betselem captured it for uh, posterity, uh, yes. that they had accounted for every single bullet and where it had yeah. landed. Tens of yeah. thousands of people were intentionally maimed, wounded um, by Israeli sniper rifles. I mean, uh, pregnant women so when were you, killed. So, yeah. so when 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 that is the response to a nonviolent demonstration, which presumably is what the world uh, is telling the Palestinians that that's the proper way to resist Israel is nonviolently. You don't do things like raid a military base or kidnap a soldier or any or you know take a soldier prisoner. Those things are unacceptable. But nonviolent protest that's acceptable. Well, actually, it's not acceptable because then you get shot in the kneecap, or you have pregnant women getting shot. So when, when that is the message, what means do the Palestinians have of resistance? Why is it that Hamas now, the armed resistance in, in Gaza right now, is incredibly popular among Palestinians? Why yeah. is that? Is it because people, everyone loves Hamas? No, it's because a child is Hamas. A journalist is Hamas. The hospital is Hamas. Everyone in, in Gaza is Hamas. There are no children. The UN. There are no civilians. The UN is Hamas. Um, the UN Secretary General is Hamas. Um, Ireland is Hamas. Spain is Hamas. Hamas. South Africa is Hamas. Belgium is Hamas. When everyone becomes Hamas, when 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 you shoot and murder nonviolent protesters, when you intentionally kneecap them with sniper bullets, of course the only means available to the people is armed resistance. Yeah. It's 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 also what happened with the Irish. It's what happened in South Africa. It's what happened in revolutionary struggles all over the world. And I'll I'll say one last thing on this. No one should believe a single word that ever comes out of the mouth of Israeli government spokespeople unless there's like three or four independent sources showing that it's true because yeah. they have lied about everything. And, you know, it's not that I say, oh, give Hamas the benefit of any doubt. It's that you don't give Israel the benefit of any doubt. Like Israel lies repeatedly and it's documentable through this entire. We can yeah. talk about the last three months, but you can also talk about decades. They're lying about everything everything constantly so not, their word should not be worth a penny when it comes to a statement of the facts on the ground in gaza nothing yeah. and western media absolutely is complicit because they have basically a standing idf spokesperson early on since october 8th to immediately contextualize the the violence that uh, the the israeli forces are subjecting the palestinian people to in their ethnic cleansing campaign and even and and beyond that, whenever Israel will come out as a state actor and openly lie, and even deliver inconsistent, sometimes incoherent evidence, false evidence as to, uh, you know, whether they were the ones who struck the the uh, the Al Ahli Hospital or the Al Shifa Hospital, and how Israel never would strike a hospital, uh, immediately the media jumps on that and actually changes, in my opinion, the way they're. The, the way they have covered uh, the, the, the atrocities. Um, two yeah. things I wanted to point to here. Uh, one is uh, a, an analysis that I saw. Hold on. Let me see if I can pull this up really quickly. Uh, one is an analysis that I saw about uh, the way that uh, the atrocities have been covered in Western media and how... On. Oops, that's not Marx. Oh, you're talking. This was a piece that the Intercept did. That uh, it was uh, Adam Johnson. Um, uh, you're talking about the analysis of uh, American newspapers and how they uh, cover Palestinian deaths versus Israeli deaths. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The the Intercept coverage. Yes, the disproportionate coverage mentions of Palestinian deaths declined. Here it is. 
Uh, new study shows that the New York Times, Washington Post, and LA Times is systematic bias. For every two Palestinian deaths, Palestinians are mentioned once. For every Israeli death, Israelis are mentioned eight times or at a rate of 16 times more, more per death than of Palestinians. Yeah. I mean, and, and uh, look, we also did a story recently, my colleague Dan Bogoslaw, showing that, you know, CNN, any report that is done by CNN, including reports that are done in the United States that deal in any way with Israel, have to be run through the Jerusalem Bureau of CNN, which is subject to the Israeli censors' uh, oversight. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I mean, the, I, I remember a story that like the late Alex Coburn did you know, back in 1999 about CNN having interns uh, from the Pentagon in their newsroom uh, during the, the, the bombing of Serbia. Um, you know, th there's a long uh, tradition of news outlets um, subjecting themselves without full disclosure to censorship and monitoring by government entities. And there's a cross breeding between, you know, a revolving door. It's not just lobbyists and politicians, also in media, you have people hopping from government positions back to media and back and forth. And, you know, some some news outlets also are working with people who uh, are just fresh out of their jobs being propagandists for the Israeli government. So, you know, I mean, we're we're look, the Palestinians are um, are, are being systematically killed off in Gaza right now. There's plans to try to force them into the Sinai Peninsula, a long kind of colonialist uh, uh, you know, dream. Um, you news organizations are doing what they always do, which is that they give um, every lie that Israel floats gets sort of a pass. Um, and every single claim of a Palestinian death has to be like quadruple proven. Um, you know, look at the president yeah. of the United States says, oh, you know, uh, I, I don't have any faith in those uh, in those death numbers. Actually, to, to be quite blunt here, the Hamas Ministry of Health death numbers are are almost certainly conservative because of the formula that they use where it has to be someone that's come through the hospital system or the morgue system in some yeah. way. There are, there are other estimates when you take into account missing people and under the rebels that are far higher. Uh, and, and I think they're reasonable numbers, far higher than the Hamas run health ministry numbers. The, the whole thing, the world is upside down. The, 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 the victims have to like go out of their way to prove that their loved ones died. Look what they're doing to Wael Dadu, the, the, the bureau chief of Al Jazeera yeah. um, Arabic in Gaza. They murdered this man's family. His entire and, family. And yeah. They murdered his family. Then they murder his cameraman and leave him for five hours bleeding out. And then last week, they then murder his, his oldest son, who was a reporter. And then the Israelis say, after, after Anthony Blinken made the big mistake of answering a question and expressing some uh, sorrow for Wael Daudu's suffering, that his entire family has been systematically murdered by you know, uh, Blinken's friends in Israel, um, Blinken makes this mistake and the Israelis then magically pop up and they say, here's a document we found proving that while Daudou's uh, son, who also was a journalist, actually was a, a secret terrorist operative and on the payroll. Of the Islamic and, Jihad, yeah. Yeah, of, of, the, of the Islamic Jihad. Um, and, you know, I don't believe for one second that that uh, Israel deserves to be able to make such an allegation without actual proof. And and like we know from, you know, their Baghdad Bob, his his conduct in the hospital where he shows the scheduling sheet and says, aha, see, this is the this is the sheet where all the Hamas terrorists were signing up for their guard shift duty to guard Israeli hostages. And it turns out it said nothing of the sort. You know, it just took one person speaking Arabic to look at it and say it doesn't say what you're saying it says. So. You know, I, I, I think that when we look at 100, uh, I think we're on almost 110 journalists now that have been killed over the past three months um, by Israel. It's a it's a mass murder campaign against journalists. And, you know, look, Evan Gershkovich, who's in prison in Russia, I think he should be freed. I, I, I think it was an atrocious war crime that this a crime that the Saudis committed by butchering Jamal Khashoggi. But where are all the big CNN stars of the world who every day tweet, this is how many days that Evan Gershkovich has been in prison. Where are they when 110 of your colleagues have been murdered, murdered with American bombs, murdered with American bombs, yeah. clearly in an intentional campaign to wipe it out. You know, the Washington Post has the audacity to keep on the, on, on their, you know, thing that, you know, democracy dies in the darkness. Where, where is the systematic outrage from American journalists over the murder of our Palestinian colleagues. They are the eyes and ears of the world to a genocide that is unfolding in real time. 
and, yeah. and, and many of them, their families have been killed. Their houses have been destroyed. Their colleagues, their cameramen, their, their, their every, they're being systematically killed. And where is the solidarity? It's, it's, it's devastatingly horrible. Uh, I'm ashamed to be an American journalist, actually, right now. I'm ashamed to be an American journalist because we have failed, utterly failed our colleagues in Palestine, utterly failed them. Absolutely. Um, there's, uh, there's another thing I wanted to talk about, uh, about the International Court of Justice, because tomorrow, or at least I, I guess in a couple hours, uh, we we're supposed to hear from the Israeli side on its defenses, right, against the gross accusations of genocide and ethnic cleansing, which has been clearly laid out uh, oftentimes with uh, evidence that the Israeli soldiers and, like you said, the Israeli officials have, have uh, voluntarily given themselves. And um, their reaction to that, I suspect, is going to be somewhere along the boundaries of how they've tried to uh, contextualize this violence and why it's a necessity over and over again since October 7, a relitigation of October 7, uh, with, with some of the uh, most um, embellished aspects of it, in my opinion. Um, and then uh, beyond that, talk about how this is actually a war against Hamas and not against the Palestinian population, and it's oopsie, uh, you know, it ends up killing uh, overwhelmingly, uh, I believe, 70% uh, women, children, children, elderly, like outside of the the male combatant uh, age group, which even then is not one hundred percent that is going to be a, a militant, regardless. So, um, one thing I wanted to uh, ask about is uh, what do you suspect will happen when this court case uh, goes through, uh, if if the court itself finds. Uh, that Israel is not guilty, I guess, of the accusation of uh, conducting a genocide. And while yeah. you answer that question, I'm going to go pee really quickly. I'm going to be away for like one second, but chat will listen and I will hear you as well. Sorry. All right. Let's talk some shit about Hassan while he's gone. No, um, well, I mean, it's it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, how Israel actually presents its defense. Um, obviously, there, there almost certainly is going to be... Uh, you know, a sort of detailed retelling of the Israeli version of the events of October 7th. And, you know, I think they're, they're going to try to put the focus on the, you know, on the fact that they, their, their perspective is that they're fighting a war against terrorism and they're going to compare it to, you know, 9-11 and talk about principles of self-defense. And they'll, of, of course, present a legal based argument um, to, to argue that, in fact, they have the right to do this. That's, and, and it's, you know, probably going to going to be a well presented legal argument because you know Israel has very serious uh, lawyers. Um, but what I think is a problem, and and I think that that in the absence of this, I think it would be much easier to uh, see the court letting Israel off the hook, so to speak, um, is that Israel, uh, its own officials, from Netanyahu to the Defense Minister Gallant to Herzog, the president to multiple members of the cabinet, to uh, members of the Knesset, they're on record, on video, on audio, saying openly genocidal things. And, and so, you know, all of the facts that were presented today uh, in the court by South Africa's lawyers about the nature of the crimes and the argument that these crimes constitute genocide, Israel is going to have legal response to all of those things. There is no question. And you know, if you were just a kind of completely neutral person who was just walking in out of nowhere with no context and your only job is to listen to legal arguments, I'm sure Israel's going to going to do some of their lawyers are going to do an effective job at um, at arguing their case. The problem that they're going to run into, though, at the end of the day, is that the public is deeply aware of the fact that Netanyahu made these statements that Herzog made these statements, that Gallant made these statements. I think that actually is the strongest evidence. It's stronger evidence than the, the, and it's sad that this is true, than the sheer destruction of civilian life and infrastructure and culture in uh, Gaza. The, the most damning thing, I think, for the Israelis, the riskiest part of the case for them is that they've all been caught on tape openly saying these things. You know, one of the lawyers for South Africa said today, usually you have to dig up these kinds of statements to prove genocidal intent. And he yeah. said, what's extraordinary about this is that they said all of these things and they're continuing to say these things. So, and even if you, if you read the Israeli press, 
there have been several columns in the Israeli press saying that this is the thing Israel is concerned about with this case is is that, you know, it's it you don't need Chris Hansen to come into the you know into the room and be like here let's play the tape. I mean it's like they're saying it on an ongoing basis. You know that there there was no need to secretly record anybody saying anything. They were giving speeches laying out everything they were going to do. So you know I, not that I, I I can imagine being sympathetic to Israel's legal arguments, but I would predict that they're going to do an effective job at um at arguing in a kind of meticulous way that you know this statute and that statute apply here and that we had a right to do this and that you know this is not true you know e even though the the UN said this let's look at who the UN personnel are they'll probably try to put some of the UN people on you know trial by default or whatever um so but but setting that aside it's it it's all caught on tape it's all caught on tape and that i think is what makes this an extraordinary um situation because can you imagine you know those judges listening to that stuff today and then later being like yeah we rule that 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 didn't indicate any genocidal intent i mean it just when you take that combined with even if half of what south africa said today was true and you combine it with netanyahu and herzog and gallant and all these statements that that's a slam dunk case you know it's showing genocidal intent and and that's the standard here. They don't need to prove that they did that that they committed genocide. South Africa just needs to convince the court that that there's jurisdiction and a reasonable basis to have a a, a, a trial on this, and then the judges have to stop it. So I I, I don't I, I think there's a solid chance the judges rule in South Africa's favor, um, but nothing is ever certain in in these matters. And you know I bet the U.S., Israel, and others are are have everybody wiretapped. And are listening to everything that everyone is saying. They probably have all of the South African lawyers bugged. They probably have the court chambers bugged. I mean, you know, the NSA is probably listening to everything. But whether or not the U.S. is going to be able to actually do anything uh, to stop it, I don't know. I mean, it's. Well, uh, but even it's if a tough they one. do, even if they rule in favor of South Africa, like what mechanisms uh, does the United Nations have in this circumstance? Yeah, they ruled beyond... against Russia. I mean, yeah. they ruled against Russia and Putin was basically like, you know, I'll, I'll use that that order as a piece of toilet paper. I mean, it's you know, it, there is no actual enforcement mechanism. And you know why there's no inf enforcement mechanism? Because of the United States. Yeah, exactly. Because if, 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 if the United States agreed to play by the rules that they want the Rwandas of the world to be subjected to or the Putins of the world uh, subjected to, then you have a real serious case to be made to Vladimir Putin and say, oh, hold on a second. If the United States is doing this and you're not, no, you're the rogue of the world. The problem is that the U.S. is just a more sophisticated kind of rogue uh, and uh, and pays a lot of lip service to the rule of law. Putin's very happy to be perceived as a gangster, you know, but the, the U.S. wants to be perceived in a different manner. So you but you're asking a real question, which is there is no enforcement mechanism and there's no enforcement mechanism by design because the United States won't allow it. But what is significant and what I think is real is that if the court does rule that that Israel needs to stop this huge pressure is going to be then put yes. on America's European allies because how is it that the European Union um is is going to then stand up and say oh no we support the flagrant uh violation of an order from the world court that we all have accepted the jurisdiction of that's the problem here and 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 so i don't have any illusion that like you know the United Nations is going to, you know, deploy blue helmets to go and stop Netanyahu's bloody rampage. But this is going to be an interesting development in Europe because a lot of American allies are are going to be in a bad situation because they don't go as far as the United States on on these issues. You know, the the U.S. is, you know, definitely they want the U.S. to do what it's doing. They like that the U.S. is taking the hit for vetoing every, you know, all this shit. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to deal with their own public and. You know, the general public in many European countries, they're they're getting increasingly fed up with this stuff. They're also sick of the war in Ukraine. They're sick of their energy prices rise. I mean, there's lots of factors. Yeah. You have fascist parties increasing in popularity in Germany and elsewhere. I mean, there's there's a powder keg that that exists right now in Europe. And so the timing of this is is quite interesting. So bottom line is no chance it would be enforced. Almost certainly Israel will, will ignore it and continue on with U.S. Uh, backing to some degree. I don't know how the U.S. publicly would state that, but it's going to be a problem in Europe. Yeah. Then there is the other side. But you're, you're absolutely correct. I think also that uh, the, the worse 
aspect of this for, uh, I guess, uh, instruments of power in the Western world will be the civilian pressure, like their their civil society uh, getting more of a go-ahead to, like, openly state, no, this is, like, an international court of justice ruling. This is genocidal unconditionally. It's not dissimilar to what happened after Amnesty International. Show me more Nicorette here. Oh, same. I'm a, I'm a yeah. big Nicorette guy myself. But I alternate um, between I don't like any of the flavors. You know, I yeah. alternate between like the mint and then the, the non flavor one. Oh my god, that's what think. I do as well. I have the regular bubble gum here and then the mint one here. Yeah. The coated one. I got, yeah. I got these ones. I I have the European kind though. It's not as good as the American stuff. I need I'm to probably this is the good stuff. This is Nicorette. It's like four milligram and two milligram. I I, I just dropped down those. to two milligram. Oh, nice. I mean, it's very effective if you're looking to stop smoking. I've been chewing it for years, but I stopped smoking years ago, but I still chew. I know. I've, I, I've, I've narrowed my vice down. I'm on no pharmaceuticals except an allergy medication, and I just am on the, the nicotine. I don't drink alcohol anymore. Same. I can't live without my nicotine. Same. Um, All right. Anyway, so, we were talking about something serious. I didn't mean to do a commercial. No, no, it's fine. But... I, it's, I'm, a, I'm in the same boat. But um, the thing I was going to say is, um, beyond the pressure we're talking about, be- civil, about civil society and yeah, civil yeah. society and the, the pressure that will mount towards, uh, uh, like the unconditional support afforded to, uh, to Israel making like a less popular position. It kind of cuts through that. And we saw a version of this, uh, in Amnesty International, uh, and other NGOs like human rights groups that normally do, in my opinion, uh, oftentimes, operate alongside the American State Department's interests, usually against America's foreign adversaries, more often than not. Uh, this was one of those instances when, in 2021, uh, when they all collectively openly admitted something that many people have known for quite a long time, that Israel was an apartheid state that often, in my opinion, that was a, a part of the sea change, a part of the attitude mm-hmm. shift, because it gave the permission to many, I guess, like squishy liberals even, to, to openly state things as they are, that Israel is undeniably an apartheid state. And I think that the ICJ decision, if it favors the South African position, will play a similar role and, um, and, and oh, I mean, to- you know, yeah. slowly but surely it will chip away at the, uh, marginally chip away at the, at the dominance that uh, Israel has on Western media and, and uh, you know, our, our interests. But, you know, earlier in your show, before I came on, I was watching and, you know, you 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 made reference to sort of people that are on your feed sort of being more tapped in um, to things. And I'm sure that that's totally true. And and this is true in general of a lot of, uh, you know, the, 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 the generation of people that are coming into adulthood right now. It, it's really interesting to look at how people get their information and they're not held captive to you know, just corporate media or, you know, major media or media that, you know, most quote unquote grownups have even heard of. And on this issue, you know, you, you can talk to, you can stop a random young person, you know, in, in the cities of many countries around the world and, and start talking to them about Palestine or Israel, and they're going to know a bunch about it. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that this trick of the Israeli government of trying to force the world to believe that criticism of the Israeli government is criticism of Judaism or criticism of Jews or is anti-Semitism, that's done. That era is finished. That doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's this is a recent thing. It, it oh, yeah. does not work anymore. And I mean, I'm, I'm getting called an anti-Semite uh, every day by these people, you know, by, by, by these wackadoodles who, who are trying to convince the world that um, Israel somehow means Judaism. You know, I, I like, I, I, I talk to my, my, my friends who are Jewish all the time and everybody is uh, like saying that like th- these people do not represent us. And, yeah. but this is new. This is new that that is piercing into the mainstream. This is the point I'm getting at. I think there's been a, a, a paradigm shattered here. Um, and I, and I think that, um, you know, people whose brains have not been poisoned by Hasbara and the sort of propaganda industry from Israel and in the United States, where it's drilled into your head too in American politics that you must support um, Israel, it's shifting, you know, and in Germany, I'm in Germany right now, in Germany, um, they have these speech laws on anti-Semitism and they're uh, they're arresting people. Hundreds upon hundreds of people have been arrested uh, on anti-Semitic speech laws 
for simply protesting against uh, Israel's genocidal campaign in Gaza, including an elderly Jewish Israeli uh, woman arrested twice in a five-day period in Berlin. They're talking about trying to make a law that says if you want to become a naturalized citizen, you know, Germany has a huge Turkish population, an increasingly large Arab population. They're trying to make a law that says as a condition for naturalization that you have to sign a form recognizing the right of the state of Israel to exist. <laughs> it's like a it's and, like a BDS law that they have in like Texas. If you want to get like contracts with the government or if you want to be a right. public school teacher, you have to be like, I will never criticize Israel. <laughs> I promise never to be the Sharia law. But yeah. um, but. But the point I'm getting at, though, is that so much of that propaganda that's been so effective at policing the American public um, on these issues, um, it's it's blowing up. And I also think that the world is uh, is is actually quite horrified that Joe Biden, uh, the, the the man who uh, saved the world from Donald Trump and could have had a nice four years of Grandpa Joe in power has revealed himself, like those of us that followed his career knew this, but has revealed himself now to the world to be an enthusiastic supporter of the annihilation of one of the most victimized groups of people on the planet, whose concentration camp has now been transformed into a killing cage, subjected to regular bombardment by American bombs. I I, I think we're, we're entering a different world right now, and it is going to be a shit show in the American yeah. election. In because you know, I think there is a difference between Biden and Trump. I think it's possible that Trump would have actually been doing U.S. drone strikes in Gaza. Um, oh yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I, I've never bought the notion that Trump is some kind of dove or something like that. Um, you know, no, no, no. But of I, course I, not. I mean, this is a continuation of Trump's policies. This is the Abraham that's Accords. That's not an play. argument. Yeah, yeah, but this is. I'm not yeah. making an argument. The ergo, therefore, we should vote for you know Grandpa Joe. Um, what I'm saying is. When they start shaming everybody, the Democrats, and they start saying, oh, you're going to give us Trump, you know, the answer to them is you did this. You did this. You yeah. did it by by uh, having Biden run again when he is a half brain dead potato. You did it by uh, by uh, supporting uh, enthusiastically the extermination of the, the people of Gaza yeah. by, un by by saying there's no red line to what Netanyahu can do. They did this to themselves. You know, and 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 so I don't know what the answer is on 2024, but I know this. If Donald Trump becomes president, it's Joe Biden's fault. Oh, it's absolutely. the Democratic Party's fault. Absolutely. Like you there's none of this shaming people because they vote for Cornell West or Jill Stein. You gave them nothing to vote for when you conducted yourself in this manner and you ran this guy again and you did the things you did in office. Yeah. See, I mean, look, there's already people in the chat doing it right now. There's this idea within the liberal population, especially those who are like very tuned into the politics who like consume it all the time that like they love fighting the, the battle as though as though the Bernie bros are still alive. Right. They want to go back to the 2016 era of like you're going up against Hillary Clinton. How dare you? And, and try to relitigate those uh, struggles like as though there is like a unique leftist momentum within the Democratic Party and a and a representative that they can like uh, champion that is somehow a threat to Biden. Biden is alone and yet he is a threat to himself and he's a threat to American democracy. He's a threat to the Democratic Party's power in this country. And yet these guys are so primed, so conditioned to to constantly yell at voters and constantly yell at anyone but the Democratic Party as team players that they're like looking to relitigate those uh, Bernie bro yeah, but, arguments when there's no but, Bernie but to bro. Yeah, yeah. And Bernie actually has been a mixed bag on this, yeah. uh, on this Gaza war. Exactly. He's doing some really, he's doing some really smart things right now on a legislative level. So I give him credit for that, but my God, he was so bad for the first several months of this, but um, that that's a whole other show. The, the thing is, I, my question for anybody who is going to start vote shaming people, I want to see the receipts. I want to see how every single day you were calling the White House, telling Biden to stop supporting this genocidal slaughter in Gaza. I want to see your receipts. I want to see that you just spent endless hours working those phones, knocking on those doors, calling your precinct captains, doing everything you could to stop this stuff. I want to see the receipts that showed that you said Biden shouldn't run again because nobody actually wants him to run again. If you can't produce those receipts, I don't want to even talk to you about the 2024 election. I will talk to someone. If someone is saying, oh no, I passionately did it. I did all this stuff, but I'm scared of Trump for X, Y, and Z reason. And I'm totally with you. I agree. With okay. I'll talk to you about that because you sound like a really fundamentally good person. 
But if you're just some nitwit who every four years wants to vote shame people because they have an actual conscience, get out of here. I mean, you're yeah. not a serious person. You're a cog in a machine. It's, it's a funny because that's a very common joke I also make. I ask people to show receipts or pay stubs from the DNC because it's like you shouldn't be doing this for free. You shouldn't be coming in here and, and defending the Democratic Party's like malpractice, Democratic Party's negligence uh, for free. At least some people get paid to do it. You know what I mean? Like, why are you operating? Why are you LARPing as a D.C. consultant and you don't even have a badge? You don't even have a shiny lanyard to, to show for it. Yeah, go. I mean, go, go, go find one of the many Palestinians that live in the United States whose family members have been collectively murdered with American bombs and sit down with them and you tell them why they should be voting for Joe Biden. That, that's what that, that's what I want. I want to hear. I don't make the case to me or Hassan. Make make the case to a Palestinian whose entire family in Gaza has been killed on why they should be voting for Joe Biden. Like that, that really is the gold standard here. And if you're and if your case is. Oh my God! I I spent every waking minute trying to stop the war in Gaza. Okay, you're a person that I actually think should be listened to and taken seriously. Short of that, go away. You yeah. go make your vote and let everyone else vote their conscience. Um, uh, going back to the conflation, by the way, between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, uh, two things I wanted to talk about really briefly is that uh, the ADL already has been like a a questionable organization from its inception, uh, although. Obviously, it's like foundational principle is supposed to be something that we all agree on combating anti-Semitism in the United States of America, which is like a you know very harmful bigotry. And yet, uh, through their uh, I guess historical collaboration with the apartheid South African government, spying on uh, you know labor uh, leaders and 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 Jewish Americans who are anti-apartheid at the time uh, in the eighties, like anti-apartheid activists who are Jewish themselves. And, and now the continuation under Jonah Greenblatt's, uh, 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 his, his leadership, the ADL has openly, for the first time ever, revealed that um, its anti-Semitism trackers, those numbers actually factor in pro-Palestinian protests. A a approximately yeah. a third of all of the anti-Semitic incidents logged since October 7th by the ADL are directly just simply pro Palestinian protests, oftentimes led by Jewish groups. Um, it's a uh, the the uh, the the like the organization that is incredibly important as far as like what it's supposed to do, which is combat anti-Semitism, track anti-Semitism, um, has has completely uh, faltered from the origination or from the original message. And they're, like I said, it's been marred already. It's, it's reputation has been tarnished in the past as well. However, uh, now it's like, it, it's, it's at a time when anti-Semitism is rising because it's oftentimes, as it oftentimes does when Israel does conduct these acts of genocide and then people um, do look at that and go, okay, well, this is, you know, the responsibility of all Jews, which is inherently anti-Semitic to think. Um, you you see well, that you have like Alan that, you know Alan Dershowitz uh you know he's he's been running around and he's saying oh Jewish Voices for Peace um, doesn't actually have any real Jews in it and they're just using them as props and it's basically a, a front for a terror support group um yeah I don't mean to open the Dershowitz can of worms I was just, it just uh, popped into my ex I, I saw Dersh. a clip of him the other day yeah the, the I think he was supposed to be one of the lawyers representing Israel yeah I'm um, so sad that the ICJ, and then I'm the so Epstein sad that the Jeffrey stuff. Epstein stuff took away from that. Well, and I mean, the questions about Epstein's connections to Mossad and, you know, and, and, and other intelligence agencies, I think is actually a very legitimate course of inquiry. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's really, it's really interesting the, the way that the, the, the shattering of the kind of media monopolies has, has, has opened the gates and, and, um, it's an interesting media landscape right now, very depressing in many ways, but also quite interesting on the ADL issue though. I mean, I think. I think that what Netanyahu is doing and what the radical um, sort of uh, extremists that are defending Israel are doing by for trying to force a conflation of Judaism with the state of Israel is ultimately making uh, Jews less safe. And it 100%. is, it is it, it's creating um, dangerous conditions because their messaging on it is that the Jewish state has a right to do this to Palestinian Muslims, um, and not to mention that they're also doing it to Palestinian Christians, et cetera. Yeah. But, um, but that, is, that is sort of the message that they're sending. 
and it's really dangerous and um, and reckless. I, I used to throughout the whole so-called war on terror, and especially during Obama, when I was traveling to Somalia and Yemen and Afghanistan, all these places, and in place after place after place, what I saw on the ground was that our actions, the U.S.'s own actions, the drone strikes, the killing of families, the sort of perception that we were a gratuitous enemy, uh, doing the night raids, killing pregnant women, you know, all these stories that I did. Everywhere I was realizing we are giving people a legitimate reason to actually want to attack Americans. And, and, and we shouldn't be doing that. This is not, you know, I'm not in the business of giving advice to the United States government, but, you know, we, we, we should be looking at do our actions make us more safe or less safe? And the same is true, you know, for the Israeli government. And, and, and you, 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 I, I don't see how you can conclude anything other than Netanyahu has looked at this and said, I'm okay with making Jews across the world less safe because this is my agenda. And my agenda matters more than, uh, than anything else. I mean, this, this is yeah. madness. It's utter madness. Of course, there's, there's you know, anti-Semitism is utterly vile. And, and certainly we see it flaring in so many places around the world. Um, Especially on then, Twitter, uh, with the with the likes of Elon Musk, like uh, openly oh, unbanning uh, anti semites. Yeah, no, f absolutely. And you know, so but but at the end of the day, we need to have a discussion of of how we actually confront real anti semitism. And when the ADL is categorizing people uh, using their powers in a democratic society to nonviolently protest about the actions of another nation that is engaged in a genocidal yeah. war. And you say that simply doing that is anti-Semitic or using the term from the river to the sea that it's anti-Semitic. This is very dangerous because it cheapens the experience of those who actually are suffering from anti-Semitism. Yeah. This is, this is also true, by the way, for the events of October 7th. When you promote things that are false, when you make up incendiary stories to try to make your uh, the, your enemies look like vicious animals um, and you want to strip them of any humanity whatsoever, you're also doing a grave disservice to the dead and to the and to the survivors uh, that love them. Um, yeah. Because what you're doing is you're not allowing actual justice to be served. You're not allowing the actual facts to be known. You're concocting stories in pursuit of, a, of an agenda, a murderous agenda, and you're using the deaths of those innocent people. Hundreds of Israeli civilians were murdered that day. And by making up stories or saying, oh, this, this thing happened to this woman, and then her family says, oh, no, actually, that's, that's not true at all. When you do that, it's like spitting on the graves of the dead. It's, it's disgusting that you do that in pursuit of killing other people, too. So, and, 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 but yet, this is the politics of the day. This is how Israel is rolling now. Yeah. The, the uh, instilling fears in the heart of the diaspora is, of course, beneficial for Benjamin Netanyahu because that's how he can reinforce the narrative that, like, Jews are safe nowhere around the world except for Israel, when ironically many American Jews have said this throughout history that, like, no, they're way less safe in Israel than they are in the United States of America. And part of that, of course, is because of the actions of Israel and the, uh, the deliberate attempt to conflate from Zionists the actions of Israel with the entirety of the religion of, of Judaism. So it's this never-ending cycle of, of uh, consistently increasing tensions. And when you have someone like Joe Biden championing that, because of his own ideological background, because of his own personal opinions, saying something, in my opinion, as gross as, uh, without Israel, Jews would not be safe anywhere around the world, when you are the president of the United States of America, a country that has almost the same number of Jewish citizens as the nation state of Israel. Like, there's, what, 6 million Jews in America, and I believe almost uh, 6.9 million, 7 million Jews in the state of Israel. And then the president of like the largest Jewish diaspora on the planet is saying such an insane statement. I mean, it's 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 gross. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You're saying it's an abdication of your responsibility to American citizens. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, look, I mean, look what was happening to Netanyahu right before all of this happened. I mean, he was in, um, he was in a fight for his political life. Um, you know, there were massive protests against him. He had, he had done all this shenanigans with the court system in Israel. Um, and, you know, I also, I, I, I think there's really, uh, there, there's really going to end up being a scandalous narrative that will emerge about the so-called intelligence failures in Israel leading up to the Hamas attacks. And it's completely legitimate to raise the issue of Netanyahu's role in, um, in facilitating the pipeline of money from Qatar to Hamas. Um, you know, and, and at least going back to 2012, we know that Netanyahu was advocating for a position of bolstering rather than weakening um, Hamas's political power within Gaza. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not saying I have any evidence, nor am I suggesting that, you know, this is some false flag or that Netanyahu wanted this to happen. Um, but there's a very serious course of uh, inquiry that that I think is going to take place in Israel um, about exactly uh, who knew what and when. Um, also, in the way that the uh, Israeli forces uh, were slow to respond to some of the um, attacks led by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And then, you know, as I said at the beginning, the public in Israel has a right to know how many Israelis were killed that day uh, by their own forces. How many of the people that were burned uh, were killed as a result of Israeli munitions fired? What kinds of efforts were actually made to resolve the hostage crisis as it existed um, at the kibbutzes that day versus, um, you know, shelling um, or, or bombing. Uh, I, I, I think that it's respect uh, to the dead to uh, ascertain all of the facts. And at the end of the day, I don't think Netanyahu is going to look good at any of this if there's yeah. an actual inquiry. And there are good journalists in Israel. We shouldn't paint it with a model. I read the Israeli press like, you know, every single day, all day long. I'm yeah, checking Plus the 970 press. magazine uh, is... is uh, for it, it, people in my chat know plus 970 for uh, their work on uh, the artificial I, intelligence program yeah. called gospel and like Israel's targeting uh, or plus 972. Sorry, not 970 yeah. magazine um, is uh, they, they're great. Uh, obviously, like even in Haaretz, you have uh, Gideon Levi and, and many others. But like also Haaretz's, Haaretz's um, defense correspondence. I mean, it's sort of like when you're reading the New York Times. The New York Times does have some really good journalists. Yeah. There's no question about it. Um, I, I know some of them. I've been with them. I mean, there's there are really good. And the same is true of Washington Post and Wall Street Journal. But you have to, yeah. you have to really study how to read these papers. Yeah. You have to learn what happens when the stories get edited. And once you once you put on the right kind of glasses to read the New York Times, you 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 read it in a different way and you can actually learn a lot you can understand a lot about the nature of power you can understand when you're being fed bs versus something that actually is real information um you get to know which journalists are reliable and and clearly are fighting a battle internally to get their stuff printed the same is true of haaretz and other israeli media outlets once you 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 understand sort of the rules that they're operating under it's it's really enriching to read those publications because often you're you're getting a sense of uh, of what's happening at the highest levels of power and that's something that people like you and I don't have access to so I actually think that you know we all have to learn to be students of these media outlets uh, whether we like it or not because they're conduits for the views of the powerful and you have to understand how the powerful think and operate uh, it's why it's why everyone should read the financial press. You have yeah. to understand how these people operate, what their priorities are, what the rules of the game are that they're playing, um, because it's it, w without it, you're missing an entire piece of the puzzle that's going to make your understanding uh, flawed. Yeah, you know, you're describing media literacy that I, I, I go through every single day because I people come in here and ask me like, well, what do we do? Like you say, the New York Times is biased. And I always try to tell people like, just like any state outlet, right, any state media, um, there are biases within the New York Times, even if it's not a state-owned uh, operation. Uh, so, for example, when it comes to foreign policy or when it comes to whichever journalist is uh, conducting uh, their, their uh, you know, is writing the, the pieces. Like, for example, um, I forget who wrote it, but, like, there was an editorial opinion piece in the New York Times um, about uh, going back into Afghanistan and everybody got really mad about it. And actually the, the point being made by the person writing the article was entirely at odds with the actual title of the article, which was written in a very incendiary way. That's one thing that most people don't know in the editorial side of things in the New York times. Um, 
you're going to have access to a, a, a variety of different opinions, but the headlines are being written by editors and they have a very different interest than the person writing the editorial uh, piece. So um, that's something. I mean, but I, had a, I had a terrible thing happen once when I was at the Nation magazine where I wrote like this really serious investigative piece. This was back in the days of Blackwater Mercenaries. And it was supposed to be on the cover. And then, and I, it was about like these, these four guys that had gotten killed and I had worked with their families and they were like, it was a really important article I had done for them. And then the nation, it was supposed to be the cover. And then the nation at the last minute puts uh, Alfred E. Newman uh, sitting on the toilet, looking like George W. Bush on the cover of the nation magazine. Oh, God. And it was like, I, I, I hit the roof. Well, no, cause it was like, I wanted to send this to the families cause it meant a lot to them. And anyway, the point just being, all kinds of stuff happens in editorial processes. And, you know, you, you, you gotta be, you gotta, you really, if you're a serious person, you have to learn how to read the paper. And it doesn't yeah. just mean comprehend the words. It means you have to study the politics of the paper, uh, look for patterns because it actually is worthwhile. I've never been a fan of like, Oh, I don't read the New York times. And I really, I, I almost can't watch CNN anymore. I mean, I try to sometimes, but I, I will always read the establishment newspapers yeah. because you have you. I mean, if you don't do that, you, you. This is a very serious error on people's part. You have to understand how the powerful think, and that's where they yeah. do their talk. This is actually what I wanted to point to. Oh, that now I remember. So one thing that you brought up about like uh, a variety of different outlets and like an access to what's going on on the ground with like social media, TikTok in particular, both on the Israeli side of them, like very openly, IDF social, very openly documenting Telegram, the atrocious yeah. things that they're doing, but also on Telegram uh, with like, uh, you know, posts coming directly from the al Qassam brigades and also from Palestinians on the ground who are showcasing like the atrocities that they're subjected to. Um, this has been phenomenal in breaking through the, the otherwise uh, dominant narrative. And that's why you see a massive difference uh, in, in uh, age demographics in the way that they perceive Israel's actions to be permissible or not. People that get uh, people that have incorporated social media into their media diets actually do have a very different opinion than those who do not get that as a primary source. However, there's also the negative side of that too, because I feel like that's how you arrive at a lot of charlatans as well. People who take yeah, advantage yeah, of that. Sure. People who take advantage of the lack of trust in mainstream media, because like you and I both understand how important it is to still read the New York Times and to still recognize that there's like good journalism also happening at these mainstream outlets every now and then. Um, or even if it's a biased piece, there's still, uh, I guess, like some semblance of the truth that you see uh, within that. Whereas um, the, the more yeah. uh, the, the legacy publishers operate as a mouthpiece for the State Department, the less people trust it. And that creates an opportunity for a, a tremendous amount of misinformation from those who claim to be the arbiters, the real arbiters of the truth. And that's how you arrive at, like, you know, the, the insane anti-Semitic conspiracies from, uh, yeah, yeah. from people. And that's how you arrive at, like, anti-Semitism increasing. And that's how you arrive at, like, QAnon stuff, right? But, you know, that this is also why, you know... I mean, I, so I have, I'm in the telegram channels of, uh, of a variety of Islamic resistance groups, including the, uh, Al Qasim brigades. So I follow all of their, they're very, very active. Um, they, you know, you have to follow them through, uh, mirror channels because they keep getting shut down, but you know, I'm, I'm monitoring, um, the communications from Hezbollah, from the Houthis, from Hamas. And sometimes like, I'll be somewhere like in a restaurant and like, you know, pop up on my phone, an alert will pop up that the custom brigades have just posted a video. So I'll get into conversations sort of with, you know, normies, as you said earlier. And what I say to people is like, we're, we're being told that these guys are like the second coming of the Nazis, um, you know, and that they're like ISIS. They're the worst, you know, butchers in the world. They're eating children's body parts, et cetera. Don't you think it would behoove you to sort of fact check that, like look into it, understand what is their perspective? Um, if you're not monitoring as a journalist, if you're not monitoring what Hamas is saying, if you're not following their media channels, if you're not following the videos that they're releasing, often Hamas will release a video showing an attack. And then two days later, Israel will acknowledge that nine soldiers got killed here. And it turns out that we already knew that two days ago because Hamas posted the video of them killing them. Um, you know, this isn't supporting Hamas. This is doing basic diligence because we're yeah. dealing with a, a nuclear armed nation state that is a pathological liar. 
And and so, you know, not, not to get cliche, but this is exactly the kind of stuff Malcolm X is talking about when he talks about, you know, the m manipulation and and have and letting the other people tell you who the enemy is. And and when it comes to Hamas, I find it extremely important to actually have a factual understanding of exactly who they are and what they do. And Absolutely. you know, I'm not a moral arbiter of anything. I'm here as a journalist. And what often happens is that the Israelis will say something, and when you actually just scratch the surface a bit, you realize it's not exactly what you're saying. Um, and and I'll tell you this: I mean, watching watching Hamas's channels is extremely revealing when it comes to what is happening on the ground with the Israeli military forces inside of Gaza. And it helps you to understand, it's going to help you to understand when Israel does not end this by tying a neat little ribbon of defeating Hamas, um, because it's not going well for Israel. And you only know that if you uh, separate your, if you cut the umbilical cord from the Israeli propaganda machine that is being reinforced by the Biden administration. So yeah. this isn't a pro Hamas anything. This is a pro fact thing. I'm very clear that what Hamas, that many of the things that Hamas did on October 7th, particularly towards civilians, those are war crimes. There should be accountability for that. You don't kidnap children. Absolutely. You don't kidnap the elderly. You don't shoot families in their beds. You know, it, it doesn't matter if those people were occupation settlers or whatever. Many of the fucking people that got killed at those kibbutzes, you know, were sort of lefty types and whatever. Do they yeah. have a right to be living on Palestinian land? No, they absolutely fucking do not have a right to be living on Palestinian land. Does it mean that then they need to be murdered in their rooms? No, it doesn't need, mean they need to be murdered in their rooms. At the same time, no one's going to bully me into saying that there wasn't some uh, legal framework for what Hamas did at military bases that day. Yeah. Um, or, or, or that, you know, the, or, or get me to, to, to say, well, Israel had some right of self-defense to go in and then murder upwards of 30,000 people, a vast majority of whom are civilians. Like these are just facts, you know, and, and people try to bully you. If you, if you dare to sort of say, let me, let me try to understand what these people I'm being told are like the new Nazis. Let me try to understand a little bit about them. Like, isn't that or responsible? Or, or they're, they're I mean, like anyone. barbaric. They're like a colonizing force akin to like ISIS. Which is uh, yeah. obviously well, they call them ISIS. Yeah, right. Which is well, hilarious because, like Israel, in both its like association of of like in in its actions, being uh, settler colonial violence or colonial violence over an occupied uh, uh, group of individuals, uh, occupied population, um, and also its association with that violence with religion, a false association with religion, because they are the ones oftentimes that conflate it with Judaism is way closer to ISIS than, than uh, Hamas being a resistance group against a uh, occupying power. So, and, and also obviously Israel has in the past collaborated with ISIS type Salafist militant groups, Al Nusra and the like. So like, it, you know, you, it, whereas uh, uh, while there are, uh, as far as I understand, ISIS militants inside of Gaza too, every now and then, uh, Hamas does not want ISIS to be inside of Gaza. They don't want, they want to be the only game in town. So they have executed uh, uh, ISIS militants inside of Gaza in the past. So it's it, not it's, just it's, that. It's, I mean, that's true what you're saying, but it's not just that. Um, it's, it's also that there is a distinct national identity to the Palestinian resistance and the notion that you're going to have, you know, the, you know, these other forces coming in and hijacking what is ultimately a national liberation struggle. I mean that that is what pal that's what Palestinians have been engaged in for 76 years. They've been engaged in a national liberation struggle. And because, you know, we all now it's the power of nightmares, ooh, spooky Islamic resistance, you know, uh if if Catholicism was demonized in the same way, then it would have been the same narrative about the the you know, the IRA, you know, in Ireland. Yeah. And there's there isn't compatibility between ISIS and the Palestinian resistance because the Palestinian resistance is a distinctly national liberation movement. It's just true. Yeah, you know, and that's and, actually, and, it, and it falls apart. Like the the arguments fall apart so quickly because like if you consistently make your enemy look like a barbaric monster that has no real interest in like emancipation or anything of that matter. And they're just simply operating on anti-Semitism and like the hate, their hatred for Jewish people, which is 
Or, or even like how much they love Hitler. They're always like, oh, look at ISIS. We found, I mean, not ISIS. Look at Hamas. Yeah. We found like another uh, copy of Mein Kampf in Arabic that's yeah. annotated over and over again. Now, when I look at that, I find it very hilarious because like that is such a classic Western focused version of propaganda. Like they're, they're trying to conduct an argument as though like, uh, you know, this is campus anti-Semitism. Like they, they went to a Jewish fraternity and, and uh, painted a, a swastika on the side of it. Like that's not what Hamas is doing at all, but they're trying to yeah. Americanize or they're trying to get the, the Western world to understand it. It's like, listen, um, the idea that like Palestinians are operating on the on the basis of anti-Semitism and not on on uh, the fact that like Israel is blowing up their population and has been a belligerent occupier for at least since 1967 and even before that, obviously with the Nakba, but um, and that you know it's being conducted by those who say that they're doing it uh, at the best of Judaism. Like they don't need Mein Kampf to learn about anti-Semitism in the same way that like some Midwestern kid would in America to, to when they get radicalized online or whatever, right? Like, that's so stupid. I mean, can you, can you imagine, you know, just to Im imagine what it's like to, to grow up in Gaza? Um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, but seriously, people should really, really think about this. Imagine what your human existence would be like if you, you grow up in, air, in an area, a country, basically, that is the more or less the size of Philadelphia, you know, and you're uh, and you're trapped in what is essentially an open air prison, and you have uh, a foreign uh, uh, occupying power that is in full control of every aspect of your life, whether there is water, whether there is food, uh, whether the fishermen are allowed to go a certain uh, distance off the shore. You're you're growing up in this uh, in this sort of cage, basically, and. Palestinians in Gaza are some of the most well-educated people in the world. Um, you know, Israel systematically destroyed its universities, killed its academics, its poets, its storytellers. Um, but it's like, what what happens to the psychology of human beings? What do what does the world expect anyway? Is is going to happen? It's a miracle. It's a miracle that the people of Gaza are the way they are. It's a miracle that they're so res resilient. I mean, yeah. look at look at how big, right now most Palestinians are living in conditions where they have one toilet for every 480 people. That's that's what most people are. Think of how many Americans fucking gripe about their kids taking too long in the bathroom. Imagine having to live in conditions where you are breastfeeding a baby and you have to make a choice between drinking salt water that's going to make you ill or contaminated water that's going to make you ill. You have women with newborn babies who can't lactate and so they're using formula and they don't have clean water to mix the formula powder. So they're having to try to decide which kind of contaminated water should I use to breastfeed my baby. The Just one moment of anyone's day, you should just stop, read something about what the conditions were like even on October 6th in Gaza and ask yourself, how would I look my children in the face? How would I look my friends in the face? What would my life be like? Would I be pursuing a PhD? Would, would I be going to university? Would I be online trying to educate the rest of the world? What kind of person would you be? It's incredible that the people of Gaza are as resilient, that you see so many articulate children. This nine-year-old girl who did an interview with Wael Daudou, the, the, the bureau chief Al for Al Jazeera Arab, Arabic, yeah. who wants to be a, you know, I, I posted this video of her on Twitter. And then like two days later, Wael and his, you know, and his cameraman get hit by, you know, an Israeli drone strike when they're reporting on a previous strike at a hospital. But it's like this little girl was incredible. So many children that you see that are, you know, videos of them coming out of Gaza. These are these are wonderful, beautiful human beings without any context. But then when you understand how they grew up and then the Israelis are like, oh, look, we found Mein Kampf here. Oh look, this girl has a screensaver on her iPad uh, of Hitler's of face. Hitler, you know, that was one yeah. of the things that they did. And it's like, what's next to Trump's bed? Trump had a cop. What didn't it? Wasn't it Trump's? One of his family members said Trump had Mein Kampf next to his bed. I mean, but it's again, like it's just, it's just so ridiculous and so obviously propaganda. And it's propaganda that I like to look at and see who the target audience is. And it's so glaringly obvious that it's a Western-facing propaganda to like. 
make this association with Hitler and make this association with like German European anti-Semitism as though like, I mean, I'm not going to say that there isn't anti-Semitism in the, in the Arab world or in the Muslim world in general. Of course there are. Of course there's anti-Semitism all over the place. Of course there's anti-Semitism in the, in the Muslim world as well, but it's like, that the, the what that where that anti-Semitism comes from, where it's born out of, is like entirely different in many cases. And I think the only reason why you would try to make that argument is specifically to get like the European minds to comprehend it as like, oh, these are bad guys. Like they're bad guys because they they like Adolf Hitler. And it's like that's not. I don't think that's the case at all for many Palestinians. They are. But you look at. They are surprisingly yeah. open-minded about. Uh, uh, Israeli people and Jewish people. Rafat, who uh, rest in yeah. power, was assassinated by the state of Israel um, after, I believe, uh, Barry Weiss and numerous other American reporters had like uh, uh, criticized him for uh, for engaging in a little bit of gallows humor, as uh, you know, Israel was ethnically cleansing uh, his his uh, entire city. Um, he talked about how uh, originally until like I guess he was like 25 or 26 or something that he had never like had never met a, a Jewish person and beyond that everything he knew about Jewish people was Israel and that he thought that like Jewish people just despised all Palestinians across the board and that like they just wanted to kill all Palestinians across the board and then he had changed his percep- uh, perception when he realized like oh my god they're like actually you know Israeli citizens even uh, Israeli Jewish citizens that are are uh, out there advocating for uh, Palestinians against their own country, and I think like um, this is something that we can't comprehend in America because uh, it's impossible for us to comprehend it. We have no way of contextualizing that level of violence. Uh, we only see it in TV as like either uh, entire city blocks reduced to rubble. In like whether it be Syria or Iraq, in the hands of like American soldiers or like civil war or something of that sort, we don't we don't have any way of uh, of recognizing that uh, these are real human beings and not like uh, something that's different, something that's been dehumanized systematically through mainstream media as a consequence of America's um, objectives in the Middle East. I mean, you know, as someone who's traveled a lot in countries that have been on the, you know, I've been in a lot of places where you're on the other side of the barrel of the gun, you know, of American foreign policy. And I was always struck, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen or Somalia, um, at how um, so many people who had every reason to want to kill me um, drew a distinction. Um, And I heard it so many times, it was almost like someone had given a script. That's how consistent it was in countries across the world where people would say, I know you're not your government. And I would be the one saying to them, no, I'm also complicit in this. Um, you know, it's, I, 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 I think we've been fed uh, a, an enormous barrel of lies our whole lives. Um, and the, it, it's necessary to dehumanize the enemy. That's the first step of uh, justifying the unjustifiable. And it's a tactic as old as time. And it's not that there aren't, you know, sick, twisted bastards, uh, you know, operating um, in, in a variety of groups, including Hamas. That's, you know, that's true. There's also sick, twisted bastards operating in the United States military. And I yeah. think that the, the mistake we all make is allowing ourselves to get pressured, bullied, cajoled into um, cowering before those characterizations. Um, people should do their own thinking. That's what journalists should be in the business of anyway. And, you know, uh, my my general instinct as a reporter and as a journalist for uh, going on three decades now has been that when I'm told by the powerful who my enemy is, I want to go talk to those people. Um, I want I want to, you know, because I don't view myself as just thinking for myself. I try to give people information that they can use to make informed decisions on what they support or oppose or other things. And I try to be very transparent. Clearly, I'm not a guy that just believes in he said this and the other person said this. I don't I don't believe in the corporate media defined terms of objectivity. But the hardest part of of keeping your spine is when you're told uh, those people are vicious animals who kill for pleasure. Um, having the bra- the bravery or the principle to be able to say, I'm going to check that fact. 
Um, and yeah. that's what all of us should be doing uh, in the face it's, it's of the It's the bare minimum. Yeah, it, no, it's no the one bare should be winning minimum. an award for doing that. That should just be basic journalism. Yes. But look at the bullying about it, though. If you dare to say, hey, let's look at this from the perspective of Hamas, uh, which I think is a totally legitimate line of inquiry and pursuit. Yeah. Uh, because so, but that's controversial. Um, and, you know, we're not supposed to do that. Why are you, why, you know, I wrote a piece the other day, you know, where I, where I, I talked about how none of this is going to actually crush the armed resistance in Palestine. I got so many emails and co communications from people calling me an anti-Semite. Oh, you're pro Hamas. Why don't you have your cafe on? Nah, 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 nah. You know, grow up. You no, know, it, you, you, it, that's, that's you the know, point. Like, exactly. But there's a deliberate, there's a real reason for why uh, it, it's um, intellectual curiosity in this situation that is an absolute first step in objective journalism is a necessity and is oftentimes stopped at every step of the way. It's so that you can manufacture consent. If you listen to what the demands are, why? Bring, here, I'll give you an example of, of uh, Ansar Allah, right? The Houthis in Yemen. Since day one, since October 8th, October 9th, Ansar Allah has very openly stated what their goals are. That they're not simply just uh, operating on anti-Semitism or anger towards Jewish people or, or some, other, uh, some other process, even though you know, their, their logo does uh, have some anti-Semitic stuff in it. Regardless, they have said Israel's actions constitute ethnic cleansing. And Israel has to stop ethnically cleansing Palestinians in Gaza. They have to stop this siege immediately. If the siege doesn't stop, they are going to ensure that not a single ship passes through the Red Sea. And yet you never hear that perspective in mainstream media. The way that the, the, the actions of the Houthis are represented in Western media is as though they are mindless drones uh, attacking commerce, attacking, uh, uh, you know, Attacking ships for no reason. They're pirates that have no, no actual interest or actual reason for behaving in the way that they're behaving. And that they're uh, an Iranian proxy that's just mindless and attacking uh, all these ships because they hate uh, Jewish people. And beyond that, none of their actions have been harmful to like the actual person, like an actual human being so far, as far as like their takeovers of the ships and as far as very successfully uh, routing traffic away from the Red Sea, right? Uh, it's just simply a blockade. This is exactly how America would uh, implement a blockade if it needed to, even though I don't think people would probably go against America's uh, uh, demands and it would never even get to that point, but that's precisely how they would enforce a blockade. And, and for some reason, uh, America's actions against this halting of commerce, right, or at least like making it more costly to ship uh, the, on, on normal routes through the Red Sea is infinitely more violent and worse than anything Israel has done so far. And I sit here and I watch that and I lose my mind. Like America has killed more uh, people, like more uh, Yemeni people than they have uh, done anything towards Israel, than they've ever like even criticized Israel. They've killed, the CENTCOM I believe uh, uh, killed 10 uh, Houthis. Right. And now they're yeah. talking about possibly like blowing up Yemen again. And I mean, these guys have already survived. They withstood an American uh, backed uh, genocide already. So I, I, I think they they have uh, they have this perspective where they uh, look at it and they're like, you've done the worst to us. Uh, what more can you do? Right. And it is mind boggling to me that there is not better coverage on this issue, because God forbid, if you do actually treat uh, the Houthis as like rational actors, right? Uh, even if you don't agree with their uh, perspective or whatever, if you just treat them as like rational actors in the situation, God forbid, more people might say, well, I want to, you know, I want to do BDS. I, I want to boycott Israel until it stops. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Na Naomi, Naomi Klein wrote a good piece uh, in the Guardian this week about that. It was like the 15th anniversary of her writing ad advocating for BDS boycott, divest sanction. And she was just writing about what, you know, the, her, the basis of her piece in the Guardian was basically what, you know, what if the world had listened, you know, 15 years ago on this issue? Um, one thing I wanted to mention, though, in the context, I haven't seen anyone bring this up about the, the, the Houthi blockade. Do you remember back in 2010 when these peace activists organized a humanitarian flotilla uh, to try to break oh, the Mavi siege? Oh, Yeah. Yeah. 
So I think it's a really irrelevant. I think it's a very relevant point to raise in the context of this. Let's. How did Israel respond to a, you know an effort to affect uh, the the waters around Gaza when peace activists bringing in humanitarian supplies? Largely, it was a symbolic gesture to try to break the blockade of Gaza. The Israelis storm the ship and they end up killing nine people. The Israeli commandos go onto the ship and they end up killing. You know, nine people. They didn't find a single weapon on board. They didn't find a single piece of military yeah. anything. It was exactly what the activists had said. And you know who the person that then in the United States deploys to meet the press and other shows to defend Israel's killing of these activists? It was Joe Biden at the time who did that. And it's like, you know, the the what what the Yemenis are doing uh, with this blockade is an incredibly creative response for a largely powerless state. You know, Yemen doesn't have the capacity to fight Israel militarily. It doesn't, you know, it's, although yeah, Yemenis sent more people to fight the jihad in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union than any other country in the Arab world. I mean, Yemen is is off the charts, surreal country. It's one of the most amazing yeah. places I've ever been. I actually love Yemen. It's an incredible country. But what I'm saying is, in the context of all the Arab-Israeli wars, in the context of everything that's taken place since the 1948 Nakba and the, the beginning of all of this for the Palestinians, um, you've just had failure after failure after failure to defend the Palestinian people. Uh, and, and the solidarity has been utterly lacking, um, you know, particularly from Arab states. For Yemen, regardless of what anyone thinks of the Houthis, about you know, any of that, but for Yemen in particular, to have found some creative intervention to participate in this is an extraordinary piece of history that we're watching unfold. And the fact that that tiny nation has caused the Goliaths of the world to, to deploy to surround Yemen, it's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary thing that is, is happening. And the reaction of the United States and Britain and all of these other powerful nations, it's something to behold. You know, it actually shows a great fear on the part of the empire rather than, you know, anything it says about Yemen. It's it's really extraordinary thing that we're watching. Absolutely. Um, beyond that, speaking of Mavi Madmara. Are you and I gonna just have this like we're gonna do like a like three hour show together or something? We're gonna, no, like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go after this. Host here? No, no, I'm just <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I know this is we were supposed to have this for a, a, a one hour conversation, but you've been here for fifty uh, extra minutes since then, and I want to keep you. I'm sure you got a no, lot I'm of. Just, I'm, I'm just sure you got to, like the German police to evade for all of the anti semitism that you demonstrated. A, um, I'm hoping that they're not watching uh, Twitch here. Yeah, um, you know, I, put, I, think, I, put, I said that my parents were big fans of your show, and I put that on Twitter. And you, do you know how many people are like accusing me of lying? And uh, you know, like as though I would lie about my parents watching Hassan okay. the Hun, Hassanabi Twitch. Okay, TV. I, I'm gonna be honest. I I also thought you were joking when you said that. I mean, maybe they're I watching was, now. I was joking, but, it, but my mom, it, my mom is watching. Of course, oh, yeah. my parents don't watch. But I had yeah. to explain to my mom what yeah. it was. But the point, no, but the point I'm making is just so something about social media that. People actually took it seriously. Like, it was a joke. My haters are insane, though. Um, the thing I was going to say about Mavi Marmara, here's an interesting thing. I'm Turkish. Um, I don't know if you knew that or not, but I grew up in Turkey. Uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan very famously was super critical of Israel after that, but it's all theatrics. We just talked about how much uh, of return on investment that that the the Houthis got, the Ansar Allah got, from uh, implementing a blockade. You know which country has so much power to genuinely economically cripple the state of Israel? Turkey, as a matter of fact. Because uh, I believe uh, approximately 40% of all energy that goes into Israel passes through Turkey, from Azerbaijan to Turkey, through Turkish pipes, directly into right. Israel. They, they, uh, something along the lines of like... Uh, Something along the lines of like 40 to 50, maybe 60% of the steel that Israel Israel uses comes directly from Turkey as well. Recep Tayyip Erdogan's own son was uh, still, while Recep Tayyip Erdogan is engaging in all this political theater, talking about, you know, Israel, your time is over, uh, yeah, Nathan... Yeah. Uh, Netanyahu, more like Satan Yahoo, whatever, you know, yeah. whatever he's doing every day, he is uh, simultaneously has his son actually engaging in commerce in Israel with his own ships. Uh, and mm. and uh, this is a fact that he has tried to... But is this uh, ongoing now? 
Yeah. Is this ongoing since, since the Gaza siege yes. began? Yes, 100,000%. Absolutely. So much so that he tried to forcibly suppress a news story that covered his son's dealings with Israel and the and the shipping uh, deal that his son has with Israel in Turkey like last a uh, couple weeks ago. Okay? So uh, anything that... Anything that Recep Tayyip Erdogan says, for example, uh, about Israel, sure, optically speaking, it's important for a regional leader to go out and, like, you know, criticize uh, Israel's actions, certainly. But the idea that, like, real politics is happening of that sort, where, like, Erdogan is simply powerless and the only thing he could do is uh, criticize so, Israel let me with ask spoken you, word is, is bullshit. So is, is your sense, uh, not to turn this into my show where I interview you, but um, is it your sense that if... If Turkey and Erdogan wanted to actually take a, um, a a concrete, meaningful step toward opposing this, your 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 argument is that they, if they joined in the blockade or they also implemented similar measures, that it would uh, have a, have an immediate and direct impact on Israel. One million percent, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Has has yeah. Erdogan been asked about this at all in public? Uh, no. Why he doesn't do it? Of course not. Uh, there well, is, I know uh, he wouldn't be asked that in Turkey, but if he was at an international uh, conference, it would be an I interesting believe, question for a journalist to I, ask. I, I don't believe he has. I, I don't believe he's ever been asked that at all, including his his son's own personal dealings with Israel. Here, I'll pull the I'll pull the information up about the the shipping. Yeah, I mean, you can shoot it to me later. I'm, I'm actually I'm journalistically I'm interested in this because it's a it's an interesting story. Yeah, this was. Um, this was one of the things that I thought was very interesting that like uh, Turkey has, uh, you know, what uh, the, the Turkish statements originally, as a matter of fact, there's another, there's another, another interesting, um, there's another interesting political thing here in Turkey that like, uh, there's a lot of anti-Arab sentiment in Turkey. Um, yeah. Because from even like liberal now uh, newly formed ultra nationalist coalitions and um, originally like even Erdogan's statements were like kind of wishy-washy on on uh, Palestine, on Gaza in the immediate mm -hmm. aftermath of October seven, and then there was a course correction done in Turkey because of the overwhelming popular support from the population, both ironically from the more uh, Islamist side of the Turkish population, and also even like actual uh leftists like communists and whatnot that were uh you you saw flags of the pflp and dflp in turkey alongside the flags of like islamic jihad uh being waved mm -hmm. at the same time it was like a very weird situation but um uh, ultimately yeah he uh, erdogan retriangulated his message because he is a uh, populist uh, quite similar to uh donald trump in many ways and and has yeah, been super critical of israel it's really, um, I mean, it's really interesting because I, I have a kind of sub interest in sort of monitoring how various Arab states are approaching this. I thought it was interesting that Saudi Arabia um, signed on to South Africa's uh, genocide suit um, yeah. at the ICJ. Um, you know, when they're not butchering, you know, journalists in their consulate, they're, uh, you know, uh, they're doing the right thing, it appears. But um uh, I, I I think it's very it's it's interesting what's happening in Jordan, what's happening in Lebanon, um, Egypt. But you know Turkey, as as you're certainly more familiar with than I am. I mean, under Erdogan, there's been a very interesting shift in how Turkey has engaged in East Africa, um, in Somalia, and elsewhere. Oh, in Somalia, yeah. Um, but but also the the sort of you know he fancies himself this sort of bridge between Europe and the Middle East and. Um, and I, I, I think it's really it's it's what you're saying is really interesting because that form of hypocrisy is particularly noteworthy uh, when you're go, when you're going so far um, in rhetoric as Erdogan has on Netanyahu and his conduct to the point where some German politicians are suggesting <laughs> that Erdogan shouldn't even be allowed into Germany anymore because he violated their laws on anti-Semitic speech. That's that's actually been raised. It's quite interesting to note that he could take what is effectively a non-military uh, response to this that is more akin to sanctions and is refusing to do so and that his uh, son is benefiting off of the continuation of 
uh, of these yeah. routes. It's uh, it's uh, I definitely want to look into it. It's a very interesting well, story. Yeah, I mean, but that's just that's just how Turkey operates. Only NATO yeah, nations that attack true. other NATO nations. True, it, yes, that may be yeah. true, but. Uh, you know, what's old is new when situations like this uh, yeah. unfold. I mean, it becomes, same. you know, history becomes very relevant in moments like this. Yeah. Same with same with like uh, being the primary uh, uh, creator of the Bayraktars, right? The, the UAV drones that were shipped to Ukraine while simultaneously cutting energy deals with Russia on the I mean, if Israel itself has done this with uh, with uh, respect to Ukraine and and, and Russia uh, as well. Uh, because of their own uh, relationship with both of those countries. Um, but uh, yeah, no, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is very famous for being like super aggro when it comes to political theater while simultaneously conducting his affairs behind closed doors in the same ways that when push comes to shove, when it's material interest, Erdogan is always going to be a loyal servant to Western interests. And that has been proven time and time again. And that's precisely, that is precisely why he is allowed to operate in the way that he wants to in the northern Syrian corridor as a NATO power because America gives Erdogan the permission to do whatever he, uh, he wants in, in the northern Syrian corridor because I think America ultimately understands that no matter what Erdogan says in public, what he is going to do is still do the bidding of the Western world in many respects. Interesting, man. I have to I have to hit you up about some more of that and get details on it. It's very, very yeah. I cool. sent you it's a couple articles on man. Azerbaijan, yeah. which, by the way, of course, Israel gave weapons to when it was uh, operating in yep. in uh, um, Karabakh. Nagorno Karabakh. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Right. Well, that that does it for two hours. Wait, you can know, you so. can you can you explain to me just a couple of very quick things about the lingo of your uh, of your crowd there? What's this Kaya Kaya uh, thing? Can you tell me some of this stuff? Okay, so Kaya is my dog. She's sleeping right now. I want to wake her up. People told me not to look at are... your chat, but I peeked at it a little bit. And can you just well, can you just give me like a couple highlights of what goes on? Because mostly I've just been looking at you. So so here's here's how this works. Uh, right next to me, if you go on the stream, if you watch the stream and see the chat, you'll you'll see that there's like emotes, but you don't have the the proper programs, like the proper apps, like BTTV and FFZ and stuff to see those yeah. emotes so you just see the code basically so you, when you look at it you probably okay. see kaya pls right that's actually a dancing puppy animated dancing puppy so there's it's like hieroglyphs uh, twitch culture is very interesting we use a lot of uh we use a lot of emotes okay basically. i got it i'm looking um so yeah what you see is probably just the word uh what you see probably is just the word kaya pls but on my screen and on everybody else's screen they actually see uh, a dancing Holy puppy. Moses. Look at these people. Like I'm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there's some things I wish I didn't see, but um, wow. I'm just looking through your chat here. This is who are. Yeah, who like are people, all these people, people. Like, like normies. Normies think like, uh, for example, like Pepe the Frog is like an alt right symbol, but like, um, it has been used in it, it, on this side of the internet uh, in a completely apolitical way in perpetuity since the beginning. Wow. No, I'm just now I'm reading some of the. Uh, uh, I'm reading some of the comments here, even though I was told not to. And um, wow, what a hodgepodge of things! Like, interesting yeah. crowd of people you have. Yeah, I don't mean to do a, a crash course on this. I'm just I've never been on something like this before. Yeah, there's uh, Very, currently really twenty three thousand people this entire time that's been listening to us talk. Uh, wow, thank you everyone for stadium spending this time. I mean, I really for a while just thought it was you and I shooting the shit, but um, it's. Uh, Wow, it's really it's it's really interesting. I appreciate the opportunity also to probably talk to a lot of people who never have heard of my work or anything like that. Um, yeah, these guys might be yeah. a little young to to know of uh, you know some of the no, things no, I mean, cool. that you brought up. Yeah, yeah, but but I, it's all good. I mean, I actually um, you know I talk a lot at uh, at universities, and I you know I really um, I, I have a lot of respect for uh, for the younger generation. I mean, it's. It's strange when you realize that's not you anymore. Uh, you know, when your hair starts to get gray and stuff like that. But I actually, I'm, I'm coming um, up on that. I'm 32, so I'm, I'm uh, starting you, to notice you, that as you, well. You, I mean, I'm, my my beard is starting to gray. All right. Well, you're you know you you still got some good years in you. But um, <laughs> but no. But thanks thanks a lot for having me on, and um, also for all those people for hanging out and um, yeah, and listening. Okay. Before you leave, I want to show you one yeah. last thing. Okay. I'm going to share okay. my screen with you. For this, this uh -oh. is a really funny thing that I love. Uh, I love. Is this gonna uh, like infect my computer with something? No, 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 no. Uh, hold on one second. 
Uh, remember how you talked about, uh, remember how you talked about like the Israeli government, the IDF, like faking stuff. Yeah. yeah, Um, you brought up Mavi Marmara and I didn't know about Mm -hmm. this until recently, but, uh, Israel did a classic, like, uh, Oh, uh, Mavi Marmara are actually, uh, they had a, a bunch of, uh, terrorists in the, in the Gazi flotilla. Why do we know that? Because we intercepted their phone conversations thing back then as well. Um, and this is what the phone conversation that they supposedly intercepted. This is what it sounded like. Let me see if I can find it. Does chat chat? Do you guys have it? Um, if you can find it real quickly, I I, I want to show Are you. you this. Talking this is really some funny. AI thing. It's not an AI thing. No, this is like I mean, well, this is you know before the time of AI, but it is pretty funny because um, oh here it is, here it is, here is, it. here it is. Okay, hold on. And I'm going to share this screen real quick so you can see it. One second. Okay, here it is. You'll be able to you'll be able to hear it as well. Okay. Okay. So, this is from 13 years ago, June 4th, 2010. Uh the title is Flotilla ship to Israeli Navy. We're helping we're helping Arabs again uh, go against the US, okay? This is what they claimed they recovered from the Mavi Marmara ship. Deputy one. You are approaching an area which is under a naval blockade. Shut up. Go back to Auschwitz. We have permission from the Gaza port authorities to enter. Who's helping Arabs going against the U.S.? Don't forget 9-11, guys. So they claim that on the ship, uh, they this is what they said to the Israeli Navy. We're helping Arabs go against the U.S. Don't forget 9-11, guys. Or, and also, don't forget Auschwitz. That was their that was their claim back then. So they've been at this like whole um, claiming that whoever they end up uh, killing or attacking has been, uh, you know, Nazis for some time now. Old school. Don't know what those accents are. As a Turkish man, I've never heard that kind of accent from a Turkish person before. But that's what they claimed was like good reason as to why they attacked the ship that uh, broke through the the blockade. Well, at least they have Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know. This, it's they have, they really... have Jerry Seinfeld and Michael Rappaport. Those are the, that's what they've got. Those are the, those are the goats. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, Jeremy. This was a phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity. Um, and I look forward to having you on in the future, hopefully under better circumstances. Yeah, anytime. And thanks again to you and to your whole crew. It sounds like just from reading the comments, it sounds like uh, you often do a lot of interacting with uh, with your uh, with your community there, which is a cool thing. And, oh, yeah. Um, well, my apologies for sucking up all the time. I'm sure there were a lot of people. No, no, to, no, not at all. This was really, really good. All yeah. right, cool. Anytime, man. Happy all to right. come back. All right, bye. All right, take care. How do I disconnect? I got it. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> All right, that was Jeremy Scale of The Intercept. Ladies and gentlemen, the GOAT, uh, legendary reporter, phenomenal guest. I feel like you guys really, uh, really enjoyed that. If you can't get enough of uh, uh, Jeremy talking for two hours in a row, I highly suggest his podcast as well. Um, I believe it was uh, Intercepted, right? Not Deconstructed. Deconstructed is with Ryan. Uh, intercepted. Uh, is the is the podcast that he does great podcast uh, oftentimes alongside uh, Murtaza Hussein and um, yeah this is a this is a real journalist for those of you who don't know um, like a, a very real journalist <laughs> one of the one of the few remaining as a matter of fact so we are uh, very fortunate to be able to have him on for two hours at a time I mean it's crazy you know he was asking about when you refer to chat to find a clip if it's AI if that is AI oh 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 Maybe. Yeah. Now get Cy Hirsch on the show. Could do that. Could do that as well. What is this? Robert Kraft unveiled a $25 million campaign to stop anti-Semitism. That's crazy. How about a $25 million campaign to stop the top of the hour ad break, which comes at the top of every hour. By the way, if you no longer want to see those ads as we continue on to other stuff, South Africa, like the, um, <clears throat> the case that uh, BBC Africa reported on, uh, and, and many more. All you need to do is subscribe for $5 or free with the Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account where you get one free Prime subscription a month. You can also get you can also get gifted a sub if you're lucky. Intercept reporting is literally at linchpin of Pakistani politics right now. Oh, absolutely. They've done a phenomenal job. Uh, Ryan, Jeremy, 
Uh, Murtaza uh, has done a phenomenal job at uh, on their coverage of Imran Khan and and Pakistani politics in general and America's interference in Pakistan for things that are overall very, I mean, very stupid, like very stupid reasons as to why America's interfering in Pakistani politics uh, beyond like what they normally do. Here's the three minute break now, by the way. Okay, kilometers 040, thank you for the five gifted subs. For three months, the world has looked on in horror at the scenes from Gaza. The huge numbers of Palestinian civilians killed or forced to move, the sheer level of destruction. South Africa says this is evidence of genocide. Israel says that's an outrageous accusation. According to a 1948 convention, genocide is a crime committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial or religious group in whole or in part. That, South Africa says, is what Israel is doing in Gaza. Just look at the statistics. Israel has killed more than 23,000 Palestinians. More than 300,000 housing units have been damaged or destroyed. And around 85% of the population has been displaced. There's no place in Gaza that is safe. We've seen the number of people that Israel has killed, but not just killed and wounded, but they've destroyed the infrastructure and made it so that life in Gaza is no longer possible. Then there's the question of Israel's intent. Look at what Israeli politicians have been saying since October the 7th. Israel's president. It's an entire nation out there that's responsible. It's hardline minister for national security. They're all terrorists and they should also be destroyed. And the deputy speaker of parliament. We all have one common goal. Now, you might be wondering why this is not BBC World or regular old BBC, okay? Why is it none of those channels that reported on this? And it's simply BBC News Africa. Well, that's because those other BBC outlets are doing a really piss-poor job of talking about this, I would say, important historic moment. I don't know what's going on with that. I find it very strange. I find it odd, really, but... uh, Yeah, at least one of the outlets on BBC is covering it, though. Erasing the Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. But can any of this be said to be proof of genocide? Remember, this is not just about war crimes. Genocide is notoriously difficult to prove. You have to have evidence. Unless you're Israel. In which case, unless you're Israel. In which case, it literally is not uh, not that difficult to prove because for some weird reason... Um, every Israeli official thinks that like nobody has the translate tweet option. Okay. Or that no one in America is going to translate what they are saying in Hebrew, sometimes in English too, but specifically in Hebrew to the Israeli population. So, or, or even no one in America has access to TikTok where they can see literal on the ground IDF soldiers celebrating the atrocities and doing weird TikTok dances as they blow up a fucking kindergarten. It's weird. I don't know why they think that, like, we can't see the stuff that's going on. But, yeah, it's it's very odd. It's very odd to think that. But, you know, IDF could simply go offline. Exactly. Exactly. This is something I say all the time, okay? It's so strange. One of the greatest examples, I, oh, the, okay, here. I know there are, uh, there are Dynacolas monkeys and all types of racial slurs over there on Israeli Twitter. Like clockwork, when I worked at L, the teams arriving in South Africa had to be escorted, armed by the security personnel of the Shimbet. It is the only country in the world where this was the custom, perhaps even today. Just shows how a country that used to be a paradise turned into a hell with the transition of a regime of monkeys that came down from the tree. I am waiting. I am waiting with bated breath on the Israeli counter-argument somehow featuring the white genocide that South Africans are experiencing. It is going to happen, okay? It is going to happen. I'm just waiting for when, okay? It's going to be funny. It's going to happen, okay? I'm talking like an official arm of the Israeli government is literally going to say, that the real genocide South Africa is conducting is actually the white genocide, okay? And I'm very excited for it. I hope they do it in court. That would be really funny, okay? 
Yeah, translating Hebrew tweets this week has been wild. It's since October 7th, translating Hebrew tweets has been phenomenal. Very interesting. Um, anyway, yeah, this guy's a Kahanist, by the way, I think. This is a Kahanist uh, symbol, right? Isn't it? Or is it uh, Jewish power? I think that's what it is. No, it's a, they, they, they're terrorists. <laughs> like, uh, uh, Jewish supremacist extremists. Such a weird thing to, to explain. Um, so, yeah. Um, do, 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 do. I wouldn't call this historic, to be honest. There are going to be no major ramifications out of the ICJ case. Few may have their minds changed, but Zionists would just say the ICJ is anti-Semitic and that there's no real genocide. America is still the hegemonic force in the region and the world, even though our influence is waning globally. Genocide or not, Palestinians are still fucked. No, I... Here's what I... I mean, I agree with you, and I also disagree with you. Uh, I tried to... I tried to stress that in the conversation that we were having about the marginal improvements, okay? The marginal improvements that it has, right? In, in the, it, like the pressure points that you open up in this situation. Just like with Amnesty International openly stating, and Human Rights Watch openly stating that Israel is an apartheid state, it gives the real permission for many people to conduct themselves in a way that is more critical of Israel without uh, getting an endless sequence of attacks. Because, look, I've been in this for a very long time. I've talked about Israel for the past 10 years, right? And oftentimes people would, you know, say the same shit, that, like, I was anti-Semitic. I'm being anti-Semitic. I'm being anti-Semitic for saying Israel's an apartheid state. Um, and And at least after 2021, I could directly point to an institution that liberals do care about beyond the facts, because unfortunately they do care about that sort of thing, to make a better argument, to go, no, you don't understand. It's not just me saying it. Here is Betselem saying it. Um, optics do, in this situation, kind of matter, and I don't think people uh, uh, think about that, uh, especially for like what the Palestinians need, right? What the Palestinians need is... What the Palestinians need is awareness to their conditions, to the atrocities, first and foremost, because that's the stage they're at right now. They need that more than material support, and they are the first to tell you, like those living in Gaza are the first to tell you, just don't stop talking about uh, Palestine. Don't stop talking about Gaza. Don't stop talking about the occupation, but more importantly than even the occupation, the push for a ceasefire, right? So... Anyway, just something to consider. And I think that the ICJ's decision will work in a similar way. Okay. I think I might get banned if I repeat here in English what this Israeli screenwriter, Mini Asiag, says here about South Africa and its relation to the ICJ case against Israel. So I will leave you all to just the press the translate tweet button. When does Israel declare war on South Africa? As if any backward and backward third world country with one of the highest crime and murder rates in the world, which has nothing to do with the region, can file a complaint in The Hague alleging genocide against a democratic and progressive country, and then everyone stands up and turns it into an international event. Stupid and anti-Semitic world. Bro, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay? I love that. I love that, like, a lot of uh, ultra uh, Zionist, ultra nationalist people have only one speed. Okay? And that is just blow them up. What, what do you mean? I don't understand. Are you criticizing me? Well, you must be Hamas, and therefore, uh, get ready for the bombs. At a certain point, you're going to run out of fucking bombs, dog. This is what I'm trying to explain to people. Like, oh, let's open up another front in Lebanon, right? Oh, let's open up maybe even another front, and another front, and another front. It's like even America doesn't have the, the leeway here. Liberal and neoliberals keep using that word progressive, but I don't think they know what that means. Yes, no, they they care about it specifically as it, uh, it pertains to just like social justice from a very Western lens, okay? Ofer Kasif stands with South Africa in this ICJ? Of course, he does. What is this one? At first I thought, well, we'll bomb South Africa. Then I did some thinking and realized that any other country could also take us to The Hague. So I realized there was no choice but to bomb The Hague itself. Even if we, the abducted Ahoram Barak was there, there was no choice. I mean, some of these are f ridiculous, right? Like, who cares? It's like one-offs. But it's, it's pretty funny uh, to see where we're at here, you know? That has to be satire. Israelis in October. Look at this African soldier. Hamas fears this diversity. We love our black Israelis. Israelis in January. <laughs> yeah. They need to get better material. Um, they can't keep uh, stealing from America. Yeah. 
One of our faves wrote an article. Here's the first line. Oh, I saw this. This is also Eve, Eve Fartlow is back, everybody. Uh, she wrote an incredible uh, she wrote an incredible article, A Plague in the Hague. I'm not a lawyer, but I am an expert in anti-Semitism. That's right. The free parking, the Jews are tired. Tweet creator E. Fartlow herself. Awesome. So, um, yeah, that's where we're at in the situation and this predicament on uh, this reception. You have to do a Scottish accent? I refuse. I refuse to associate Scotland with Eve Fartlow. Um, what is American news doing while uh, in the eve of this ICJ court case? Well, Let's continue. Or a pattern of behavior. Let's finish this and I'll show you what American media is doing. Way. Israel will argue that it was acting in self-defense following the dreadful Hamas attacks of October the 7th, that it had no choice but to act. It was still motivated, Israel would argue, presumably on the basis of its military campaign. So even if they have gone beyond what the law permits them to do in a military campaign, it is still driven by the logic of the military campaign and not by uh, a genocidal logic. It'll take the court years to reach a final verdict. But if it thinks the South African case has some merit, the... it could issue a temporary remedy known as a provisional measure designed to curb Israel's military campaign. Do you guys get it? Like the provisional measure would be a, 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 an immediate implementation of ceasefire, right? Like a, a demand from the United Nations to, uh, to, to push for a ceasefire. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. No, 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 no. That's huge. That's huge. Because that basically is a recognition that it is real, okay? That the, the ethnic cleansing intent is there. The genocidal intent is there enough for there to... to, to be a United Nations push for a ceasefire. Now, who enforces that ceasefire is a good question. America obviously is not going to be on board with it. But the point is this, just like what I talked about the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, it does not matter. What matters is the, the, the pressure. You're opening up a different valve of pressure. It's like saying, well, the Houthis are simply just blocking trade on the Red Sea. How important is that? These things actually chip away. OK, you don't make a war costly just by having your troops outmaneuver the other side's troops and then kill more of the other side's uh, troops than your troops die. That's not how this works. That's not how modern combat works. That's not how counterinsurgency and settler colonialism works. OK, optics do matter in this circumstance, which is why even a genuine acknowledgement from the uh, from the ICJ is damaging. And Israel knows that it's damaging, which is why it's started trying to do counter propaganda against it. Okay. Um, you know who actually perfectly uh, explained this position? Jezza himself. Um, that's right. Let me see. Uh, there was a, there was a uh, Jeremy Corbyn interview that I saw where he talked about like how this is a good first step. Well, not a good first step, but like it's just in the mark here. Here it is. Jeremy Corbyn speaking to uh, Al Jazeera. This is what he had to say about the ICJ's decision, potentially, right? Do you think anything is going to change if there is a decision in favor of the South African application? Everything is incremental. Every time you step out on the street and wave a Palestinian flag and say, stop the killing of Palestinian people, every time somebody, me or anyone else, speaks up in a parliament, that's an incremental difference. And the arguments about the arms trade, the supply of weapons to Israel, and the fact that President Biden sought to bypass Congress because he was afraid of the reaction there in order to send more weapons to Israel indicates a weakness in his position. And so this weekend, we've got demonstrations all over the world. There's a voice of ordinary people who are just appalled what's going on. And also, I want to say thank you to those people in Israel that signed in support of the South African application to the International Court of Justice and those in Israel that have been demonstrating against the occupation of the West Bank and, and of Gaza because they want also to be able to live in peace. It's not going to happen tomorrow, that I know. But if we just walk by on the other side and ignore what's happening to the Palestinian people, then we become complicit. Do you think... What a wonderful man. What a wonderful man. Yeah, here he is in 1984 protesting the South African apartheid, defend the right to demonstrate against apartheid, join this picket, being arrested for it. And here he is alongside, I believe, the South African uh, liaison uh, or the South African uh, coalition that brought the case, 
post-apartheid, obviously, against the ongoing uh, apartheid regime and, and genocide of Palestinians in Gaza. Do you think after all this, all this ends, people in the UK will forget that all that Corbyn is anti-Semite stuff? My friend, I do not spend a lot of time thinking about British people. I would like to keep it that way, with exceptions, obviously, with notable exceptions. If I were to concern myself with the opinions of British people, oh my Lord, I already got my own hogs and hogalinas to worry about here in America. Before I start thinking about uh, British hogs, the gammons, the Tories, the pedophiles, the turfs at Turf Island, okay? Reports of American aircrafts in Yemen space. That's right. They are, um, I, I suspect that uh, America tonight, as we were talking, as uh, Scahill and I were conversing, this broke uh, from Stephen Swin, Swinford. Joe Biden, the U.S. president, is expected to make a statement tonight in the wake of the military strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. Um, the strikes are expected shortly with a series of carefully choreographed statements of the U.S., U.K., and other international allies to follow. That came right after Britain is expected to join in the U.S. in carrying airstrikes on Houthi military positions in Yemen tonight. So uh, America and, and Western forces are taking uh, stronger action, once again, against the trade routes that uh, the, the uh, Houthi military has been able to stop um, instead of, of course, uh, doing anything about the ongoing atrocities, crimes against humanity in Gaza, because that's their ally. That's how it works. That's how it works. I want you all to understand, if you're looking for honesty, if you're looking for integrity, if you're looking for moral clarity in the situation, you will not find it, Okay. America operates on the boundaries of self-interest. That's it. It's that simple. Do not ever allow any of these liberal losers to come in here and try to muddy the waters and to talk about how progressive America is, okay? If you have a situation where, on the one hand, you have genocide, on the other hand, you have those who want to stop the genocide and are implementing a blockade at the behest of stopping that genocide, America is attacking the side that's trying to stop the genocide. It's done. It's very obvious to me what is going on here. Okay. What is this? Red Sea blockade operation prosperity. Go oh, yeah. They, are, they already call it cleverly prosperity guardian. Operation prosperity guardian. You know, they are defending prosperity done through commerce. Israel's brutal war on Gaza, followed by tension in the region, particularly in the Red Sea, has created a security dilemma for the U.S. On one hand, U.S. wants to avoid the expansion of the conflict into a regional war. On the other hand, Houthis, Ansar Allah, attacks on Israeli-linked ships pose a threat to a greater threat to the U.S.'s role as a global and regional maritime security guarantor. U.S. initially announced the expansion of CTF-152-153, uh, but when the Pentagon announced Operation Prosperity Guardian, it only had 10 members, missing the most critical and relevant, including KSA, Egypt, Oman, and UAE. Later, reports citing Pentagon officials came up that 20 countries have signed up for the OPG, but they don't want their names to be published. This was a self-destructive exercise even before the operationalization of the force. My food is here. OPG aimed to send a strong message showcasing U.S. dominance and leadership as a maritime security guarantor, but failed at the very step when it signaled a lack of confidence in U.S.-led venture by regional players. This hasty announcement by U.S. officials shows their lack of coordination with its allies, but also a lack of of a comprehensive strategy about what exactly the U.S. wants to achieve with this operation. I like that they were like, step aside, Saudi Arabia. We got this. We'll, we'll pick up where you left off, okay? Sick. To the Houthis, a similar, uh, a, a similar goal and a similar attitude remains. These guys, these guys have nothing. They just came out of a, 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 a blockade and a genocide, right? And now... They've sidestepped, now they have sidestepped Saudi Arabia, America's guys, and are directly fighting with America itself. Of course, um, BNO News says the USA and the UK have started carrying out airstrikes against Houthi targets in Yemen, according to Voice of America. <sighs> Event sources, heavy aircraft, overflights in airspace in the city of Hodeida. Yeah, in the wake of all of this, let it be known that America cares more about commerce st being stopped, okay, than actual human lives being ended by Israel. That's it. And the rest of the world sees it. They see it. 
They see it. Let's check in with mainstream news. I want to see if uh, CNN is covering it. Let's take a look. Acceptable. Well, of course that's right. And of course, I'm the one that had very little of it. I am not going to be a dictator. I'm going to manage like we did. I'm not going to have time for retribution. We're going to make this country so successful again. I'm not going to have time for retribution. Nice. All right, so what did, what did you make of that strategy? Well, they, put, they, they put out a fundraiser that said that he's your retribution. Look, I think somebody got in his ear and said, you know, this might not play well. And so maybe you ought yeah, to this walk is from these Voa. things back a bit. Which is directly from, directly from uh, the American State Department, Voice of America. Uh, breaking, two U.S. officials tell me U.S. U.K. now striking Iran-backed Houthis targets inside of Yemen in response to their attacks on ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. More than a dozen targets ranging from training facilities to drone storage facilities. Yeah, they couldn't do it. Israel doesn't have the bandwidth to go all the way out there um, and, and do this. So now they got, uh, you know, America to come in. And to every single person that says, like, fuck around and find out, by the way, you're gross, 100%. Like, you're awful. If you have a genuine opinion on, on what's going on in Israel, okay, if you legitimately think that Israel's actions are, are unacceptable, if you claim that you think that, uh, you know, boycott, div boycott divestments and sanctions on the state of Israel is morally just and righteous, then you can't be criticizing the one group of dudes who, at least with the limited resource they have, tried to implement it, okay? In the absence of any strategy and comprehensive plan, it is a recipe for disaster and rattle ambition to provide a security umbrella to commercial routes. Ansar Allah is not like Hezbollah. It is a different ideological fabric. They don't look up to the Ayatollah for the theological and political guidelines. Same is the case for Hamas. When it comes to the operations of Ansar Allah, they are pursuing their interests despite a possible coordination with the strategic level with Iran. The ceasefire and high-level engagement of other parties and regional powers with Ansar Allah with respect to Yemen is viewed by Ansar Allah as the de facto recognition of their role as permanent players in Yemen. Post ceasefire, Houthis are seeking a recognition at a much bigger level by linking the siege in the Red Sea for Israel linked vessels with the siege on Gaza by Israel. Ansar Allah have provided it a political, political cove. This is one of the reasons why regional countries, especially the Muslim majority countries, are reluctant to be a part of any such operation, which in any ways is connected with Israel. This U.S. led coalition is dominated by extra regional players because the Saudis, the UAE, like all of the other regional actors that are a part of the pro Israel pro-America, anti-Gaza uh, coalition know how popular these actions are in the region. This is something that I've stressed quite a bit. This is why I said, like, Iran doesn't need any extra permission to be able to, like, directly wage war with Israel at this point. That's important to understand because getting regional, getting uh, so much popular support from the actual populations of the region spell trouble domestically for all of these individual countries, right? Weird takes from an American. I'm sorry, what's the weird? Awful takes as usual, uh, brainwashed. Got it. Uh, I will give you uh, 30 seconds to describe what your position is on the matter. Go ahead. You have the floor. America bad. Leave Houthis alone. They're a good organization. This is going to be an epic episode of America bad. I'm pumped. World War Three comments cringe. Allah shall rain fire upon them. America bad. Okay, dude. Okay, the clock is ticking. Why does the U.S. go so far for Israel? They're a huge liability at this point because it's our it's our military base. What do you mean? Yeah. I love looking at a situation like this and being like, you know what this spells to me? America's definitely not bad. <laughs> America's good, actually. You know what I mean? It's like, how? If it wasn't America doing all this, if it was Russia, for example, or a foreign adversary, China, you would be losing your mind. You'd be like, we have to nuke Beijing right now. Okay? That is what you would be saying. But when America's doing it, it's like, no, nah, actually, you don't get it, dog. This is, you know, I'm doing profound foreign policy analysis here, okay? Let me tell you. And uh, I somehow always magically come, uh, you know, uh, I somehow always magically find the, the exact triangulated position that uh, America is good, actually. They're trying their best. You see, two of some of the worst genocidal superpowers historically come together and, like, uh, uh, <laughs> start bombing Yemen, a country that they were, uh, 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 you know, dishing out their regional actors to do a genocide in. Shortly after that genocide is, is uh, ended, that blockade is ended. And you're like, I think the guys that were doing the genocide are the, the good guys here, I think. Yeah. New foreign policy article, that is great. The U.S. Middle East policy has failed. The region is on fire and Washington is to blame. 
the libertarian roots. You know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah, what happened to that chatter? He was like, you have bad takes. Everyone always says, like, everyone always just, like, kind of throws this out there where they're like, nah, dog, you're brainwashed. All you say is America bad. And then they never make an argument as to why America good. You know what I mean? He went to Google for the good takes. Yeah, he's going to pull a Houthini on me real quick. He's going to, like, he's he's desperately trying to find a Wikipedia summary that he can just, like, you know, um, that he can copy-paste in here in shorter increments. Genuine question, why does everyone complain about the supposed America is bad takes you have? Isn't there enough proof to show that they are bad? Yes, because they, you know what they are? You know what the reason why people get very mad at that? Because liberals fancy themselves to be, like, intellectually superior to the dumb hogs that they want to desperately not identify with. But when it comes to foreign policy, if you are pro-American global dominance, you are identical to a hog. That's it. The difference between a hog and a liberal is that on its foundations, they still come from the same place, American exceptionalism, right? And America has to be the world police. Just the hog says more slurs while conducting itself and making an argument. The liberal, on the other hand, that is not a hog, a Democratic Party voter, still has the same interests, still wants the same things to happen, right? But they don't say as many slurs. They think it's, like, kind of mean and and rude to, to you know, uh, champion genocide while simultaneously also uh, saying that you're championing genocide. It's a, it's a kinder, gayer imperialism. That's it. Yeah, the difference between a liberal and a hog is that the liberal is wearing a suit and a tie. The hog is wearing camo. Exposure is being reported by locals across Yemen, including the capital, Sana'a. Violent raids on Sana'a, Taiz, Al-Haban, al Hudaya or al Hudaida are subjected to the strongest bombardment now. More than, a ten, more than 10 violent raids, says Rashid Maruf. <coughs> yeah, here's Barak Ravid, deputy head of the Houthi spokesperson, says bombings have begun on the city of Hodeida. That's it. <laughs> Imqueerialism? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, a real slay queen situation here. Anyway, um, oh, uh, I was going to say, what is happening while all of this is going on in the world? The ICJ and, 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 and the bombing campaigns that are occurring? That's right. Time is once again demonstrating that American legacy publishers are, of course, of course, just morally bankrupt okay the envoy secretary of state anthony blinken in the test of american leadership they literally posted this today dude think about how awful of a timing this is of course it's not awful it's deliberate they are very openly trying to massage the narrative the idea for the liberals is that no these guys are actually trying their very best to do like a little bit of genocide not that much okay Expectations of that Britain is about to launch military action against Iranian backed rebels in Hold Yemen on, I'm grab my food. after the Prime Minister chaired a meeting with his cabinet. Any such move against Houthi targets would be alongside the United States and other allies. The likelihood of strikes rose after British and US forces shot down a barrage of drones and missiles in the Red Sea on Tuesday night, fired by the Houthis despite a clear warning not to. They launched another ballistic missile today, this time against international shipping in the Gulf of Aden. No one was hurt. Ratcheting up tensions further, Iran yeah. then seized this tank the irony... off the coast of Oman. The irony, of course, is that in this in this entire process, uh, the Houthis have killed zero people. Americans so far have killed 10 and probably many more now in their bombing campaigns in Yemen. Wonderful stuff. But we are the good guys, boys. Don't say America bad, okay? No matter what. Don't say America bad, okay? Please. Man, the Greek-flagged St. Nicholas vessel was boarded by armed men and steered towards Iran, along with a crew of 18 Filipinos and one Greek. We condemn this apparent seizure. The Iranian government should immediately release the ship and its crew. These provocative and unacceptable actions need to stop. We'll continue to work with our uh, allies and partners to deter and confront the full range of Iran's concerning and destabilizing behavior in close coordination, of course, uh, with the international community. Um, yeah, right. Experts saw the seizure as part of a bigger power play. It may cause them to split their resources, um, use their carrier aircraft in another area, for example. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely 
an intention behind the Iranians um, with regards to this boarding today of that tanker to switch attention away from the Red Sea and towards the Persian Gulf. It's the first time Iran has targeted a ship in the Gulf of Oman since Israel declared war on Iranian-backed Hamas militants in Gaza on the 7th of October. That crisis had already triggered a threat to ships transiting the Red Sea after the Houthis started targeting vessels there in November. The crucial Red Sea trading route passes through the Suez Canal. I want to stress this one more time. Imagine defending the Houthis, a literal terrorist organization. Well done, Hassan. In the wake of people saying things of this, I want to stress and reiterate this position one more time. As it pertains to Israel, Palestine, America, England, the Houthis, Ansarallah, are 100,000% just. Okay? I, I cannot stress this more. Okay? I will say it with my chest. You might not agree. You might say, well, you know, what about their anti-Semitic sloganeering? Yes, they were banned for saying a slur. Oh, 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 that's cool, man. Thanks. And of course, once again, my interlocutors prove me right. Oh, classic. The mind of, a, the, mind of the average defender of Israel, just so sick. Anyway, just told why he's banned, bring it up anyway. I wanted to see. The vice chairman of Ansar Allah says, Yemen is with Palestine and will not back down from its position and will respond to any aggression against it. So remember, you really think Houthis was launching rockets because of Gaza? Okay, yes, I do. Evidenced by the fact that there were no rockets or drones being launched before October 8. So yeah, but I do want to know where you're coming from. Like, why do you think they're doing it? Because they just like hate Jewish people or something? Or that they're like violent barbarians? Soy justify shooting in transport ships? Yeah. Isn't it crazy how it's an Iranian proxy? Okay. So, I don't think you know what that means, but it's fine. So? Yes, because they hate Jews and it's good timing for them. Oh, okay, got it. It's always... Yeah, Israel's the American proxy here, but wait, hold on. How is it that it's always... How is it that it's always like the guys that America fights are always the bad guys, dude? What are the odds, you know? It's so nuts. And yet, for some reason, Americans always have to go back to the one just war, World War II, where, yes, the guys that they fought were the bad guys to justify their current actions every single time. The one time we fought the bad guys, and we just still keep pointing to that for some reason. And we fought a lot of people since then. You know what I mean? Not to be precise, but executive director of left-wing organizations are saying rebels are motivated by anti-Semitism. It's on their flag. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I recognize that. I do. They're, one of their major uh, statements is like uh, in, their, in their graphic is like, curse the Jews or something. Yeah, I know. I know. Do you think this is campus activism? Like, do you think that's what's going on here? Yeah, they are. They, they have very anti-Semitic slogans. 100%. But do you, do you think this is a conversation about like, like hate crimes happening in the Western world? No, the motivation there absolutely without a shred of doubt from them is has been open and honest from day one yeah their slogan also says death to america i live in america i don't want to die you know and yet i can openly and conclusively tell you that what they are doing in this circumstance implementation of a blockade on the red sea as long as Israel's war against Palestinians continues, this ethnic cleansing against Palestinians continues, is a morally righteous and just cause. Okay? That's it. It's straight up true. Especially because, this is an L take, especially because I personally believe America should be doing the blockade. And you should too. A lot of you chirp, chirp, chirp about the United States of America's job as the moral arbiter of truth or... It's job as like the world police. And you even go maybe even so far as to say Israel's actions are unjustifiable and it's akin to ethnic cleansing. Okay. But then you never actually follow through on that. Like when someone actually does implement a blockade, you're like, I don't know about that. No, I wanted America to do this. Okay. That's it. Implementing a blockade on the Red Sea as, for as long as uh, Israel's actions continue. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. Uh, implementing a blockade 
uh, on the Red Sea for as long as uh, America's actions, unjustifiable actions continue, is morally a just. major escalation in the Red Sea. If we had any balls, sea, again, we would be doing it. Carrying... If we had any balls, we would be doing it. If Turkey had any balls, they'd be doing it. It doesn't have to be violent. Hassan speedrunning the L takes today, I see. How do you suggest, Gabe and Fan Club, for the people who keep saying these are L takes, these are L takes, these are L takes, how do you suggest countries can apply pressure to Israel to stop its ethnic cleansing? The first question is, do you think Israel is engaging in ethnic cleansing? I do, right? The second question is, how do you think, how do you think countries can apply pressure to stop Israel in engaging ethnic cleansing? I genuinely want to understand your position. That's what I want to know. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Oh, God, you guys are so lame. Come on. No, he's not banned. He and can reply. And we did reply. see a, a bit of a turning point last week when a U.S. official uh, said following the weeks and weeks of provocations and the attacks from the Houthis in the Red Sea on these shipping vessels uh, that they were essentially giving the last warning, that there would not be uh, another warning. And so given that we have seen these attacks and these provocations uh, continue, in some ways uh, we were very much preparing for a different kind of response uh, from the U.S. and its allies. Uh, again, we haven't gotten an official word from the White House, but Wolf, as Orrin was saying, given the uh, significance of this kind of action by the U.S. Uh, in Yemen, we should expect to hear from the president in some way tonight. Wolf. A very significant development indeed. Uh, Colonel Layton, uh, you're a military analyst. Uh, these strikes certainly do carry a real risk of escalation right now. Give us your reaction. Yeah, well, the, uh, the big uh, situation here with these strikes is that, first of all, they are going to hit some of the targets. As Oren mentioned, Hodaida, the main port in western Yemen, uh, is a highly likely target. Uh, there are a lot of anti-aircraft and anti-ship missiles that are located in that area. Uh, as far as the escalation, the possibilities of escalation are know. concerned, uh, what can happen here is that the Houthis are going to respond. You guys want to know what my biggest L take was? Time for an admission. My biggest L take was in the beginning of this process. There were military analysts that talked about how there could potentially be a six front war. And I always asked the question, what do you mean a six front war? Like what the, the Houthis, the, the, the people of Yemen are going to attack Israel law with what power? I said that. Okay. I undermined, I undermined and underestimated what the Houthis were capable of, what on what Sadallah was capable of, okay? I said at the time, they're starving. They just withstood a, a blockade and genocide, okay? I said it. It turns out these guys, they don't, they don't mess around. They mean business. They don't care. They mean business. They, they stood on that. Yeah, I apologize. I wasn't familiar with the Houthis game. That's it. Then make statements or put warships in the Red Sea to try to push back against the Houthis and make sure they don't threaten one of the world's most critical waterways. Again, that's what we're seeing here play out. The U.S. very much aware that there could be a risk of escalation with the Houthis. And because the Houthis are an Iranian proxy, you have to keep an eye on Iran to see their reaction to this, especially after the U.S. says they seized a tanker in the Gulf of Oman earlier today. Yeah, very, very significant. Uh, looks like this war, as I said, is escalating big time. And, and Colonel Layton, as you know, these, uh, this aircraft carrier battle group has a lot of warplanes ready to go if, uh, if given the order. Uh, what do you think? How likely is uh, this next step uh, going to be taking place? I think it's highly likely, Wolf, uh, and I think the warplanes that you mentioned, primarily FA-18 fighters uh, on board the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, they are going to be used to strike targets that are more complex uh, than what you would uh, normally strike with a Tomahawk missile. Uh, some of the uh, areas that they might strike would include radar installations. Uh, they will also probably go after some of the command and control uh, nodes that the Houthis have. Uh, so that is basically what we're looking at here. Uh, see, I think, a lot of activity in the northern part of Yemen and in the western part, which are the areas that the Houthis currently control. I want to bring in CNN's chief national security correspondent, Alex Marquardt. He's getting more information. Tell us more about 
the U.S. allies and their involvement in what's going on. Alex. Well, Wolf, it was a major consideration in carrying out the military operation that we are now seeing unfold that the U.S. not do this alone. There is a belief uh, that the British would also have a hand in this and potentially others as well. Uh, the U.S. really wanted to have global support when it came to retaliating uh, against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, you have this coalition of 22 countries, Operation Prosperity Guardian, that was set up uh, late last year in order to protect ships in the Red Sea. And then just last week, uh, the U.S. and other countries warning of consequences uh, to the Houthis if they consider, continue to carry out attacks against commercial shipping in the Red Sea. That was a warning that was issued by the White House alongside uh, 11 other countries. Wolf, there was a real sense that this was imminent uh, as soon as that statement was put out. A senior administration official saying that there would not be another warning. Uh, we have seen several attempted attacks and attacks by the Houthis in the past few days, and here we are seeing the response. So as Oren and the Colonel have been alluding to, the, the, the question now is what, does, what do the Houthis do? What does Iran do in reaction to tonight's strikes? Uh, we heard from a senior Houthi leader uh, just earlier today who said that uh, they would confront America. America and make it kneel down. I've been told by numerous U.S. officials uh, that it is clear uh, that, uh, that Iran's hand is clear in all of these. necessarily wants to escalate and open up any kind of full-scale war or, or major front with Iran, uh, but they're certainly eager to stir the pot. So what we're seeing here now is an attempt to de-escalate the situation, essentially give the Houthis a bloody nose and, and, and give them a message uh, to Wait, back uh, down and stop carrying out these operations. America only knows how to de-escalate a situation by blowing up, like, actual soil. They're blowing up Yemeni soil! Or, and it comes as the uh, defense secretary, That's Lloyd what Austin, this fucking is currently still in the hospital. Said. Update us on that and the connection, if any, to what's going on. He very much remains in the hospital at this point. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has been there since January 1st. So 10 days and no expectation that he's going to be released in, in the Bro, coming I hours. I love that. Perhaps not even in the coming days. Here. Guys, you don't understand. This is a de-escalatory bombing, okay? Like, this is a de-escalatory top-of-the-hour ad break. My goal is to de-escalate. Just kidding. I'm escalating the top of the hour ad break. However, you can subscribe and avoid it regardless. That was an insane point of manufacturing consent, right? You saw that. I'm glad that you saw that. It happened in real time. What this will do is escalate the Houthis, will likely fire on all ships crossing in the Red Sea, possibly fire on U.S. bases in Saudi Arabia and UAE. Yes. And it seems like people are saying that maybe uh, Iraq is also, um, Iraq is also uh, uh, taking a hit. Like our American bases in Iraq are being attacked right now. Our militias is what someone was saying in the chat. I'm not entirely sure, but we'll see. Oh, there's new development from that. Uh, in, the, uh, in the region. Very significant indeed, guys. Thank you very much. And to our viewers, thanks very much for watching. Aaron Burnett out front starts right now. Out front next, the breaking news. U.S. airstrikes in the Middle East tonight. U.S. fighter jets right now striking parts of Yemen with Tomahawk missiles. We are waiting to hear directly from President Biden as the entire Middle East and the world right now are on edge. And more breaking news tonight, a Trump's tirade, a judge shutting the former president down after an outburst at his fraud trial in New York. Could this be the beginning of the end for Trump's business empire? And Christie's hot mic moment that everyone's been talking about. We have the man who is on the other end, who was speaking to Christie on that mic. What else did he say? Was it really an accident? Let's go out front. Um. In oh, the here's Middle the East, now. Hour, I a U.S. Run. official telling CNN that right now the U.S. military is carrying out strikes with fighter jets and Tomahawk missiles on Yemen. Their target, Iranian-backed militia Houthis. And these strikes come after... They keep saying Iranian-backed militia Houthis. Just say, like, the people of Yemen, Ally. man. Uh, to be clear, these strikes in the Middle East are very significant. The United States is now finally taking action, and it could change the Israel-Hamas war into something... We don't say America backed Israel. These have been relentlessly attacking ships in the Red Sea since November. Reports today of another attack, the 27th by the group, in the area under two months, according to the Pentagon. Now, the Houthis are already vowing to retaliate to any strikes. A senior member moments ago saying, and I quote, we will confront America, make it kneel down and burn its battleships and all its bases, and everyone who cooperates with it no matter the cost. And as we said, a very significant moment here, the United States launching multiple strikes in Yemen tonight. So much to get to with this breaking development. I want to start with MJ Lee out front live outside the White House. And MJ, a tense situation tonight. It is, of course, the darkest hours of the night uh, just coming uh, before dawn in Yemen. 
and now a series of strikes. What are you learning? Yeah, Aaron, we are certainly waiting for that official word from the White House on these attacks in Yemen uh, against these Houthi positions. But a uh, U.S. official telling me and confirming uh, that this isn't just the U.S. military, but it, these are actions that are being taken uh, with other countries, including uh, the U.K. Uh, what we should make clear is that U.S. officials have telecast in recent days very clearly uh, that the situation in the Red Sea had become intolerable and unacceptable. And in recent days, uh, U.S. officials had gone as far as to say that they were issuing their final warnings uh, to the Houthi. So it was certainly expected uh, that in the coming days, given that the Houthi provocations and the attacks had continued on these shipping vessels in the Red Sea, that some kind of a different response could be coming again from the U.S. Uh, and its allies. Now, uh, striking in Yemen is something that the U.S. had hoped that it could very much avoid. This was almost a last resort situation, given that the U.S. is so uh, set on trying to prevent uh, the situation in the Middle East from uh, escalating. They also just do not want to disturb uh, the current truce in the Yemen civil war. Uh, but again, I think it's very much expected, given the gravity of the situation and the significance of this action by the U.S. and others, uh, that we should be hearing in some form pr from the president directly uh, later this evening, Aaron. All right. Thank you very much, MJ Lee. And you heard MJ say in some form we should hear from the president later this evening. Uh, it is a grave and deeply serious moment and a significant development here. Uh, and as MJ said, indications allies uh, involved. I mentioned that emergency cabinet meeting uh, in the darkness of night in London, uh, Rishi Sunak holding, and we do understand now that the UK was part of these strikes. Oren Lieberman joins me now from the Pentagon. And Oren, uh, you're learning uh, about the UK involvement. What more are you learning about these strikes tonight? We've just learned quite a bit from a US <laughs> official about the types of targets that were struck here by the US, and we've now just learned the UK. We have also learned that the US strikes came from a variety of different platforms, including, as we've said, fighter jets and Tomahawk missiles, which are land attack missiles launched from the sea. But it's not just surface vessels, it was also submarines that were used in part of this attack, hmm. targeting 12 or more than 12, I, I should say, different sites in Yemen belonging to the Houthis. Those targets included radar sites, as well as storage and launch sites for ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and UAVs. That's significant because it's those three types of weapons that the Houthis have used to target international shipping in the God Red Sea, obviously one of the world's most critical waterways. So the U.S. and the U.K. very much trying to send a message here that this needs to stop. We have seen, according to the U.S., 27 times where uh, the Houthis have launched attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. At first, they were trying to target ships that had some sort of connection to Israel, either coming or going from or part ownership. But according to the U.S. Navy's <clears throat> fifth fleet, which operates in the region, many of the last dozen attacks had no connection at all to Israel. The U.S. feeling compelled because of the threats to international shipping to set up Operation Prosperity Guardian and protect shipping in the Red Sea. But that was purely defensive. This obviously goes well beyond that. After multiple warnings to both the Houthis and to Iran, the Houthis... Wait, what? I thought Iranian that was also defensive. I thought America only engages in defensive the US uh, posture. The feeling compelled to take action here. So you again, said earlier that this was a, a bloody nose, a de-escalatory tomahawk. As well as uh, storage and launch platforms and sites for ballistic missiles, uh, cruise missiles, and UAVs. And the U.S. using not just fighter jets, but also surface ships and submarines to carry out what appears to be a broad array of strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen, Aaron. All right, a broad assault. Oren, thank you very much. Uh, and, and always important to note, 90% of the world's trade goes by ship. Uh, and in, these attacks have gone unanswered now for three months until this uh, mass assault, this broad assault that we're talking about happening at this hour. Barack Ravid is our political and global affairs analyst and retired U.S. Army Major General James Spider Marks also joins me. So, General, here we are. Finally, 27 strikes uh, on, on shipping, uh, many of the U.S. ships targeted. The U.S. now tonight responding, hitting more than a dozen Houthi targets uh, in Yemen. The Houthis, of course, an Iranian back uh, militia, uh, Iranian proxy. Uh, and coming from the air, coming from under the sea, coming from uh, ships on the sea. Your reaction? I think it's well overdue. The, the timing of this is important. The United States has previously been very, very precise in its attack against the Houthis. It's kind of been a tit for tat. This is an escalation and I think that's appropriate. It's not an expansion. Look, there's proportionality, you know, legal requirements that I think this would exceed, certainly at a minimum, would meet those prescriptions for proportionality. And you have to go after, as Oren has just reported, both the archers as well as the arrows in military terms. Go after the inventory, 
go after the capabilities, uh -huh. go after the leadership, go after the launch capabilities as well. That's what we're seeing right now. And important, the message needs to be there's no sanctuary for the Houthis where, where they are in Yemen. The only sanctuary that exists is with, within the border of Iran. Nobody's going to conduct operations across the border into Iran. But the Houthis need to understand, unacceptable, this needs to be a crucial blow. Well, that's the, cru the crucial question, Brock. Uh, is it a crushing blow? Obviously, there's a statement being made in the fact that there's... Bro, this is literally Israel. UK is involved, and it's more than a dozen targets, and it's... They're about to be like, the Houthis are using civilian shields, and that's why we had to kill thousands of people in Yemen. Be received. Well, it's definitely not a crushing blow. Uh, it's a beginning. It's a first step. Uh, you don't uh, crush uh, a, a strong militia like the Houthis with uh, airstrikes on 10 targets around the country. Uh, they have a robust military infrastructure all over the countries with vast military capabilities, uh, and they're going to respond. It's pretty clear. They said that they're going to respond. They will do it. And now the question is, how far will they go? Will they just attack U.S. US vessels in the Red Sea, or are they going to start attacking U.S. forces in the region? And General, uh, that's, the, the, that's the question here. So the statement from the senior member of the Houthis tonight, and this statement came just before we learned the strikes were launched. So there was anticipation that it was going to happen. You know, we knew about the cabinet meeting. We knew it was imminent. Uh, and then they happen. The quote, we will confront America, make it kneel down and burn its battleships and all its bases and everyone who cooperates with it, no matter the cost. Now, of course, there's some bellicosity within that. But what are they really capable of doing? Yeah, as you said, look, we're not surprised by any, any of that type of narrative that they would release. What we're seeing right now needs to be the first step in what must become a much larger type of engagement with the Houthis, or we're going to be here forever putting up with this. The planning that goes into these type of operations gets into what's known as an action, reaction, counteraction type scenario. So the United States and its allies that are participating have obviously gone through this. I don't see this as a potential snowballing out of control or the United States and the UK wouldn't be there. There has to be able to be a very precise, as I've described, an initial crushing blow against the Houthis. And if they go after, and they've already indicated that they're gonna go after US forces. Yes. And there are other proxies right. that have gone after US forces. So that's a given. We have to be able to put a lid on that. Uh, we all, the, the, the comment was made a moment ago, right, that there wouldn't be a strike within Iran. Barack, but that is the real question here, right? How will Iran back, uh, uh, react, right? The Houthis are an Iranian proxy. They are Iranian. I love Aaron Burnett being like, can we attack Iran too, please? An Iranian proxy, they're definitely Iranian backed, but it's, um, it's not clear that they are 100% Iranian controlled, meaning it's not like uh, an on-off switch that the Iranians can just tell them, okay, now you start shooting and now you stop shooting. Yeah. It's more complicated than that. And you have to add to that, that for the Iranians, that's the best case scenario, that the Houthis and the U.S. will uh, uh, have those skirmishes now and the Iranians will sit on the sidelines and uh, as if they have nothing to do with it. And obviously, the U.S. tried in recent days to send messages to Iran uh, <clears throat> to stop the Houthis. It didn't happen. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure the U.S. is ready at the moment to go after uh, Iran in order to stop this. All right. Please stay with me, both of you. I want to bring in Jason Crow, the Democratic congressman, former Army Ranger, who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan and sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee. So, Congressman, uh, here we are. I don't get why. Axios reporter Barack Ravid is being asked about these questions. The UK, we understand, against you know what I mean? this Iranian-backed militia. What more are you learning about these strikes tonight? Hi, Aaron. Well, we're paying close attention to this on Capitol Hill. There's really three things going on here. The first is the president has the authority in the... What's up, bro? Wait, can you hear me? Ludwig is calling. Brother, uh, America is currently attacking Yemen, and you're calling me in the middle of that. I suspect because you're doing a tier list or something. What's going on? No. I oh. didn't even know about this Yemen thing, by the way. I'm devastated, for starters. Second off, I was just wondering if you wanted to get dinner Saturday. I didn't even know you were alive. I totally forgot. Yeah, I do. All right. All right, bye. Or that we don't let this escalate into a broader conflict so that it's it's proportional, <laughs> that it's controlled. We're watching World we're War III. We're looking very what Iran is doing, and we're not... Uh, creating an escalation here. Uh, number three is Congress's role, making sure that this is a self-defense attack, that we're not being pulled into a broader conflict. I would not support 
uh, us being pulled into a broader conflict against the Houthis. We, we should not be doing that. Uh, we just ended uh, our nation's longest war. We should not be pull it, pulled into another one. So we have an obligation in the weeks ahead to conduct oversight on Capitol Hill. You know, on the one hand, uh, the, the Biden administration has been criticized for its tepid response, its lack of response to Houthi attacks, repeated attacks, more than 25 of them, right? 27, I believe, uh, on shipping interests. Uh, on the other hand, you have the uh, one of the chief uh, operators in, of the Houthis saying, we will confront America, make it kneel down and burn its battleships uh, tonight, as that statement coming out. Do you, Congressman, take that seriously? Do you think they have the ability to do any sort of an action that would cause what, dude, why is Aaron Burnett more serious than the congressperson? By the way, Elant News is right. Barack Ravid actually did provide better analysis than the fucking general did. It's still unique that, you know, you got a goddamn Axios reporter being like uh, uh, doing commentary here. But like, again, the, the CNN reporter is always more reactionary than the most reactionary That's person. That's why you, you have, have. clear-eyed, smart, intelligence, national security professionals of the administration making sure that we are smart that we have a proportionate response, that we are defending we are ourselves, but we're we not are escalating, escalating either. Uh, and that takes calculation, that takes uh, intelligence, that takes the ability to look at the various streams of intelligence and risk that we are facing. Chatters, many of you always come in here when things are popping off and say, is this a distraction from this other thing? All of you, and just the general Western populations, basically has the attention span of a dog. You could just dangle keys in front of you and you would lose sight of whatever you were thinking about anyway. America doesn't need to start another front of war because of the International Court of Justice trials against Israel. No, they're doing this most likely because of what happened in Oman earlier today. Okay, they've been setting up for a counter against the Houthis, against Ansar Allah for some time now. Due to, as Aaron Burnett correctly and, uh, I guess, vociferously, bloodthirstily brought up the 27 attacks against commerce interests. So, there is no, like, distraction from one thing or the next. Okay? It is happening because of Israel. Um, because of our endless support for Israel. Okay? That part is true. But the timing of this is suspicious is, like, my least favorite type Chips of commentary. A submarine that carried out these strikes. We have learned more about the submarine. It is the USS Florida, a ballistic missile submarine capable of carrying out and firing Tomahawk missiles as well. Those are land attack missiles, and that, according to a U.S. official, is what was used in this attack. What's noteworthy here is that, first, the U.S. rarely talks about where its subs are. They are a very closely held secret. So anytime there's a public statement about them, it is a significant statement. And this is the sub that U.S. Central Command announced had entered the Red Sea from the Suez Canal in early November. So we now have learned that this is the submarine that has been there operating in the Red Sea, perhaps not all of this time, but that was a part of this strike using the Tomahawk Damn, missiles bro. that's capable that's of crazy. launching as the U.S. carried out a strike along with the U.K. on uh, more than a dozen or so targets in Yemen. So, so sick, our weapons, Now, too, bro. we learn about the operations of a U.S. submarine as it relates to this very significant moment and this significant attack, Aaron. Orrin, thank you very much. And Barack Ravid, Major General Spider Marks are back with me uh, in this significant moment with a significant attack, as Orrin describes it, General. We've now learned that the USS Florida, uh, that that is the sub that was responsible for launching some of these tomahawks. When you hear that and them releasing this information, sharing this information, saying the name of the vessel, what do you take away from it? Well, attack subs, you have different manner of submarines. You've got boomers, those that are going to launch your ICBMs, your nuke capability. The Navy's never going to let you know where those babies are. The attack submarines, on the other hand, make themselves known. This is a very specific announcement by the Department of Defense saying we have capabilities, look at what they can do, very precise attack, and we're going to do some very significant bomb damage assessment in terms of what the, you know, what the damage it's was so against the target. Was there any collateral damage as a result of that? And they'll alter their attack platform accordingly. This makes perfect sense when you look at all the, the array of capabilities that the DOD has available. They will use everything in their kit bag, bag to make sure this happens. And Barack, what's your understanding about the length of lead time they would have had to plan the time of this? And I say that in the context of we know the UK is involved. We know there was a, a cabinet meeting, emergency all cabinet meeting, uh, a few hours ago in London, uh, led by the Prime Minister Sunak. Uh, but that this was done in coordination, right? There were so many targets. What's your understanding about what went into it in terms of planning and how long they knew that they were going to do this at this time on this day? I think this uh, strike was planned for at least two to three weeks. 
Um, I think the White House was very hesitant uh, when the Pentagon first uh, brought the initial plans for uh, a re a military retaliation to what the Houthis uh, have, been, have been doing since uh, mid-November. And uh, U.S. officials told me in recent days that what was important to the White House was first to try and mobilize some sort of an international coalition so that it won't be seen as the U.S. going at it alone or even the U.S. and the U.K. And behind the U.S. and U.K. strike are at least uh, two dozen other countries that are involved seen as the U.S. going at it alone or even the U.S. and the U.K. And behind the U.S. and U.K. strike are at least... Uh, two dozen other countries that are involved in this task force in the Red Sea yes. and that signed. I predict by the end of this week, there will be a not insignificant coalition of globe Twitter that unironically whitewashes the genocide in Yemen in the hands of Saudi Arabia and justifies it as they learn about what it is, really, because they didn't know what it was already. Yeah, globe Twitter. You will see think tank Andes like that one Syrian guy who works for the American Enterprise Institute and, and all of the other dudes with like globes in their profiles and uh, people who fancy themselves to be like sock thems and whatnot, totally go back and play the uh, Saudi Arabia's actions in Yemen story in a way that unironically says, uh, yeah, it was actually good that they did that. Okay, European Union flag, yeah. Oftentimes it's like uh, it's always like some some um, some Slav uh, dude too. It's always like some it's always one of those like European Union countries that gets like dunked on by the rest of the EU. You know what I mean? Always an Eastern European guy with the most genocidal opinions, defending and riding people who think he's a dog historically. You know what I mean? Their intentions very very clear. Nor should we be surprised by any declaration by the Houthis or by Iran, which means. Israel now is at greater risk. I mean, th this isn't a black swan event. This is a white swan swimming in a pond of white swans. This is totally predictable. Yeah. This needs to be done, and we understand the cost. Mm -hmm. Barack, I want to play for you uh, some video that we just this had in of one of these done, strikes. This needs to be done, bro. Uh, well, we're going to get it in a moment. I'll explain what it is, and we get it. I'll play it. But uh, we do have video uh, coming in of a strike, uh, Barack, north of Sana, of course, uh, the capital of Sana, Yemen. Uh, in the Sana province. So we're going to show that as soon as we get it. Uh, but that will show, uh, here it is. So you go ahead and, and, and watch this, Brock, show that we actually have video of these. Yeah, people are going to find out that the Houthis logo says, like, curse the Jews, and then they're going to repeat that, too. They're going to be like, it's anti-Semitic. Why are you defending anti-Semitism? I knew the left had a real problem with anti-Semitism. I didn't know how bad it was. Clip it. You'll see. Every single person is going to literally run these talking points in the next week. They do not know any of these things right now because they do not have a well-formed, informed opinion on the, on the situation at all. You know, they're just learning about all of this now so they can hit you with talking points. And you hear the dogs. Yeah, I, I think what we'll have to see is uh, how this looks in the morning. Uh, meaning uh, when the sun comes up, uh, mm -hmm. we'll be able to see exactly what was hit, how big is the damage, and we'll also know if there are any casualties among the Houthis. Um, just last week, um, the U.S. helicopters fired at uh, some uh, small boats that the Houthis sent to try and uh, kidnap uh, a, a commercial ship. Ten Houthi rebels uh, were killed. Uh, and the an interesting question to me is whether the U.S. Uh, did this airstrikes on targets that had uh, Houthi uh, militants in them or it was just empty targets that uh, only had uh, weapon caches or uh, missile positions. And I think this is a big, big question because this will determine Civilians. what will be the Houthi response to this. General Marks, what do you see in this uh, video that we have uh, taken from the ground in the distance looking at, it's hard to say, right? It's multiple plumes of fire, looks like multiple explosions lighting up the sky. But what do right. you see when you watch this? Yeah, to, to Barack's comment, um, those are, that looks like these are secondary explosions. That's significant. Frankly, if there aren't any Houthi fighters co-located with where those ammunition depots might be, or some of their capabilities might be located. I'm okay with that. Let's get rid of all of their inventory so that they have a much diluted Bro, capacity. I'm sorry, but like, 
that's a whole different country, man. Like, is it okay if if people start blowing up like random parts of America because there's ammo depots there? Like, what are we talking about? You can't do that. Like, that's you're America, okay? You are the United States of America. You're like seven, eight thousand miles away from this area, and you've decided like I'm gonna blow up your weapons depot. Like, this makes no sense. Just did it, Bubba. I know. I know it makes a lot of people's dicks hard to think like, oh, they're doing this and we're showing our might towards a population of people that we had had uh, uh, been doing, gen- we, would be- we had been genociding, basically, and not directly genociding, indirectly genociding with a regional proxy. Like, we outsourced our genocide of the, of the Yemeni population to Saudi Arabia, okay? But it blows my mind. Like, it blows my mind that, like, Americans champion this kind of thing. You get no benefits from this, dog. You're not even, they're not even doing this for your security. They're doing this for, they're doing this to flex for Israel, basically. So it's additionally odd when Americans are like, lol, they're going to find out why we don't have healthcare. And it's like, bro, you really think that's chill? You just said it's cool that you don't have healthcare because America gets the aid and abet in genocide. Like, you think that's fun? You think that's a good thing? You just basically posted your L publicly. You are no different than like the dumbass hogs that we make fun of every day. The scale and scope of the U.S. and U.K. operation here and perhaps other countries participating as well. Right. We, and, and, and important what you say there. We don't know uh, other countries at this point, if and if so, who. And we also don't know, at least as far as I understand, or correct me if I'm wrong, the exact number of targets. We know more than a dozen, but that 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 that's the... The, the description at this point. I, I just want to follow up with you on, on, on a couple points and also with uh, Brock and the general. But y- you talk about the specificity of these strikes, and it looks like those could be secondary explosions indicating that they had hit some sort of weapons uh, depot or, or something along those lines, Orrin. How good is the U.S. intel? When you're striking more than a dozen precise targets, it would indicate it is very Why do good. You care? Is that right? Do they feel that they really know where every single thing is there? Certainly, we'll get a better sense of that if and when we get briefed by. Uh, senior administration officials, and then hopefully at some point U.S. Central Command to understand how they knew what they were going for, how long they'd been monitoring it. The U.S. has known this is a potential flashpoint. It's also worth noting that that because this is a multinational operation, the U.S., U.K., and, and perhaps others, there is the potential of sharing intel, and that shores up what you're able to know and gives as many sort of input feeds into the intel picture as you can get. The U.S. has obviously worked sort of both on and off with the Saudis as they had a years long war with the Houthis. So there's a, there is certainly knowledge of the capabilities that the Houthis have. Yeah. And that perhaps gave them a picture of where exactly the Houthis have it to know where to strike. Obviously the U.S. has all sorts of other ways of gathering intelligence from satellite to signals intelligence. So these are all feeding into the picture here. Yeah. And then in the course of the next hours and days, we'll get a better sense of, of what they hit what they didn't hit, perhaps. Of course, Intel is imperfect and it has holes in it and gaps in it, so we'll get a better picture of that. But these are all questions as we see the first videos of these explosions here. And, and as we're watching this, when you talk about we'll find out what they did hit and what they didn't hit, uh, Barack Ravid, let me ask you about that because you had indicated that even if we're talking about more than a dozen strikes, and, and I understand that that is not as precise as many viewers may want to hear, it's not as precise as we want. We want more information, but that's what we have right now. Um, that that would, uh, you didn't use the word tip of the iceberg, but you did seem to indicate that that's, that's, that's a little bit, that there's a lot. Can you contextualize this as everyone tries oh. to understand this war? This is a significant strike. It's a significant step. But as it, as it could escalate, how much more is there? Yeah, I think there's much more. Again, the Houthis are a well-equipped, well-trained uh, uh, militia. Uh, they have, I think... Uh, equipment that uh, only several uh, non-state actors around the world have. Maybe the the the, the other actor is Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, both of them are supported and backed uh, by. Yeah, because they're state actors. I think just an update, an interesting update, because President Biden just issued a statement uh, about uh, uh, this airstrike, and he what do said you mean? there's something uh, interesting that. While the U.S. and the U.K. were the ones who actually conducted the strike, the state they, act. they had uh, uh, support of uh, several kinds of support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands, uh, something that we did not know. Uh, People are always shocked when they find out that the 
Hezbollah literally has a party. Hezbollah isn't a state actor. I mean, it, it, it is. Hezbollah is. It is. They have fiber. They have, they deal with matters of uh, civil governance. Okay. They have fiber. I don't. Okay. I'm sorry. That's ridiculous. There will be some damage that was absolutely spot on and there will be others. There will be misses in this attack, which means that you're going to be there for a while. Yeah, there's a common joke in Lebanon. The Lebanese army is the second strongest army in all of Lebanon, referring to Hezbollah, lol. Exactly. That's important. And not every one of those needs to be a shooter. Look, when you have operations like this, you have folks that have to support, they have to watch your... Same with Ansar Allah. Like, the reason why the Houthis, the reason why they say, oh, the Houthis are Ansar Allah sometimes, or like, and not Yemen and Yemeni state, is because a part of the reason why this, this conflict is occurring in Yemen, or, or the, the genocide that... Occurred in Yemen is because the Saudi-backed government uh, has been in contest against the Houthis, against Ansar Allah, which is part of the reason why they uh, are, are saying that Yemen is actually not a state actor, except the Saudi-backed, uh, yeah, they're an ethnic group too. The Saudi-backed state actor, on the other hand, is not even operating inside of the boundaries of Yemen. The Houthis are. Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. That's part of this as well. It gives international legitimacy to the need to protect international shipping and if the threat continues to respond to that threat. And that's what the U.S. is trying to do here. Not start a war with the Houthis, but try to send a message that these attacks have to stop. Yeah, okay. It's a message not just directed at the Houthis, but also one directed at Iran as we see them seize another vessel uh, earlier today, according to both the U.S. and Iranian media. It is that threat to commercial shipping that has been one of the big goals here because it's a, such a, a critical waterway. The U.S. was looking for, and as we learn now, got international backing for how critical of a threat this was, backing this action tonight by the U.S. and the U.K. General, uh, you've talked about how obviously there are threats to, uh, to burn battleships and destroy, uh, burn U.S. bases. Uh, it, it, it express that as a bit of hyperbole. And certainly we've seen, obviously, then launch missiles at ships, right, that have been repelled by U.S. air defense. But have we seen their full capability in the context of what we know and what Barack is speaking of, that they have the capability that, uh, that they and perhaps only Hezbollah have as non-state actors? Yeah, they have some tremendous capabilities. So we, we've seen those. By the way, it's such a funny thing to conduct yourselves like this while you are doing, quote-unquote, journalism. But, like, does not a single individual that watches CNN ask the question, so why are these non-state actors blowing up ships and stuff? Like, why are they taking over ships? What, what's the reason? Is there a reason? Like, all it takes is a crumb of intellectual curiosity. If you think the Houthi did all the bombing ships because of Gaza, do you think North Korea bombing South Korean territory from artillery in the last days was because of Gaza, too? Or is that just a coincidence? Brother, I'm sorry. You are desperately trying to change the subject to completely irrelevant points. Like, one is directly a regional power player that is aligned with the, the group of individuals who they are demonstrating uh, their might for. The other has absolutely nothing to do with Gaza. I don't know why. I, like, I, I'm sorry. I, I find it really strange that you think this is a good counter-argument like, what are you talking about, dude? Bro, I swear, if you ask, like, the, the average Ansar Allah dude, or, like, a dude in, in, uh, in Gaza, if you found, like, a dude that is a Hamas operative, like, what do you think about North Korea? They'd probably be like, I, I don't know. Like, what the fuck do I care about North Korea? Like, what are you saying? You have to be so permanently American brain to think that, like, all of our foreign adversaries are, are, are basically operating in unison. To make this comparison between the Houthis or Ansar Allah or Yemen and, and North Korea is a, an, is a cowardly way of trying to argue because you have no counter to what I have to say. That's a reach. That, like, there's a difference between Yemen, the Red Sea, okay, and also North Korea and South Korea. What are you talking about? Not every conflict has any, everything to do with one another. This one does. What are you talking? Dude, is South Korea Israel? Here is why it doesn't, what you're saying doesn't make sense. Because South Korea is not Israel. Israel is Israel. Yemen stopping commerce in the Red Sea is directly impacting Israel. 
North Korea is not a part of the the like even if the argument you're trying to make is like, well, these are the this is the axis of evil. You're pulling a George W. Bush in 2001 axis of evil argument by uh, trying to add North Korea onto the pile. There's a direct connection between Houthis and Israel. There is no direct connection between the Houthis, or, I mean, uh, between North Korea and Israel. What are you talking about? It's so stupid. Which the president says these attacks by the Houthis have endangered U.S. personnel, uh, civilian mariners, and other partners, jeopardized They've been pirating commerce ship for a long time there. It didn't navigation. start this month. Why didn't the U.S. drop a bomb on Yemen before then? No, they've never done it to this degree. What, no, that's not true. Yemen has never... Uh, as far as I know, they've never, they've never had to institute a blockade or implemented a blockade, this strict block of a blockade, blockade at all. Brother, they were, they were also directly being genocided. They were the ones who were under a blockade by Saudi Arabia and coalition forces in the region that caused the worst instance of famine. I tweeted it, but like a decade ago, my final research project was about Yemen and how the U.S. has facilitated a war against it. And my professor asked me to help him grade final papers and stay after class so we could ask me more the whole time about the conflict because he had no idea it existed. He was a very old and progressive dude, too. Even though he cared, Americans have no clue about this shit. It's going to be ugly this week online. Yeah, but when they find out about it, they're going to... Here's how it always goes, intelligent. Okay? The Hudsons are out today. Okay? The Hudsons are out in full force in the chat today. Episodes one very own intelligent. Listen, the thing is, Americans don't really think too much about this sort of stuff. But they have like, like foundational principles that they uh, they base their worldview off of, and I don't mean like real moral principles. I'm I'm talking specifically like America good, brown guy bad, that sort of thing. So what I think usually ends up happening, and I, I assume your professor was actually open minded, but what I what usually ends up happening in a situation like this, as far as I've seen, is they go and and the the ones that want to chirp and like come across as intelligent in matters such as foreign policy like this, the ones that want to come across as intelligent will decide, like, who is America backing in this war? Is it directly something that America is doing? And then they work their way from the conclusion that America's actions are just moral and permissible and very good. So that's why I said, like, what a lot of people are going to do in the upcoming week is find ways in which, like, how the Houthis are wrong. He was very kind and was concerned about it, but yeah, you're 100% right. You will see people who may not even realize that they fake-supported stopping the genocide in Yemen because who was doing the genocide in Yemen? Saudi Arabia. They might not have even known that it was actually Saudi Arabia that was doing it with America's weapons, for example, or they might have even known but forgot to put that connection in that circumstance. So you'll see people that literally go out and post stuff like, oh, man, the Houthis are actually the bad guys. Or maybe even try to justify the genocide that happened prior, right? Um, in an effort to normalize the the uh, the violence that the Houthis are being subjected to now. Okay, they started doing it already by talking about the average age of marriage of Yemeni girls. Oh, there you go. See, look, look. Like, let's be real. I'm assuming this guy was in the chat earlier when I said this already, but it started already. Look, you see, like clockwork. I told you, and like a week you know what i mean i did not realize it would be that fast wow intel spirit let's nuke this third let's nuke this third world uh third world poorest country in the world great intel okay no my statement is their slogan doesn't matter okay their slogan is irrelevant i don't care okay what they're doing they have directly and openly stated they're doing this because of Israel's actions in Gaza and the blockade that they've, you know, hastily put together will stop when Israel stops, okay? Their cause is just as it pertains to implementing a blockade in the Red Sea. I told you. I hope that makes sense for you. But the beginning that when they started firing at ships uh, in the Bab el Mendeb, uh, in the Red Sea, in the crossing there, uh, it was ships that had some sort of a, an even vague affiliation with Israel, but then they just started firing at any ship, even if it had nothing to do with Israel. And I think that that has shown to everybody that, you know, Gaza was just an excuse uh, for the Houthis and that there's m a much bigger picture here. And, you know, let's if we can talk for a few seconds about this big picture, 
You know, the war in Gaza is between Israel and Hamas. President of Israel's target said chosen was toward higher end. Iran. Uh, we see tensions between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah is backed by Iran. We saw a uh, uh, rocket fire from Syria towards Israel by pro-Iranian uh, militias. And we have the Houthis who are also backed by Iran. There's a common denominator here. Yeah. And this common denominator here right now sits in Tehran, eats popcorn and enjoying the show. And, and uh, I want to bring in Jeremy Diamond, who is live in Tel Aviv for us tonight. Uh, of course... Uh, the, the heart and center of all of this and, and why we are here uh, with these strikes tonight. So, Jeremy, what are you learning uh, about the Israeli response and, I guess, what their readiness is? Uh, I don't understand that from uh, Oren's reporting that they were given a heads up. I'm sorry, Barack's reporting that they were given a heads up, that they were aware that this was going to happen. Wait. But nonetheless, this, of course, puts Tel Aviv where you are directly. Wait, does this mean that Biden gave Israel... Uh knowledge ahead of time that this was going to happen but not congress please are the reports true that congress was not informed about this because if that's the case i'm going to lose my mind these airstrikes have not been authorized by congress the constitution is clear congress has the sole authority to authorize military involvement overseas conflicts oh my god launched that very significant uh, barrage uh, of uh, missiles and drones at those uh, that shipping lane uh, in the Red Sea, uh, prompting the United States and Britain to intercept nearly two dozen of those projectiles aimed there. I think it has been clear over the since those attacks happened and in the wake of the warnings from the Secretary of State that there was going to be some kind of a significant U.S. response. And I bro, is he out of his mind? This is like, if Donald Trump did this, every American organ of media would be losing their minds, okay? That's nuts. Will it be there you go. Allahu Akbar, death to America, death to Israel, cursed be the Jews, victor to Islam. They have the self-awareness of cartoon villains, but they're no laughing matter. Bro, this guy should be in jail. If England was a real country, you would arrest this fucking terrorist criminal piece of shit who came back on British soil for being a genocide heir, for being an acting representative of a genocide. But because the entire island is a bunch of morally bankrupt Tory pedophiles, obviously not the good British people, I'm talking about specifically the conservatives, okay? None of the English politicians sitting in the parliament have the decency to implement at least the same scrutiny that you would have for a Muslim person that went to a Muslim country and then came back is disgusting. Yeah, it started. No shot. Anyone thinks the Houthis who starved an entire city and brought back slavery are good. Might as well simp for John Jaweed. Houthis starved and sieged 37,000 people in Abdiya, by the way. Dude, I'm telling you, it's coming. Just wait, dude. It's coming. I'm telling you. That, that, by, it, it's going to turn into actually what Saudi Arabia was doing was good. I'm telling you. What Saudi Arabia was doing was actually good in Yemen is what it's going to turn into. Just wait. What about them? Works for Israel too then, Hassan? Yeah, no, totally. Cong uh, Congress leaders were reportedly informed by Biden according to Huffington Post. New, Biden administration has told leaders in Congress there will be U.S.-U.K. airstrikes in Yemen tonight per U.S. official. So what happened? Like, the Rokanas of the world didn't hear about it? Like, a couple, all the... Joe Biden only told some people in Congress... Not the, not the people he doesn't think are cool with it. Problem is, who voted for it? Yeah. How'd that work? Because they hit us first. Uh, they hit U.S. first in international waters. I feel like there's still a rules of engagement. Or I guess, yeah, there's already troops deployed. Why do you think politics happens in a vacuum? Also, why do you keep defending terrorists? I've never defended the United States of America. I have not defended the United States of America, nor the criminal state of Israel. Both the United States of America and the Israeli state are war criminals and engage in acts of terror. They are the largest state sponsors of terror. They dish it out on their own as well. And um, I've never defended them. So how dare you come in here and tell me that I'm defending terrorists. <sighs> Updates on what the Houthis are saying via Yemeni media. The Houthi TV of al Mazira reported the strikes targeted al Dailami Air Base in the capital Sana'a, vicinity of the Hodeidah Airport, and other targets in Zabid in the province of Hodeidah, Kahlan military camp in Saada. Local sources reported strikes in Taiz and Dahomar. Houthi leaders said their forces are attacking the U.S. and U.K. warships in the Red Sea. It also reported that the strikes hit um, the military airports in the Haja province. 
Um, it also the it hit the Taiz airport in the 22 military camp in the province of Taiz, or no province of Ho- Hodeida. Um, uh, United States is one of the largest perpetrators of terrorism. What co- what is the line between terrorism and warfare? Can you have war without acts of terror? No. Um, war is terror. I guess the the legality of it is that they're not they're not actually committing new soldiers. They're not deploying new soldiers. This is just existing soldiers in the region, right? Um, Hamas calls cap on the Holocaust and not liking Jews is what? What is this guy saying? I'm, I do think that like, first of all, I think that uh, like, if you're a 4chan poll user, you should stop saying like no cap on a stack, stuff like that. Like a a lot of people I've, I've noticed like a lot of like accounts where people say like a lot of groipers will be like Himmler's 1488 will be like no cap on a stack for real, for real. Like. You know, Goebbels had some good ideas on God. That's a major W. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, how did this happen? How did you, how did you get like so groiped up with the most like weird internet Nazi forum shit while also simultaneously like Zoomer culture is so synonymous with like black culture that you're just like perma stuck doing AAVE in a, in a really bad way too. They also waited internationally. Until the UNSC came out yesterday condemning the Houthi attacks and saying they must be halted immediately, Russia and China abstain, which allowed it to pass. Cowardly. Yeah, no, AAVE Nazis is a real thing, Chad. It's not a joke. You might think it's a joke because it sounds so stupid, but it's real. Um, for real, for real. Um, anyway, so do I have to... Uh, uh, I can't even talk. Do I have to condemn Hamas, Hezbollah, and Khutinis? Shit's getting exhausting? Yes. Houthi general claims to have sank a U.S. ship. Yeah, I don't know about that. The AAV is often done as a form of ridicule. No, I think originally the Nazis did it as a form of ridicule to be like, look at these black people, look at how they speak. And then because it's like everything that black people do is uh, is is cool and it's culture, inevitably, that they unironically started using it. I'm not even kidding. Like so many openly racist, like openly anti-black racist groipers now unironically use African-American vernacular English and say stuff like, bruh, lil bro is out of control, bruh. And then it's like, they're like an actual Nazi. Bro, go watch any Zoomer IRL streamer on kick. Yeah, it's like, bruh, on God. We must defend Christianity on God, bruh, for white children. On a cap. No stack. No kizzy. You were on TikTok too much? No, I'm not on TikTok at all. White people are so weird sometimes, you know? Um... God damn it. What's up with this? Fix yourself camera. There it is. Um, they are, uh, they're moving away from, from Yemen. It's actually outdated to call it AAVE, says young black economists. Academics just call it AAE. There's no reason to put a V in there. It's just more white people weirdness. I mean, I don't know. The U.S. and the U.K. are now bombing, bomb, bombing, bombing Yemen so that the precious Israeli occupation regime can continue its genocide of Gaza and the Western media and political class are cheering it on and celebrating the same ones who demanded every nation on earth do everything for Ukraine. Yeah, like, I guess the analog is basically like, what would you, like, what would we do in this situation? You know what I mean? Like, America already did this against Russia to a certain degree, what Yemen is doing. But if, like, Estonia tried to do this to Russia, right? as Russia was, like, blowing up Ukraine, everyone was celebrated. Everyone be like, oh, thank God there's someone out there that's, like, doing the righteous thing. Do a poll of Americans tonight. Ask them if they know who the Houthis are, where they live, why we are bombing them, and whether the president has the authority under the Constitution to bomb them. Go. Yeah. 30% of GOP voters support bombing Agraba, the city from Aladdin. Kind of ignores the attacks on international, not Israeli shipping, though. Brother, it's a blockade going up the Red Sea. Like, what do you mean? This is the same energy behind, like, I can't believe Hamas is indiscriminately throwing rockets into Israel. That's so messed up. It's like, bro, do you think they have targeted missile systems? Like, what are you talking about? America has a ton of blockades on countries that aren't at war. It, it's not at war with. Yeah. Are you a shipping industry lobbyist? Shattered do you own cargo vessels? No, he's an American who wants to defend America's new bombing campaign. And in order to defend it, he's going to say, what about all the people that are being impacted by the lack of commerce in the Red Sea. It, it, like, uh, Hassan, inflation is genuinely devastating. You do, not have the, you do not have the capacity to understand how devastating the, the food prices are going to look like because uh, a lot of shipping companies have to move their routes away from the Red Sea. 
And then they'll turn around and say, like, and this is all the stuff that's going to the poorest nations or something. You know what I mean? Yemenis are very pride, prideful people. So even uh, even the people in Yemen who don't support the Houthis, whom are a lot, uh, uh, will end up doubling down after this. Yeah. If I'm not wrong, the Houthis haven't killed anybody. No, they haven't. No, they just overtook ships. That's it. Um, the statement from Biden on the airstrikes in Yemen. Gaza, of course, not mentioned once. Statement from President Joe Biden on coalition strikes in Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen. Today, at my direction, U.S. military, together with the United Kingdom and with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands, successfully conducted strikes against a number of targets in Yemen used by Houthi rebels to endanger freedom na of navigation in one of the world's most vital waterways. The strikes are in direct response to unprecedented Houthi attacks against international maritime vessels, vessels in the Red Sea, including the use of anti-ship ballistic missiles for the first time in history. These attacks have endangered U.S. personnel, civilian mar mariners, and our partners jeopardized trade and threaten freedom of navigation. So why are the Houthis doing this? Is a question I would love to ask. Like, why are they implementing a blockade? You know what I mean? Why has America killed more than they have? Because Iran says so? No, man. Not because Iran said so. Why are we equating Western imperialism to Iranian and Russian imperialism? Wait, what? You can't just meme away from the Houthis have done. They've been trying to topple the Yemeni government for 30 years, of which... Uh, had normal relations in the Middle East. Why aren't we talking about Iran sponsoring Shia militant groups all over the Middle East? The rise up against Sunni governments, which are much more in favor of normalization with Western powers in Israel. Not that Sunnis are innocent in killing Shiites, but this is a 1,000-year conflict that's not going to change. I'm done. I can't do this. I, no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. What do you mean, dude? Normalizing with Western powers and, and Israel. What are we talking about? Hello? Are you familiar with Western powers in Israel and what they're doing? You've already, you're, you have America's boot shoved so far up your ass that it's coming out of your fucking mouth when you have this conversation. You just immediately take it for granted. Like, your standard of modernity is how well they get along with two imperial powers in the region, two destabilizing forces in the region that have killed more than anyone else. That is unimaginable. I know it's taken me 11 days to yell at a chatter, but God damn, what a fucking idiotic approach to the subject, dude. That's insane. That's your standard? Wow, I can't believe how good Saudi Arabia is in the region because of how aligned they are with Western powers in Israel, even though they're doing a genocide in Yemen or they conducted it. 11 days it took. If this is your standard of who's a good operative in the region, then yeah, you are morally righteous. Except this is an incredibly idiotic way to assess the situation. Come on, man. How else is there going to be stability? Just genocide all of them. Genocide the Middle East. Permanent third world genocide. How else will there be stability? How else? Is that what your argument is? Brother, please. I beg of you. Okay, just take a deep breath and really think about your output here. Okay, you are a fucking neocon. You might fancy yourself to be a liberal, to be an intellectual, to be above that. But you are no different than a Christian fascist neocon with this way of thinking. You fucking animal. Fuck. Oh, whoever doesn't align with the Western world deserves to get killed and deserves to get slaughtered. That's crazy. Especially... When it's already happening, when what you're talking about is already happening. Want to be morally correct, question mark? Acknowledge the fact that they're all bad, and this whole my team, their team debate is garbage. There's nothing right happening in the Middle East, and the only people suffering are the actual civilians that live day-to-day -day in poverty. Thank you for your big brain take, dude. No, there are morally correct positions to take, okay? Two things that I always have to relitigate with an overwhelmingly American, overwhelmingly Western chat, which will never see... The subjects as real humans, you only care about the civilians in the Middle East, the Muslims, whether they be Shia or Sunni, it doesn't matter. You only care about them when you can use them as a talking point against whatever foreign adversary of the United States of America or Israel, because it's an extension of United States of America's foreign policy interests. Don't come to me with this bullshit. You are no different than the Republican that says, what about our homeless veterans when talking about how immigration must stop? That's it. Two principles. Let me explain to you. Two principles that you should keep with you, coming from a person who's Turkish, okay? When you look at a situation in the Middle East, you look at what the local government is and who the Western forces are. 
never align with the Western forces. An example I tell you all the time is the Turkish coup d'etat, okay? A coup occurred in Turkey. The American-backed forces in that situation was the terrorist cell of Fethullah Gulen. He still lives in the fucking Poconos, by the way, okay? The Muslim cleric Fethullah Gulen had aligned with the CIA. Him and Recep Tayyip Erdogan grew up together, basically, okay? His coalition, his Islamist faction, had basically overtaken the police, the court system, schools, and every facet of government. They slaughtered a ton of Turkish people in that coup d'etat. I can't even go back to Turkey because of all of my criticisms of Erdogan, okay? And yet, I much prefer Recep Tayyip Erdogan to the American puppet. That's how it works, okay? That's it. That's it. This doesn't mean I love Recep Tayyip Erdogan. This simply means that he is better than Fethullah Gülen. That's it. You, on the other hand, living in fucking Langley, make this assessment from your perspective. So as someone who lived there, I can tell you what is what. So when I look at other countries, I look at the regional actor, whoever the regional power player is, and then I look at who is backed by the Western superpowers. And let me tell you, in almost every single case, the overwhelming majority cares about making sure that they can deal with their own problems internally, domestically, okay? That's it. Not the western back powers. That's a principle that you could take home with you. If you want to actually be moral or if you want to be smart about the way you analyze other countries, that's one basic principle that you can take home with you. All of a sudden, magically, you are above, on your foreign policy analysis, you're going to be better off than 90% of people that look at the situation. That's it. That's crazy, man. I hate when people come in here and try to talk about implementing stability by by the metrics of who aligns with America's interests better. Okay? That's crazy. And we're having this conversation at the eve of, like, America and England bombing Yemen. Also, the sectarian point falls apart when you know Hamas ain't Shia. Exactly. That's so funny that people are like, oh, dude, the sectarian conflict has been ongoing for a thousand years years and it's like really that's so crazy because both the houthis and also iran are currently backing the only the the sunni movement that the rest of the sunni leadership do not have the balls to fucking take a stand against this is why this is why and i'm gonna go back to my fast of rage okay my rage fast i'm gonna go back to it after this moment okay okay Uh, this person is completely and utterly missing the point oh my god Oh, my God. Listen, the Houthis may use child soldiers to force women to be brides, but they aren't against the Western hegemony. Brother, why do you think this is a good talking point? Why? We, in Afghanistan, directly align with boy fuckers and allowed it to continue in Afghanistan. Do you care about boy fucking and putting an end to boy fucking? No, you don't. Shut the fuck up, okay? You don't. You don't. My point is always, it doesn't matter if they're good or bad on the same boundaries that you are trying to apply to them, okay? My point is, let the people of Yemen deal with it. But you don't want to do that. You want America to deal with it, okay? The idea, the idea that, like, you would, you have the gall, the audacity, to be like, the women in Afghanistan, like, like, that is the only way that we can genuinely implement stability how stable is afghanistan how stable was afghanistan when america was the world police and it was there how stable was iraq when america was the world police and it was there how stable has this region been has it been good there's not a single instance there is not a single instance where oh my god the people of yemen are starving and can't yes the people of yemen are starving not because of the saudi blockade that was implemented that caused the worst famine in in uh, in at the modern day and age, and it was actually the Houthis stealing the food themselves off of the people of Yemen. I know. You're right. Bro, this is literally identical to the Israeli arguments. They don't have to be good. My point is they don't have to be good. They're not good, okay? You don't have to unconditionally support these people. But you can look at a situation, okay? You would never accept this lesser of two evils excuse if the topic were an American election. That's really cute that you say that, but I literally voted for Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton and will most likely vote for whoever is not Donald Trump. So shut the fuck up. No, I am an incrementalist, and I do end up voting 
for the lesser of two evil every time. You just are a fucking baboon who has been primed into thinking that I'm some, like, dumb America bad guy who literally is some, like, tanky Maoist third worlders or whatever the fuck someone told you. And that's why you came in here and said that, okay? I talk about local organizing. I work with local organizers regularly. I have local, I have community leaders in this community. What have you done? You're probably alt-right three and a half months ago in the forums, doxing your favorite e-celebrity or whatever, and now you're in here portraying yourself as a liberal because you watched a guy do a debate one time and it changed your fucking world. That's how little your convictions are. You have no convictions whatsoever. That's You, you, you lose sight of whatever you believe in like that. And to be fair, it is better for you to be an annoying American imperialist liberal. At least you're like, you know, doing gay imperialism rather than also being homophobic and transphobic. Oh, do people like that exist for real? Yes, they comprise of like 98% of the people that are in this chat right now shitting up a storm. This is why people go, oh, America bad. Oh, that's your only take is America bad. That's U.S. fighter jets were used to carry out tonight's strikes uh, along with uh, ships. We don't know exactly which ones yet, but we do have the name of the submarine that was used. This is a guided missile submarine called the USS Florida. Very notable that the U.S. military is telling us tonight the name of the submarine. And they, both the surface ships and the, tom and, and, uh, the submarine, fired. Who was boy fucking? We don't have to do. Look up, look up pedophilia, Afghanistan, United States of America involvement. Okay, there you go. The well, Afghan coalition forces that we were supposedly training had major issues with pedophilia, and it was happening under our watchful eye, and the American military turned a blind eye to it. There were whistleblowers, and the American military turned a blind eye to it, like with a direct directive. The, the strikes that we saw or the attempted attacks by Yemen uh, just two days ago on Tuesday, the biggest yet involving drones, ballistic, and cruise missiles, was essentially the straw that broke the camel's back. There had been repeated warnings uh, by the U.S. and others to the Houthis uh, to essentially knock it off. We have seen uh, the U.S. carry out responses against Iranian-backed militant groups in Iraq and Syria. We had not yet seen any kind of U.S. response uh, against the Houthis in Yemen. And that is in large part because they do threaten uh, this waterway. But essentially, having choked this off, the U.S. now trying to send the message to the Houthis uh, that they need to back down. They're huh. essentially trying to punch them in the nose, bloody them. Uh, and Yeah, no, dude. This guy this guy is the real moral arbiter here. Con dudes who curse Jews and condemn women brides with a lesser of two evils. This is actually deranged. Keck W. Con dudes. You're doing the thing I told you. I do not give a shit about their fucking politics, okay? I don't care. I don't care what their slogans are. I don't care about any of that, okay? There is one country currently conducting genocide, okay? And another country that is... And another country that is implementing a blockade. America is not fucking bombing Yemen because their logo has cursed the Jews on it. America is bombing Yemen because Yemen is is stopping commerce from flowing through the Red Sea. And the commerce is stopping in the Red Sea specifically because Israel is conducting actions in Gaza that are akin to genocide. Stop saying my hate group is better than the other. What is your solution? Chatter, who has been in here since 2008, who I, I'm glad hasn't f gotten a lobotomy yet, I guess. What is your solution to the situation? Because you're surely celebrating... Uh, blowing up the fucking uh, Yemeni's population. It seems like you like that, so you're championing that. Don't sit here and act like you have a better solution. You can just sit there and say, oh, it's my hate group is better than the other. You you have a hate group. Invade and destroy the Houthi Giga Chad. Yes, you're a pathetic, sniveling little coward who recognizes that his empire is crumbling, and the only thing you can do is cope with the reality that America has done nothing for you, specifically with all of its imperial bounty, so you can think, oh yeah, we can roll over one of the poorest countries on the fucking planet. Good. Congratulations. Congratulations, dumbass. You did it. You're still a pathetic loser who's not going to be able to fucking pay rent. Your boss is going to fuck one girlfriend that you maybe will ever be able to get. And you have no recourse whatsoever. For the rest of your life, you're going to be a fucking pathetic little pleb who goes, That's awesome. We got it, baby. We're killing the Houthis out there. It's so stupid, brother. It is so stupid. There is no, there's no way for you to ever fucking recover from this. This is how desperate... White supremacist Nazis are, okay? You are behaving 
in the exact same way that the jawless, chinless Iowa Nazis behave. Oh, I know I can't, I can't get a job, and I don't want to examine the material conditions. Everyone has told me that as a white man, I'm supposed to be so powerful, and none of that happens, so what must be the real problem? Oh, that's right. I'm going to go dominate black people real quick. I'm going to go act like I am superior to them. I am descendant of the Nord Vikings. But you're not. You're a fucking loser. Just like that fucking Nazi is a loser. You are the exact same kind of loser. Instead of looking for some esoteric, mythical Nordic rune that you want to identify with, you have identified with being an American pig. Being a capitalist warmonger. You don't even have like any kind of mythology associated with it. It is just indiscriminate bombing campaigns done for ExxonMobil. Done for wealthy, powerful individuals that will consistently fuck you. They will fuck you over and over again. You have no identity, so you're grabbing on to what remains of America's industry, the military-industrial complex, and all of its output. That is so sad. Fix your life, chatter. Jesus Christ, dude. Oh, it's wild. Absolutely wild to be riding this hard for American corporations and American imperialism. It doesn't even come back to fucking help you, you idiot. We have no cohesive national identity even. We are literally a patchwork of different corporations. It's like a bunch of corporate towns put together. The only, the only glue that holds Americans together is this like weird American identity of dominating other countries that are way poorer than we are. It's so sad. And every single time, every single time we... Uh, we, we, you know, institute our might. We go overseas and we blow their fucking bases up and, you know, we blow their weapons supplies and we're like, yeah, those guys are the bad guys. You think we're doing something good, but, like, when we steal their natural resources at the end of the day, we you don't even get a crumb of that. Like, what good is this entire imperial project if you can't even get health care? It's nuts. I love the notion of uh, uh, being like, dog, I hate the Houthis because they have child brides. Which is why I want to fucking kill all the child brides with American bombs. Yeah, you know what fixes the child bride situation in Yemen? A tomahawk missile that taxpayers paid for instead of paying for your dumbass diabetes medication, you stupid fuck. God, I hate this shit so much. Yeah, I think if we look back to before... By the way, it literally took like... I thought it was going to take a week. And it straight up took like three and a half minutes for chatters to come chirping and being like... Oh, dude, you don't think blowing up Yemen is good? You must be a defender of child brides. Here's the difference, by the way. No matter where that chatter is ideologically, I still want him to get health care. I still want him to get a better education. I still want him to find meaning in his life. That's the difference. I don't believe that, like, just because someone is a dumbass American Nazi that they deserve to get killed, okay, in his life. That's the difference. I don't believe that, like, just because someone is a dumbass American Nazi that they deserve to get killed, okay? I don't think they should be murdered. I think they should have a meaningful life and no longer have those opinions. The goal is always to try. The goal is always to try and fix the material, the underlying material conditions, so that, so that it is way, way harder to just, like, become a Nazi out of nowhere. This is why they... Involving Saudi allies like the United States uh, uh, and the UK is, seems very likely to, to draw them in over time. And I think to the point that, that, that uh, um, General Wesley Clark was making about the boats, the way that the Houthis actually operate in the Red Sea, as well as firing drones at shipping, the ways that they try to board them, as well as trying to use helicopters, they take oh. over small commercial fishing vessels, sort of, you know, 50, 100 foot type vessels. And then they use those as a sort of a mothership for even smaller boats that will then go out and try to board some of these bigger commercial vessels moving through the Red Sea. So you can blind their ability to see the shipping that's coming um, by hitting the radar sites, which was one of the target packages today. But the actual means with which they go after the shipping is small 
harder to hit and mingles in with regular fishermen who use the regular fishing ports along the coast of Yemen. So this has a possibility to get messy. Um, but uh, clearly the, uh, the, the very strong message has been sent. But I think the idea that the Houthis are going to back down and, and, and pack up and go away quickly, um, I don't think that's what we're going to see at this time. General Clark, uh, to Nick's point about these small vessels, I mean, it, it reminds me a little bit of sort of Somali pirates years ago. Um, obviously, the scale seems to be different on this, and, and the impact of it is, is, is so far different. So is the U.S. response so far. H how difficult is it to for U.S. assets to counter these kind of small boat attacks on and attempts to board uh, international shipping? Well, I think you've got to give the uh, U.S. commanders the mission to do it, put the intelligence on it. We've got lots of resources in the area. We've got helicopters. We can bring in our own special forces. We can bring our, our ships a little bit closer if necessary. Uh, we, can, we can handle this. Now, the key is, of course, there's no guarantee you'll never have any collateral damage. Just as in the case of these strikes, we don't know exactly what the Twitter statue, PFP son, or Ukraine and Israel flag in the Twitter named daughter. Oh, my God. Nah, it's, I'm not having kids. No, I'm throwing them in the river, dog. <laughs> I'm doing a post-birth abortion, which I love doing, as you guys know. Uh, so uh, they're still defiant. The next time, got to be bigger, got to be bolder strike, got to be more comprehensive strike, got to take away not their will, but their capabilities to interfere with the shipping. That's the real goal here. You know, we, we've apologized for two months saying that we, we don't want escalation. We don't want escalation. We've said that enough. But when it comes to it and you have to use military force, you have to use it effectively. And that means getting the escalation dominance so we cut off their ability. I do know his son, yes. We can largely do that. This is uh, C General Wesley Clark. I do know his son. I used to work with him. And uh, Wesley Clark ran for president. He's our woke general, guys. The wokest general of all time. Talking about how, you know, this is a just bombing. And together, Duh. just give us the mission and we'll... Has there ever been a bombing? Here's a good question. Has there ever been a bombing that the American government has conducted... That in real time, in real time, the, the American media said was not good and not just. In real time. They'll say it after, like the Kabul stuff. Like they were like, uh, oopsie, you know. 9-11. Actually, from the U.S., perhaps the U.K. Okay, okay, fair. the countries that back this operation, if this doesn't stop. And he also gives a bit more information about what exactly was targeted. UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned surface vessels. We saw one of those used to try to attack shipping, land attack cruise missiles, and coastal radar and air surveillance capabilities. So the U.S. seems going after the Houthis' ability to monitor their own skies and monitor the sea around the Southern Red Sea, which was where many of their attacks have been focused on international shipping. One other statement that's worth pointing out here, Austin says, a coalition of countries committed to upholding the rules-based international order demonstrated our shared commitment to defending U.S. and international vessels and commercial vessels exercising navigational rights and freedoms from illegal and unjustifiable attacks. The reason I point that out is because normally when you see the U.S. highlighting their action in support of the international rules-based order, <laughs> it is, for example, on the other side of the world in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait vis-a-vis -vis actions from China. Here, the U.S. needing to, to, to put the finger point on that and say, look, this is what we're upholding in carrying out these strikes against the Houthis in Yemen who have targeted... I love watching Consempi manufacturing in real time, dude. Also, it's echoes awesome. language uh, President Biden uh, had used uh, in Yeah, we're using rule-based international order and that's how we're like make no mistake it's our rules <laughs> rule based international order means we make the rules and we give the orders okay so like for example you were like hey genocide is bad right let's say on Allah was like hey uh the genocide of palestinians is bad we are going to implement a blockade in the red sea okay we say, no, genocide is good. We are going to do that. And if you try to stop the genocide in your own little way, we're going to come and blow you up. As the United Nations. Um, Alex Marquardt, is it clear how many U.S. assets were in the region ahead of these strikes and how many non-U.S. assets were involved? 
There are a, a lot of U.S. assets, not just uh, involved in trying to deter a wider conflict, but all across the region more traditionally. Um, we are learning more about the foreign assets, the non-American assets uh, that were also involved in this, notably uh, those Royal Air Force jets uh, from, uh, the, from the Brits. We also know that they have had a destroyer uh, out in the Red Sea as well. So w what we've known in, in terms of this conflict, Anderson, the U.S. has actually reduced the number of U.S. forces uh, that they initially sent out following the October 7th massacre. Initially, there was a carrier strike group, the, the Gerald Ford, which was already in the eastern Mediterranean. And then the USS Eisenhower was sent out to join it. Those two carrier strike groups meant to send a very significant message to Iran and the groups that they back to not escalate the situation. The Ford has actually gone home with its strike group. Uh, there have also been uh, hundreds of American soldiers who were sent out to the Middle East who have also gone home. But make no mistake, still a huge number of U.S. forces uh, dedicated to this Red Sea issue, uh, as well as the broader region. I mentioned the Eisenhower, uh, uh, the Eisenhower carrier strike group. So, of course, there's the aircraft carrier, the Eisenhower. Uh, there are two, three other ships uh, associated with that, one cruiser uh, and two destroyers. And then you have uh, four fighter jet squadrons. You have a helicopter squadron, uh, electronic warfare squadron. So all of those just here dealing with this threat from the Houthis in Yemen. And then more broadly, Anderson, this whole area of command, as it's known, uh, in the Middle East falls under U.S. Central Command. The biggest base there for the U.S. Central Command is right here in Doha. And then you've got the U.S. Fifth Fleet um, that, patrols, that patrols the seas. Um, that is based right here in Bahrain. And then, Anderson, you have thousands and thousands of U.S. troops who are all across the region here in Saudi Arabia, here in Kuwait, here in Iraq and Jordan. So if this were to escalate, it's not like the Eisenhower is on its own dealing with the Houthis. Um, you also have all of these U.S. forces, all of these U.S. assets and bases all across the region who are ready to respond. Again, the U.S. goal tonight was to de-escalate. Now, whether the Houthis see it that way, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, there, there certainly is an expectation that there could be a response, uh, but I would agree with General Clark. Uh, there are assets in place uh, to deal with that response, Anderson. General Breedlove, uh, the Houthi Deputy Foreign Minister just issued a statement saying in part, quote, our country was subjected to a massive aggressive attack by American and British ships, submarines and warplanes. And America and Britain will undoubtedly have to prepare to pay a heavy price and bear all the This is the escalation, this guys. This is a de escalatory bombing. Wondering what you make of that it's statement. Famous. And more importantly, what is the Houthis' ability to project uh, power to make attacks beyond just in the shipping lanes in the, in the Red Sea? So, uh, Anderson, it's a great question. You cannot dismiss their ability to uh, wreak havoc in other places of the world. Um, and we will have to reestablish, as several of your discussants have already mentioned tonight, we're going to have to reestablish our position to be able to block and prevent and, where required, attack those capabilities. Um, this is much like what we have seen in Ukraine, and we are going to face some of the same problems in uh, the South China Sea and with North Korea. These uh, people are all connected in watching how America <laughs> dude, deals dude, it's with the problems chatter. overseas. And, it's the uh, chatter and from earlier, dude. Them. And remember that we are deterred. Bro, this is my chatter. The initiative in Ukraine, largely because of Mr. Putin's statements about widening the war and nuclear uh, expansion. So what did the Houthi leader do today? He threatened us with a wider war and so, so forth, expecting that we might be deterred at that point. Mm -hmm. I think, again, that thankfully, this may be the first rounds of reestablishing deterrence and retaking the initiative rather than being reactive in these kind of conflicts. Nick, what do you make of, of the Houthis' abilities? 
I think they're somewhat of an unpredictable actor uh, in this environment because they have seemed to act in many occasions quite irrationally. It has a rationale to them and undoubtedly has a rationale to their sponsors in Tehran. But uh, their ability to do the unexpected I don't think can be underestimated. For a number of years until uh, uh, China got with Saudi and Iran. U.S. UK airstrikes get, on uh, Iran backed militants in Yemen. Houthis were warned to stop attacks on commercial shipping in Red Sea. Year ago now, um, the Houthis were That's really the active in on. firing cruise missiles into Saudi Arabia, not just short missiles over the border to port cities like Jazan, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles to the capital uh, of, of Riyadh. Uh, and this was going on over a number of years. So they do have the capability to reach. They've also uh, sent, they've claimed to have sent drones uh, into U the UAE as well, crashing at one time into one of the airports there. Um, so their ability to do the unexpected, I, I believe, cannot be underestimated. And their, and, and their persistence in taking up what, uh, you know, this, this support of the people of Gaza, um, which, is, which is new to them. It's, it's not something that made a big issue out of in the, in the past. Yes, it was, but it's not been a big issue. Um, their, their ability to, to give unexpected reasons and rationale and do the unexpected uh, can't be overlooked. Um, uh Remember, chatters, every single thing I said about Palestine was 100% correct. Many people yelled at me at the time, okay? Many people yelled at me at the time. They're like, Hassan, I can't believe you're saying this is genocide. I can't believe you're saying this is genocidal. We found out that that was the case, okay? This is also unacceptable. I'm not saying it's genocidal, but I do think it's unacceptable. And it also is senselessly escalating. The correct way for those of you in the upcoming days that will ask, well, what would you have done? The correct way to deal with this is by stopping Israel's genocide in Gaza. Okay? I'm feeling overwhelmed by all this. Being from the Mena region, can you give us a recap of what's going on, actually? And where do you think this is going? A potential war on the whole of Middle East? I don't know. Mark Ames says, U.S. waged war on Yemen for seven years from 2015 to 2022, killed hundreds of thousands of Yemenis, and ended a humiliating defeat with the Houthis far stronger than before the war. Somehow this bombing in defense of Israel's genocide is supposed to produce better results. Ridiculous draw up uh, what the possible plans were for uh, retaliation and then he directed his defense secretary Taking secretary Austin of to this carry this for the next time you try to say you don't cover breaking right news now, please don't uh, ban by me the US uh, and the UK so uh, again more oh my god I've talked about this before if there is like an ongoing conflict yes I cover it I do it I cover it I don't know why I watch you for Bracken news like I'm not making additional I'm not making additional speculations that the American government hasn't said so far. <sighs> anyway, did you cover Ansar Allah's statement? This is, uh, oh, this is from today. Okay. America and Britain made a mistake in launching the war on Yemen because they did not benefit from their previous experiences. Had it not been for Bush's foolishness in pushing Ali Saleh to attack us in Saada in 2004, the Yemeni people would not have launched the 2014 revolution that ended the rule of the American ambassador in Sana'a and expelled the Marines from it. Had it not been for the foolishness of America and Britain in pushing Saudi Arabia and the UAE to declare war on us in 2015, Yemen would not have been able to today carry out its religious, moral, and humanitarian duty in supporting Palestine. There is no doubt that America and Britain today regret their previous follies, and soon they will realize that direct aggression against Yemen was their greatest folly of their history. So, the thing is, like, I mean, they do talk a big game. They do talk a big game, but honestly, they, they follow through on it. I mean, they're crazy. I don't think there's a distraction from the ICJ chatters. I think they've been pushing this for a while. They've been gearing up for this for a while. They're similar to the ones... Oh, here. This is Yahya Sari, uh, spokesman of the Yemen's, uh, Yemen's armed forces. Here. If we look at the crimes being committed in Gaza, this is uh, from December 19th. They're similar to the ones that were committed against us in the past nine years. Bombarding hospitals, they bombarded our hospitals. Bombarding markets, they bombarded our markets. Bombarding schools, they bombarded our schools. Bombarding roads, people while they're soundly sleeping in their homes. Just like it happened to us. It's the same aggressor, the same American bombs being poured on Gaza, or the same ones being poured on us in Yemen. The aggressor is one. The aggressor is one. The leader of it is one. America.
The one who led the aggression to Yemen is the same one who's leading it in Palestine. The majority were saying, strike Israel, we dare you. We strike them. They said, seize a ship, we dare you. We seized one and took it to our port in Hodeida. It greatly honors us that we mobilize against the enemy. That we are confronting the Zionist enemy who is aggressing on Palestine and our homeland. We will continue to confront the American Israeli enemy until the aggression in Gaza stops. This is a very important part. We will confront the American uh, Israeli enemy until the aggression on Gaza stops. <coughs> As for the battle in our homeland, we are, God willing, fully prepared and ready for anything from the enemy. If Saudi and Emiratis think, even think of leading an aggression on us, commanded by Israel and USA, we are present and ready. They've tried us for nine years. If they want to do it again, we're here and we're ready. As for America and Israel, if they attack our homeland, they will commit foolishness they've never committed before. The response will be fierce from the people and the armed forces. We are with our brothers in Palestine and Lebanon in facing Israel because they're our greatest enemy. We didn't say death to America with our heads turned. We are serious about it. Yeah, I mean, look, their their goals are pretty clear from day one. This is like, um, yeah, see, Houthis are one of the most corrupt people. Their people are starving and they decide to use all their money to stop ships. They themselves kill the Yemeni people. Uh, Palestinians are one of the most corrupt people. Hamas is one of the most corrupt institutions. They use all their money to stop Israel when they themselves are the ones who are responsible for the uh, Palestinians dying, copy-paste, Abdul HH. Oh, that's the other part. There's going to be a lot of Sunni uh, regional uh, guys in here uh, that are going to be chirping as well. That'll be like, listen, I'm Muslim. I, I'm, I'm, I'm Saudi. Like, you don't understand. I'm, uh, you'll be seeing a lot of that too. Uh, anyway. That previous tweet just lied and you had zero idea. Yemen's internal divisions along with economic and political challenges play the crucial role in triggering the conflict, but you don't care because America bad. Yemen experiencing widespread poverty, disease, and a severe lack of essential supplies due to a blockade imposed by coalition forces is just whatever. Because America bad guys? Wait, what? Like, what are you talking about? Ultimately, incredibly lame, nonetheless, you know? A lot of Yemenis believe Houthis are not the best and are corrupt in their own sense, but still most can agree that they are not the greater enemy America and Saudi is. Thank you. That's simply my point. My point is always that many people, you can always find someone who will dick ride America. Go to Turkey. You're going to find, you're going to find like Kurdish people, for example, or even Turkish people as well. That will be like, no, America really good. Actually, what are you talking about? So much better, so much better than the current situation. You go to Iran. There are you know, Shaw writers, which is uh, pretty crazy. Most of, the, most of the Iranians in diaspora are like that. A lot of the Iranians in diaspora are like that, sorry. But then you have the Shaw writers in Iran still, okay? They write them. They write them super hard. And they say the most embarrassing stuff you've ever heard in your entire life. It's the classic, like, I am Iranian. You need to glass. You need to glass Iran, my friend. We want the monarchy back. Like, that's the, that's the type of energy that you get. But overall... Most people understand, even if they absolutely despise their own current government, as I do for Turkey, they recognize that the American government's involvement is going to be far worse for the country's future. That's it. America's gravest mistake, which is not even a mistake, it's a deliberate attempt, but America's worst problem is that it has never allowed these countries to develop their own political movements without interference. That is an issue. So because of that issue, a lot of these nations have become infinitely more reactionary as a consequence of that Western involvement because everybody goes, no, don't touch that shit. What are you talking about? Now we can't even fight our own battles. I know this, once again, from Turkey. Okay? America's coup in Turkey literally gave Erdogan a lifeline and another 10, 15 years of mandate. Okay? It did. Erdogan changed, directly changed the constitution by referendum, meaning a majority vote gave Erdogan the power to change the Turkish constitution from a parliamentary system to a presidential one. In the aftermath of that coup, there was martial law instituted. This happens all the time. And Americans don't want to listen to someone who is actually from a country like this or don't want to listen to someone who even looks like them, sounds like them, loves America, lived in America for, you know, 10 years plus, 
They don't want to listen to anybody. They just want to listen to whoever is going to tell them everything America is doing is actually good and righteous ultimately. They're trying their very best. To the question that this person asked, which I said uh, uh, earlier is going to be a question asked many times over the coming week. What do you propose the West do about the current superintendent tax then honest question? It's a very easy answer. You ask why it is happening. Why are there why is there a blockade implemented in the Red Sea by the Houthis? The answer is because of Israel's actions in Gaza. The Houthis have said that the attacks on the ships, which are by the way, like, you know, they're not you know, they haven't killed anyone and they're not supposed to like the goal isn't to like kill people who are on the shipping routes, it's to take over the ships. Okay? But the goal is to stop Israel's actions in Gaza, stop Israel's ethnic cleansing in Gaza. What America is supposed to do is, in good faith, show the rest of the world that it is actually trying to rein Israel in and stop Israel's actions. That's it. You do that, it's a win-win. I know, but just donate and check your tilt to link for Palestine. Almost 1.2 million raised is amazing. Let's fucking go. Turkish patriots will always say that opportunistically siding with America is good this time. For the 100th time, they side with the U.S. Nationalists will always side with the U.S. when push comes to shove, like aiding the U.S. invasion of Iraq. But when we defend the human rights, we are siding with the U.S. and the West interests. Yeah. There is a big difference. I don't think I, don't think I can get this across. At a fundamental level, I do not believe that America is interested in the Middle East with honest and good intentions. That's it. I don't believe that. And I think there's enough historical there's enough historical precedent that backs this sentiment. I don't think it's good. America's involvement in the Middle East has always been bad. Almost every other country that's outside of the Middle East and its involvement in the Middle East has always been bad. Russia included, or if you want to consider Afghanistan to be a, another part of it, I guess. I loop Afghanistan into the conflict in the MENA region as well, even though, you know, it's Asia. Ansar Allah... Uh, is a syncretic movement, much like Hezbollah, that's mostly united on Hezbollah, that's mostly united on nationalism and anti-Western sentiment, is reductions to call them Islamists or a militia force. They are very much the state exercising its own sovereignty and acting as a genocide. Yeah. I don't get how you are denying the corruption of Houthis. I am literal Yemeni, and I have seen with my eyes how corrupt they are. Look how Yemen is right now. I agree that they have the right to defend themselves, but they should focus on their own people. That is what I meant. I support Palestine. I support Yemen and his right to defend itself, but I don't support Houthis who are destroying the Yemen population. <laughs> Saudi stopped a long time ago and have attempted to create a treaty. Yeah, Saudi didn't attempt to create a treaty. Israel, uh, or not Israel, what am I saying? China. China created a treaty between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which ended the blockade. Anyway, the U.S. and U.K. are not unhappy with Yemen because an Iranian-backed militia is ruling it. They're unhappy because for the first time since the 70s, Yemen has now a government dedicated to an anti-imperialist doctrine with respect to the sacrifices made by prior generations. The people of Yemen didn't struggle against colonialism and feudal dystopia for decades to be caged in a system of crippling IMF-imposed austerity and U.S. Navy vessels patrolling their backyard. They didn't struggle only for their life to be at the mercy of rotten WFP aid. Whether you like it or not, the objective reality is Yemen now acts as an independent state for the first time in God knows how long. Its political decisions are independent. Its military is in a constant state of readiness, and it doesn't bow to threats of any kind. One of the, pro one of the things is, like, there's not, a lot of ga there's not a lot of actors in town, like... There's regional actors that you can go to, and if you're not gonna if you're not gonna be with America, then uh, you're you're going to work with someone who's against America, and the regional actors that are positioned against America more often than not are gonna be like Iran, or Russia or China. Does that make sense? World's world's best honey pot right here. Carry on baddies. Says, yep, smoke. Reminder that 130 people, including eight Americans, are still hostages. Hashtag Israel. America, F yeah, all in Lockheed Martin. Finish the job, America. Iran next. Rip the Band-Aid off. One more time for the back now. Remember that 130 people, including eight Americans, are still hostages. Oh, hi, YouTube. Lol, lol, give them hell. Shove their turds in. I love the idea of, of claiming that you care about the hostages that are in Gaza right now while simultaneously backing America's bombing campaign and clear escalation in the region without, like, asking Israel to please stop bombing the hostages, which immediately demonstrates... By the way, every single one of these accounts are, like, prior to 2017 created accounts, prior to 2019 created accounts, and I suspect that they are coming from, like, the, the, the underbelly, the deep, dark 
underbelly of Twitch, like Justin TV watchers. You know what I mean? Like, like we got the most. Remember when I said it's it's um. Remember when I said it's either going to be like thirty five year old uh shut in IT guys or like sixteen year old uh, Zoomers who watch like TikTok debates and stuff. So now they think they know what's going on. That's the poll. That's the poll Chan guy. That's the 45-year-old IT guy who's like, you know, I used to be a Gamergate guy, but now I'm not. I'm actually a liberal, but I still maintain a lot of those same uh, a, a lot of those same positions. Why do you target IT? Who else is going to watch you doing work? I mean, I have much love for the IT people, and I have much love for the 35-year-olds that are watching. It's just that there's a very specific type of 35-year-old uh, or 45-year-old who basically fancies themselves to be like this intellectual giant who says things like, I'm an autodidact, as a matter of fact. And what are you actually autodidacting? Uh, that's right, I'm, I'm reading Wikipedia pages every now and then to develop my perspective on this matter. Uh, and also, I will not be implementing any sort of moral position on this and simply repeat whatever I saw on CNN and a Chiron. That's right, America's enemies are bad and America good. Destroy our enemies. Make no mistake, the continuation of warfare is probably taking my attention away and, and taking... Uh, my amenities that I should be getting, that I should be fighting for, but I'm too busy thinking that America's military might somehow translates to me being mighty because I have nothing else going on in my life. Okay? That's the point. People think America's military might, America's military prowess is a proxy for them personally. I might be a fucking loser in my life. I might not have anything else going on in my fucking life. Right. But at least America is ripping dicks off in the Middle East. And that makes me feel good for a brief moment, because if I don't think about that, then I have to be forced to think about the fact that I don't have health care. If I lose my IT job that I fucking despise, I'm not going to be able to pay for health care because the only patchwork solution to my health care that is currently tied to my fucking place of employment is a is a, a patchwork solution called Cobra that requires me to pay at least $700 on average a month for the same fucking healthcare that I should be getting for free, okay? And that's a really sad place to exist in. So instead of fucking, you know, keeping your eye on the ball and being pissed off at the right shit, you just go, I'm duking it out right now. I'm, I'm going and yelling at this fucking dude, Hassan, who hates America, but in a way that's like different than reactionary scumbag Republicans. I'm doing that in a way where I'm actually a liberal, right? So I'm smarter. Was the ripping off dicks a Jew joke? It was good. First of all, I'm Muslim and we also do Sunnet, which is we also circumcise. No, it wasn't a fucking Jew joke. You're banned, by the way. It's disgusting. <sighs> You're not changing anything. You're not moving the needle, and you're not going to feel that good tomorrow. You might get this. You might get a feeling of, like, a, a, a hollow victory out of this, but ultimately you're losing. When will Americans grow up and realize that this is not in their interest? You still don't have health care, paid parental leave, 30 days paid, 30 days paid holidays, children money, uh, free college education, or anything else all those other countries have. You just have wars that make a few men richer. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. It might feel good for a brief moment that you feel like you've actually bested someone in this intellectual battle, but ultimately these are forces beyond our control. I'm just trying to make sense of the senseless violence for you for a brief moment while also trying to keep your eyes on the prize, okay? No matter how hard you try to justify what's going on here in Yemen as an act of good, it's not. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help anybody. The only people that it will help is... Uh, I don't know, some executives, some corporate executives at Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and the like. But it's not going to help you. Even if you work at one of those companies, it's not going to help you because you don't even see the benefits, okay? Those benefits don't even trickle down to you personally. So you keep chirping away into the void, not realizing that the only thing that remains for you is basically the, the notion that America is dominating people globally. I'll try to personalize this in a way that is um, understandable for people because everyone has experienced like kindergarten, right? When you were a kid, there's a bully on the playground, okay? The bully is hitting all these other kids, maybe you as well. He's putting fear in your heart. In that very moment, you would think, you know, fuck this guy. This guy's a piece of shit. But oftentimes, 
if you can rise above that, you will recognize that that bully is behaving in that way because the bully probably has problems at home. They have nothing else going on, okay? They have nothing else going on in their life, so they, all they have is dominance. America is kind of like that bully, and you have the opportunity to go, that's not all right, or you have the opportunity to go, actually, you know what? That is very good. I feel more powerful when I see him do that for me. You know what I mean? You say America should not be happy with our government wasting their tax money bombing the Middle East. Why do you dismiss the Yemeni chatter that doesn't want their Houthi government wasting their money bombing ships on the strait? Beautiful question. Thank you very much. The Houthi government that you are talking about is utilizing resources that is getting from Iran for the most part, okay, on Red, uh, Red Sea, which is uh, Red Sea commercial traffic that is happening in its backyard. America is using our tax dollars to go fuck those guys up 8,000 miles away, okay? And the reasoning for why they're doing it is a just reason. If America was implementing a blockade on Israel, okay, I would be there for that. I would say that's a very good thing. Obviously, it's a laughable notion. It'll never happen. But if you can't make the distinction, if you can't comprehend the difference between someone doing the morally righteous act of trying to, with the very limited resources, in, in uh, trying to participate in the end to a genocide, and the other person actually contributing to said genocide, I don't know what else to tell you about that. Okay? There's a difference between good things and bad things. Are the Houthis bombing ships? I mean, they drop drones and stuff on the ships in order to overtake them. I think, though, the ships that they actually do lob missiles at are, like, American vessels, though, not commercial vessels. Holy shit, Hassan is pro-Iran? No, I am not pro-Iran. I am pro-ending the genocide in Gaza. What sanctions do you think will be imposed on U.S. after this act of senseless aggression invading a much smaller country? Lol, okay. Uh, how about no sanctions? <sighs> what do you predict happens next? I don't know. Remember when Biden said this? As president, I will use military power as a last resort. We will not go back to forever wars in the Middle East. Ah, that's sick. Saudi Foreign Ministry Statement on the Strikes of Yemen. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is closely monitoring with great concern the military operations in the Red Sea region and the airstrikes that have targeted several locations in the Republic of Yemen. Okay, the real, the real big dick boys in the room are supposed to be the guys who ended the blockade. China. What will they do? Anyway... You love chat? Yes. I, I love my community. At the end of the day, uh, I, I believe that no matter how reactionary one may be when they first come into this chat, that if they stick around, I know when I pop off really aggressively, right? Uh, maybe that pushes away some people who feel like they're also attacked. But I believe that no, if you sit here and listen long enough, you will recognize that I'm not coming at this issue from a place of hatred, okay? Even when it comes to America, I'm coming at this issue from a place of serving you the top of the hour ad breaks, which I've forgotten to do for the past two hours. That's the real place uh, where I'm coming from because at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. If you no longer want to, Don, don't get paid the lie. Yeah, I mean, I don't. As a matter of fact, and I've briefly brought this up, according to at least, uh, let's just say my coverage on Israel and, and uh, Gaza has... Uh, made its way to brand partners that uh, feel like it's too hot, okay? Not that it matters, ultimately, because I'm not, I'm not actually, uh, you know, sponsored by, by brands. It's not all that significant in the grand scheme of things. It's my community that keeps me afloat and, and gives me all of the independence, the editorial independence that I have, which is ironic because people will then also say, I'm far too harsh on my community, and also, simultaneously, they will say, I'm too beholden to the whims of my community that keep me afloat. So I don't know which one it is. Maybe, maybe I just have these opinions. And if I have strong opinions, I just tell you how it is. Oh, no, he's not going to play get to play Gotham Knights too. Anyway, in good news, in some good news, okay, the Come Extraction Squad has been in operation in Israel, and they've been quite successful. I know a lot of you probably forgot about the goon squad, okay? The old team six, the goon platoon, okay? That's right. According to Con News, about 100 sperm extractions 
have been performed from soldiers and civilians who were killed since the beginning of the war. Lieutenant Colonel Nathali Berda from the IDF Casualty Department revealed to the Knesset Health Committee that until yesterday, about 70 sperm extractions were performed from cavities. What? Oh, God. Okay, I'm going to read that again. 70 sperm extractions were performed from cavities. Oh, since the beginning of the ground maneuver in Gaza, in total, since the outbreak of the war, 88 extractions were conducted from fallen soldiers and another 10 from civilians. Devil works hard, but the IDF goon platoon works harder. Goddamn. I wonder if it mistranslated from cadavers. Yeah, that could be the case. Cavities equals dead bodies is a bad translation. Okay. I'm on this unit, and I really wish you would stop mocking us. My jaw hurts, and you're undermining my hard work. I don't think Israel is fascist, but this is actual fascist shit. First of all, yes, it is. It is fascist shit, and Israel absolutely is fascist. What are you talking about? I've had an actual Israeli Knesset member unironically use those words here. Ofer Kasif said exactly those, th th those words. He's the one who used those words. Yes. If Israel is not fascist, I don't know which country you could point to to say is, like, currently fascist. Qatari dancer, thank you for the 100 gifted subs. Anyway. <sighs> My mom says Israel is fascist because they have elections. Okay. Who doesn't have elections? Guys, Russia has elections. I'm pretty sure the Democratic People's Republic of Korea has elections. Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> Like, yeah, Nazi Germany had elections. Like, there's elections, dog. That doesn't that that doesn't mean all that much, honestly. Russia is hosting elections while Zelensky banned all other parties. Yeah, dude. Uh, except like, you know, Zelensky not being able to hold elections makes sense. Come on. As much as I like dunking on everybody involved, like half of his country is under Russian occupation. What is he how are they supposed to conduct elections, dog? What are they supposed to do? I know, I know he banned, like, the pro-Russian and Russian-adjacent parties and the leftist parties and stuff, I know. Except, once again, they're invaded. Like, I, I, I give a little bit more leeway to countries that are, you know, currently being invaded, actively being annexed, okay? Same principle behind, like, my, uh, like my less charitable approach to, to freedom of speech restrictions in China versus my more charitable approach to freedom of speech restrictions in Cuba. Also, Russian elections are a joke, too, but that's funny that you brought that up. Not that it matters. Uh, a senior official in the White House said in a briefing to reports of the various options for an attack in Yemen were presented to President Biden in a meeting with the heads of the security establishment last Tuesday. At the end of the meeting, the president approved the attack plans last night, Thursday, and president approved the plans and gave Defense Secretary Austin the final order to attack. Wait, I thought Austin was still in the hospital. The official in the White House stated that the purpose of the attacks was to damage specific military capabilities of the Houthis so that they could not continue attacks against vessels in the Red Sea. We take no desire to escalate the situation in the region. This was a significant operation. We expect that it will reduce the Houthis' ability. But we will not be surprised if there's a reaction on their part, said the senior official in the White House. The White House official stated that the U.S. carried out the attacks to keep a central axis of international maritime trade open and to protect freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. <laughs> Hassan is living it up, always shitting on DPRK, now defending only leftist parties being banned. This is chat. This is it, chat. Yeah, dude. No, my point is, if you are under attack, you, you sometimes engage in what is known as power grabs, okay? Or, or a consolidation of power. It's like the most normal thing that every government does. What you're supposed to look at in that situation is, who is the, the person who is more wrong in this circumstance, Okay. Is it Zelensky or is it the country attacking the Disney's nation? Okay. And I feel like Russia is uh, bears more of a responsibility there. Now there's a difference between that and like America in the aftermath of nine 11, right? Which was bad. Nine 11. Just let's actually sit here. And I said, Zell Disney is a Chapo reference. I apologize. Mickey mouse rings. Zell Disney. Um, my brain is broken. Guys, let's talk about 9-11. That's it. I have no point on it. I just want to say 9-11 because I feel like that hits. Okay? It hits. Yeah. Just 9-11. 9-11. 9-11. 
Okay, anyway, the point was, after 9-11, the Patriot Act and all of the other things that came as a consequence of that were bad and should not have been done, but that's a little bit different than, that's a little bit different than, like, being actively invaded. You know what I mean? Anyway, the American officials at the Houthis claim that their attacks are related to the situation in Gaza. This is baseless. They claim that they attack ships that are connected to Israel. This is not true. Most of the ships that were attacked have nothing to do with Israel. In any case, this is not a justification for these attacks that threaten the whole world. I see. Wait, what? That threatened the whole world? Wait, what? Oh, dude, the Houthis have a weapons of mass destruction. I heard they have a nuke. We've got to deal with it immediately. A senior U.S. military official said that the attacks were carried out using missiles launched from destroyers and submarines of the U.S. Navy as well as using fighter jets. According to him, in the attack, precision weaponry was used to destroy specific targets to prevent harm to civilians. The forces involved in the attack are ready to defend ourselves in the face of a response of the huts. We need to condemn the Houthi to save the whole world. Yeah. It's just chill. It's just chill because it's like, again, they're the bad guys. You know what I mean? God, my conscience is clear. I love being an America defender. Yeah. The Houthis are Hamas, which is also Chaisis. But also somehow ISIS is now good. That's right. Did you guys see the fucking uh, uh, Zionist poster on TikTok that was like, that was talking about how like, even even ISIS is condemning Hamas. It was so awesome. We got to watch that video. Bombing Yemen on the 1st of Rajab is one of the dumbest things anyone's ever done. The Houthis may have just gained the support they needed to rally the entire country behind them in a battle with renewed religious overtones. Oh, here. This is it. This is it. This is it, I think. Yeah. Yes, yes. I love the tone. I love the tone. She sounds like the Israeli sketch. Like, what was it called? The Israeli SNL. She sounds like one of the ladies on Israeli SNL. When even ISIS condemns you, you know you got a problem. Yesterday, an ISIS Daesh spokesperson condemned Hamas for using the Gazan population as sacrifices for Iran's interests. Do you not understand? Like, what? What are you doing? This doesn't make you look good. This doesn't. This doesn't make Israel look good at all. That that what? <laughs> like <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> yeah, you know who else ISIS condemns? America. Like all the time. You don't hear me going, ISIS condemns America and they're based for that reason. Because I'm not a fucking idiot. You might be though. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, under no circumstances did you ever have to hand it to ISIS, actually. A lot of people did. I think ISIS has condemned the USA. No. A lot of people did say exactly that, though. What? Who is saying ISIS is based? I'm sorry. I, like, if you say ISIS is based, you're an idiot, okay? I'm sure there's, like, American LARPers. But even, no, actually, when I think about that, even the worst, even the worst, like, JD Pond, permanent first world genocide, Andy Larper, like still doesn't say like ISIS is based actually. <laughs> London Muslims, stop. Oh, oh, you were thinking about the, oh yeah, you were thinking about the Osama bin Laden. Okay, that's another, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a little bit overblown in my opinion. I don't think there were like that many people that were like, Osama bin Laden is dope actually. Maoist party of Italy supported ISIS, I think. Fucking awesome. <laughs> Oh, that's so, that's so dope. That's my favorite type of, like, esoteric leftism is, like, the weird, uncritical, like, the, the, the guys who are, like, critical support to everyone that is trying to destroy Western empire, okay? It doesn't matter what the methods means or what the overarching goals are. Like, I don't even care if they're, like, a, an intelligence asset, Okay. If they're anti-America, I'm there. I love Italian Maoism. It's better than getting your rocks off with a girl. Main Trotskyist party in Brazil, too. That's awesome. Okay, that's sick. I take it back. <laughs> it's sick. ISIS is doing a permanent uh, international revolution. The Salafist Italian sect of Maoism. This is a, that's what ISIS's ultimate goal was. Uh, that an accelerationist third world revolution or a permanent international revolution. Okay. Let's continue. So I, I, 
All those the fake laughter. We got to do it again. You got, you got a problem. Yesterday, an ISIS Daesh spokesperson condemned Hamas for using the Gazan population. An ISIS Daesh spokesperson condemned Hamas for using the Gazan population. As sacrifices for Iran's interests. By the way, it's also, you know, not lost on me that it's that fucking fascist dumbass Visa Grad 24 account. <laughs> Oh, that's so crazy, girl. Girl, they are slaying, you know what I mean? The official spokesperson of ISIS, Abu Hudaifa al-Ansari, has released a speech condemning Hamas for sacrificing the people of Gaza on the altar of Iran's regional project. Bro, you see stuff like this, and then you're like, I, I'm sorry. Like, I, I don't agree with the Iranian government, but come on, dude. Like, who? Wh what's going on here? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think they're better than ISIS. I don't think that's controversial. Like, what do, what do you want? So, also, Iran, you can't put the kh sound in front of it, which is a big W for Iran. You can do it for the Houthis, and you can do it for Hezbollah, okay? And you do it for Hamas, but you can't do it for Iran. You know, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound the same. Big W for Iran, okay? Hezbollah. I, I, um... <laughs> All those people supporting Hamas and calling them freedom fighters, <laughs> resistance. Wait, <laughs> dude, what are you saying? Why are you aligning voluntarily with ISIS? This is like one of those tweets that you should have deleted, not like highlighted as a as a major W. She's out here being like an ISIS W. Thank you, ISIS. Why did you not? You don't have one friend. Like, you couldn't ask one friend before you before you posted this? Like, what's happening? Even ISIS openly and publicly recognizes what you fail to see, that all of the tragic death in Gaza only ones to blame are Hamas. Because... Yeah, ISIS and Israel doing the same propaganda should be, like, something that you immediately recognize and try to delete from existence. Not highlight and promote, okay? Like, especially, especially right as they, uh, you know, uh, did a terror attack, or at least claimed a terror attack in Iran, it's very odd. Like, that should cause you to re-examine your position. Or, at the very least, like, understand that what they're saying is just stupid. Like, they hate, I guess, Iran more than they hate Israel, and, and that's, like, their main enemy. Hamas makes Israel do genocide is not a good take. Well, well, it's not a good take. And guess who made it? Uh, Israel and also ISIS. You know she asked Brayden and Kaylee and they thought she was cooking? They're the ones that waged war on Israel on October 7th. They're the ones who broke ceasefire. They did it with the CNN strategy, knowing that Israel would retaliate, there would be lots of death, and then Israel would get condemned around the world. Even ISIS sees right through it with you, educated in the west fail to see because you're blinded by anti-semitism <laughs> isis on the other hand has been able to overcome their anti-semitism that's so sick yeah the cnn strategy is you know we can't stop ourselves from doing an ethnic cleansing this is like when the republicans were saying even the taliban is anti-abortion what anti-abortion i don't even think the taliban is anti-abortion by the way but when are you done covering the destruction of yemen are, are you going to touch on the destruction of Jason Withlock? Oh, yes. <laughs> ISIS slayed and is serving cunt. <laughs> oh, yeah. ISIS historically very accepting of other religions, even like its own religion. Seen it, Iran official. Israel's Mossad created ISIS. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Okay, listen. Look. You need to talk about the Taylor Swift PSYOP? Yes. The reason you don't see Israel or Turkey fighting ISIS is the same reason you don't see Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus sitting in the same room. Well... Both Israel and Turkey at different moments have, like, been attacked by ISIS, um, but but also have supported ISIS, like, offered support to ISIS. Critical support, like the Italian Maoists, though. Maybe she's just an Italian Maoist. Have you guys thought about that? No, you haven't, okay? Yeah, the real... The real accelerationist position, the third world is accelerationist position, is to be pro-Israel, okay? First world. Right? That's real accelerationism. Oh, a lot of you sweeties talk about permanent first world genocide. And then when uh, and, and then one country is like guaranteeing it, you don't want to accelerate so that that 
stage occurs. I'm just saying. Yes, I'm a Posadas. Yes, I support Israel. Well, that one makes sense if you're a Posadas. All right, let's um, let's move on to some bigger and better things. Here is a uh, an Adila Hasim uh, uh, fan cam. Thank you, Toxic SJW, for that. All right, let's move on. Who sent this to you? Why did you make it is the real question. Why do you ask who sent this to you and not why did I make this? Anyway, let's get to the real news, folks. Wait, what? Mao literally wanted to get rid of Italians? In November in November 1957, Mao visited Moscow again, this time to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. He shocked his audience of communist leaders with outrageous remarks about nuclear war, seemingly accepting that half the world's population would perish, but that socialism would, in the end, prevail. At a banquet, Palmiro Togliatti, the leader of the Italian Communist Party, asked Mao, and how many Italians would survive an atomic war? Mao calmly replied, none at all. But why do you think that Italians are so important to humanity? An interpreter noted that Mao did not even crack a smile. <laughs> That's awesome. That's, that's so weird. My man, my man has has not given up on the noodle pasta dynamic, okay? He was like, we invented noodles, and then you motherfuckers were running around for literally centuries acting like, acting like your pasta was shit, okay? Sorry, you're dying in nuclear holocaust, okay? That's it. Oh. <laughs> Mao is afraid of phobia. Went unexamined for a very long time. <laughs> okay, let's get to the real story of the day. Why is Taylor Swift everywhere, asks Jesse Waters. Sorry, Gutfeld. She's been blanketed across the sports media entertainment atmosphere. The New York Times just speculated she's a lesbian. And last year's tour broke Ticketmaster. I gotta pee. A tour that's revenue tops the GDP of 50 countries. I mean, I like her music. She's all right. But, I mean, have you ever wondered why or how she blew up like this? Well, around four years ago, the Pentagon Psychological Operations Unit floated turning Taylor Swift into an asset during a NATO meeting. What kind of asset? A PSYOP for combating online misinformation. Listen. You came in here wanting to understand how you just go out there and counter an information operation. Well, the idea is that social influence can help, uh, can help uh, encourage or... Uh, promote behavior change, so potentially as like a peaceful information operation. I include Taylor Swift in here because she's, um, you know, she's a fairly influential online person. I don't know if you've heard of her. Yeah, that's real. The Pentagon PSYOP unit pitched NATO on turning Taylor Swift into an asset for combating misinformation online. This is nothing new. In the 1950s, the government strong-armed Louis Armstrong into doing propaganda tours across Africa. The CIA did the same thing with jazz singer Nina Simone, except... They did it without her really knowing. In the 70s, Nixon enlisted Elvis in his war on drugs. He gave the king a badge and named him a covert federal law enforcement agent. Michael Jackson was tapped by Reagan using his song Beat It in his public service campaigns against teen drinking and driving. Michael Jackson persuading minors not to drink. Anyway, so is Swift a front for a covert political agenda. Primetime obviously has no evidence. If we did, we'd share it. But we're curious. Because the pop star who endorsed Biden is urging millions of her followers to vote. She's sharing links. And her boyfriend, Travis Kelty, sponsored by Pfizer. And their relationships boosted the NFL ratings this season, bringing in a whole new demographic. So how's the PSYOP going? Well, as usual, Biden's not calling the shots because he doesn't even know who Taylor Swift is. He's confused her with Britney Spears and Beyonce. There's nothing I love more than Jesse Waters very openly going in the middle of his commentary, is there any evidence? Well, no. Okay, then why are you saying it? <laughs> like, he literally, he just, he just, right here, he said, is there any evidence for this? No. <laughs> he says, source, I made it up in the midst of his commentary. Urging millions of her followers to vote. As usual, Biden's not calling the shots because he doesn't even know who Taylor Swift is. He's confused her with Britney Spears and Beyonce. You could say even this harder than getting a, a ticket to the Renaissance tour or, or Britney's tour. She's down in, it's kind of warm in Brazil, right? Now. Yeah, the absence of evidence is evidence itself, okay? I'm just saying. If, if Taylor Swift wasn't a PSYOP, 
there would be evidence. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on. Come on. Think about it. Former FBI agents. Yeah, dude. This guy and Jesse Waters, that's who's going up against Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. I, I Come on. Like, just more of, there's no better way to effectively kneecap a movement than this, okay? Yeah, put this fucking guy up. <laughs> Stuart Kaplan joins us now. Stuart, is this feasible? Oh, my God. Jesse, the deployment of a PSYOP in the United States in this day and age is still illegal. Um, the national security law prohibits the deployment of PSYOPs or using an operative for psychological warfare. However, if I was running Biden's management perception team, I would identify someone who would align themselves with my agenda, such as a Taylor Swift who has close to 600 million followers. I would target her. I would engage her. And I would get her what get her to do what we used to see as I like that he's taking the long way to be like, no, they're just doing influencer stuff, maybe at best. That's all he said. He just <laughs> It's like public service announcements and that type of enlistment, that type of solicitation is analogous to the old days of deployment of a PSYOP. And so in modern times, with these people having such influence and such you know, immeasurable amount of followers, she can potentially single-handedly swing voters because of just the amount of fo followers that she potentially can influence. So the answer is yes, Jesse. Yeah, because when she posted the link to the vote.org, wait, it's like hundreds of thousands. He just said it's not technically a psyop. It's just like like-minded individuals being tapped, but then said, yes, that is a psyop. Taylor Swift is super liable. She can't because it's a side. Thousands of young Taylor Swift fans all of a sudden registered to vote. I wonder who got to her from the White House or from wherever. Who makes that well, initial Jeff, handshake? Is it the binder? Well, the administration has. God, they're so bad. They're, I mean, it's like unserious, which is fine, especially if it's funny. But like, it's so bad. They're not even funny. They're not even doing a good job. There's no laughter involved. You can't even fake laughter. It's bad. It's bad all the way up and down, folks. Not good. It's what they consider a perception optics management team. And those are professionals that go out and identify those people who may be unsuspecting, whether with knowledge or without knowledge, to do these type of campaigns. Now, it is possible that Taylor Swift, quite frankly, does not know that she is being utilized in a covert manner to swing voters. But the bottom line is what? that the Biden administration is savvy, identifying how many followers and how many voters potentially she can influence with either right information or misinformation. Wait, does that mean that Michael Jackson was a psyop against uh, drugs? Like is or or whatever he against drinking like is that because like he brought that up as an example of like Ronald Reagan. She certainly can swing the voters. Okay, Stewart, thank you so much. I now know a lot more about Taylor Swift than I ever wanted to know. What What did you learn about Taylor Swift here? This guy didn't know more about Taylor Swift than you, dumbass. <laughs> what just happened? I didn't learn anything. Dude, Fox News' commentary is so insane, okay? What is going on here? We have no evidence and we learned nothing. Let's be clear. Donald Trump does not have the authority to take us into war with Iran without congressional approval. A president should never take this nation to war without informed consent of the American people unless global shipping is delayed. Our military has been repeatedly attacked. Just because something feels right to you doesn't mean it is right. I don't know how anyone could take you seriously. You are intellectually division, says Joshua Rosner. They did it. They seriously cited weeks of delays in product shipping times. These strikes are in direct response to unprecedented Houthi attacks against the Houthi attacks against the international maritime vessels in the Red Sea, including the use of anti-ship ballistic missiles for the first time in history. These attacks have endangered U.S. personnel, civilian mariners, and our partners, jeopardized trade, and threatened freedom of navigation. I love that. Threatened freedom of navigation. More than 50 nations have been affected in 27 attacks on international commercial shipping. Crews from more than 20 countries have been threatened or taken hostage in acts of piracy. More than 2,000 ships have been forced to divert thousands of miles to avoid the Red Sea, which can cause weeks in delays in product shipping times. 
And on January 9th, Houthis launched their largest attack to date, directly targeting American ships. Oh. I always wonder how they're able to, like, rip these posters so fast right before a protest. This is how conservatives, this is the starting uh, point of every conservative commentary, by the way. This is why conservatives believe that, like, George Soros is backing them. You know what I mean? If you ever protested, you would know the logistics of it. Well, the saddest part is I've protested quite a bit, and I still don't know the logistics of it. They just kind of show up. Like, I go to a protest. They're just kind of there. I pick it up, and I yell. You know what I mean? I, I've never asked, like, where this comes from. Well, that's because you're not an organizer? No, I am not. This is true. I just, like, again, I said, I yell. We saved them. Those signs were either made by PSL or old ISO posters. The organizers make them. This is my job at the PSL a long time ago, lol. You are a yapper? Yeah. It's likely random dudes who work at a production company. I've let people borrow mics and stuff for Armenian genocide marches a bunch of times. Are you willing to visit China is really cool. I would like to, yes. Oh, my God. Avakia Nights. I know. Trots own a monopoly on both newspaper printing and poster making. Yeah, Revcoms. Revcoms are always geared with posters. They, they, got, they got their posters shit on lock. They always got posters. There's never been a, there's never been a movement that they haven't immediately overtaken. What is this? broadly disapprove 57 percent of the way biden is handling this bloody on the view sunny warned biden 2024 campaign how unpopular the gaza wars among democrats joy behar responded by telling joe biden not to care because we'll bloody move on. war by next year it'll be over and then we'll move on but to the other thing else. joy is voters broadly disapprove bro i i swear to god everyone on the view sounds the same to me like i know it was sunny that was speaking but i literally thought it was joey behar uh, speaking, Joy Behar speaking. They, they all like merge into one another. I don't know how that happened. They got that brunch voice. Yes. Has the White House ever so formally announced his fiduciary duty and his willingness to rage war on behalf of the corporate state? Yes. Literally all the time, every war so far. When has the White House not done that? <sighs> like American Twitch streamers, do we all sound the same? Dude, let me tell you something, okay? If there's a day goes by without America doing war crimes, they're white knuckling through it. Okay. Like they're white knuckling through that brother. Murat, What's good? Big dog. What are you doing here? Oh, are you going to fix the cartons? Okay. It'll be over in a year and we'll move on. Oh, speaking of which, let's look at, you want to take her out? Take her out to pee. Take her out to pee pee. Front open or something. Yeah. Let's talk about is Cal inside California's new model, Prisneyland. It's exactly what you would expect. Big fence, barbed wire, and of course, gun towers, like a prison postcard or something. So it's uh, nine, about 9 o'clock in the morning. We're about 10 minutes away from going inside to Valley State Prison, supposedly one of the most progressive prisons in all of the country. Uh, the nickname is... Can't wait to see what a progressive American prison looks like. I suspect it won't be very progressive. Prisneyland, although from the outside, uh, it looks pretty standard, but we'll see what the inside looks like. Let's go. Thank you. Right inside, not Rough. much difference. <laughs> this is the deadly high voltage electric fence, apparently. I uh, obviously don't want to touch this. But the more you get to know Prisneyland, which officials say some locals refer to it as, you realize the first barriers coming down aren't actually physical. And as we were talking, what? we don't really call them inmates here incarcerated oh my god dude this is awesome bro this is like an onion skit oh my god they don't call wait what individual incarcerated individuals and that's where the difference is between this prison and others around california bro they made prison gay how is that possible yeah, just begin violence plagues our country's system of incarceration when people get out they have extreme difficulties finding a job and while the data varies state by state about half end up back in custody within a few years all of that is why officials say the golden state is trying to move in a new direction starting a pilot program at two facilities with the goal to replicate the results in scandinavia where norway says reforms over the last two and a half decades have brought down the rate of dog it's not the language that they use in the norwegian jails have you seen a norwegian jail 
it's just there's no high there's no like electric wiring fence first of all that still looks like a regular old california penitentiary what are we talking about of reoffending within two years to only 20 percent much lower than here in the u.s they've also decreased the prison population significantly and have helped people reincorporate into society after they serve their time by the way that's the norwegian uh, prison you have a key showing. to your own self yeah everybody has their own key authorities here say the most important thing they're trying to change at valley state prison is how it feels well, this is the central courtyard yeah i feel very peaceful just looking at it <laughs> that's really nice yeah am i recording <laughs> You're on, man. Officials told us the only way to truly understand the reforms is by coming and experiencing them. One of the principles of the California model is normalization. And, and the idea is we want to make the environment inside our... Bro, it's so gross that this is like the worst prison in Europe, okay? And this is the best prison, I guess, in America. And like automatically, it's still the worst prison in Europe so far. I got to see the living institutions as as normal as possible. I mean, quick question. Is there solitary confinement? If the answer is yes, boom. It, that should be illegal. It's torture. It's unacceptable. And it's still the awful Garbo prison. With the goal of not releasing somebody who's institutionalized, but releasing citizens back to the community who have practiced normal pro-social behavior. What about the argument that somebody might see this and say, well, isn't part of the goal punishment in some way why give them all of this nice stuff so what nice stuff sports that's a nice stuff that they got basketball and a soccer ball what are you what is hat what is the not i haven't seen the nice stuff is it here is it in the video i mean i feel like prison yard sports is like one thing that has always existed right am i crazy i feel like that's pretty commonplace that's a that's the norm right I mean, there was that Adam Sandler movie and stuff like that. Like, they've always had sports in prison, right? So I, I would say that people go to court to be punished. That's up to our, our judges and our juries. And when they, when they come into our institutions, our goal is to basically help them become better citizens. So with, with that in mind, we are not in the punishment business. Um, we're in the rehabilitative yeah, business. Yeah. I go to bat, all right, perfect. A big part of that rehabilitation, a wide array of programs where the population learns a variety of coping and calming. Okay, this part's not that bad. Calming skills. And she is a good horse. Did you know you this were going to be good. grooming horses in prison? <laughs> no, to be honest, I thought I'd be uh, stuck in a cell, maybe a few re uh, rehabilitation groups, but it helps me, you know, cope with, you know, a lot of stresses I deal with, you know, day to day here in prison. The hope is that creating a more positive environment makes the men. They are playing basketball inside. Come on. Wait, what? You can't be serious. I can't tell if you're joking. The only things that I've seen so far that are like beyond the pale for normal prison is this stuff. Like, eh, you, you're probably joking. The, this stuff is actually a little bit unique to American prisons. And I do think it's a good thing overall. Not just the horses. I'm not being like a horse girl or whatever. I'm just, I'm saying like VR, horses, like grooming program, things of that nature. Like, you know. Locked up here, more willing to rehabilitate. Of the total incarcerated population of 3,000 here, the prison says 2,400 are enrolled in training or education programs, including high school and college. Big, I'm a fan of that. Education programs are good. Training programs are good in prison. Those are good things. For the rest of our lives, we can start our day at any time. When you came in and you saw what this was, what was your impression? I thought I was going to come to prison and get worse, but coming to prison actually saved my life. Wow. Say that again. Coming to prison saved my life. Since they started running these programs in 2017, Valley State Prison says it's reduced violence compared to other peer facilities. According to reports from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, prisons across the state have seen between 15 and 32 homicides total each year between 2017 and 2021. At Valley State, zero. And only one recorded assault or battery against staff versus the hundreds at other facilities. Get in the middle, you guys are going to circle me. All one right. of the most successful programs is dog training. Inmates working with puppies to become... Okay, that's a little crazy, bro. They're training the dogs that are going to bite them. Service dogs eventually sent to help people across the country. You know. Oh, okay, it's just service dogs. Never mind. I thought they were making the inmates train the attack dogs, bro. I was like, damn, that shit's crazy. 
also could backfire dramatically on you. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for a long time, we were releasing uh, citizens back into the community that had not. Don't do it. Don't train these dogs. You're training them to do crimes, brother. Improve their thought process. Uh, they had not re rehabilitated from their behavior, and they go out and reoffend. And so, when you start to introduce rehabilitative programs, when you start to introduce hope into this community, you you really are transforming their thought process. Come on, come on, come on! Show me the fucking living quarters, brother. Let's go. This part they're really hamming up because it is good. Also, the bare minimum, like this, is the bare minimum standard for the rest of the world. And I cannot believe that this is such. This is so good. It is above and beyond for American prisons. And it is successful and it will be successful. But it should be accompanied with living quarters that resemble normal living quarters. It should be, a com uh, it should be accompanied with no solitary confinement. You know what I mean? This stuff is good. I, I, I'm being impartial here. Okay? But... Some of the major problems here would be uh, what the food looks like, whether you can even cook your own food. Like, do you have an opportunity to exercise autonomy and individualism? Because a big part of the problem with the prison system is that you become a number. Not to get too, like, not to get too much like Foucault here, but, um, I mean, it, our prison system, our education system, and our, our military resemble similar structures that are that are breaking down the barriers of individualism and it or it more so is like dehumanizing you right so one of the one of the ways that you are supposed to ensure one of the ways that uh, you're supposed to ensure that these guys like uh are not reoffending is by allowing them to exercise independence and autonomy of a certain degree that's why in the Norwegian prison, they showed you, like, you have a key to your own room. That's a supremely beneficial, minor thing that is so important. It's like like having an element of privacy, for example. Like, it makes you human. It makes it reminds you that you're human. We followed a few of the dog trainers back to their cells. The doors lock from the outside, but they look a little more like something else. It feels like a dorm. Yeah. This does not feel like a dorm. What are you talking about? There's literally, I mean, at least they're not all in the same living quarters, but that, that automatically eliminates this being a dorm right there. What dorm are you talking about? That's just a regular jail. Yeah. Did you expect that when you came in? No. So not. right now we are walking your dog past the pool table back to your. I'm going to be honest with you. These dogs are not being trained well. Okay. This dog, this dog is pulling. That's a shit. That's not good training, okay? These dogs haven't even learned not to fucking pull. <laughs> right now, we are walking your dog past the pool table back to your spot in prison. That's pretty wild. So is this like the dog wing? It almost feels like to a lot of people that might watch this that... They're too easy on us. Yes. Uh, okay, laptop in the room. That's a that's a good... That's a uh, I would say uh, no, because a lot of us worked our ways down. Sure. So um, I came from a higher level, and it took me seven years to come down to, to this. People that are going to see this and say, shouldn't prison be a punishment in some way? It should be. Okay, how about you stop saying that? I know that, like, you're supposed to get them to be like, no, it shouldn't be or whatever. It's still a punishment, but, like, goddamn. Now it's starting to make me feel like you're saying that. Reformation, too, but it should also be, it should suck. Yeah, it sucks, man. You can't leave. Like, what do you mean? That's it. That's the punishment. You can't leave. There's no bigger punishment than restricting your freedom of movement. Why can't Americans understand this? Is it because they're all fucking fat couch potatoes? What the fuck's going on? People literally just have no concept of this. Restriction of movement is a fundamental thing that is taken from you. That's it. That, that's like, you can't just be like, hey, man, I'm in the mood for some Starbucks today, okay? And you can't just, like, walk down the street to go get that. That's... You don't even think about it because you're free. You're free to do it whenever you want to, even if you don't exercise it. But, like, when it's taken from you, all of a sudden you're like, oh, my God, that's really bad, actually. Yeah, and they still have bunks, by the way. I don't know if they're sleeping in them or I don't know what's going on, but it still doesn't look great. Right? Yeah, so this doesn't suck. It does suck. It does suck. Okay, does tell suck. me why. It does suck, right? I don't, I don't get to hug my family. Right. Would you rather want somebody coming out and getting... Thank you. Jesus Christ.
performed or somebody coming in and getting out the same way they came in or worse. Steve Patterson. That's insane. He said, this doesn't suck. Okay, let's trade places then. Like, what do you mean? This doesn't suck. You're in a prison. Like, you think it's tight? What, what's going on? You, you think you can stay there? What is this, a Mr. Beast video? What's happening? Chatters be like, what are you talking about? I'm in a mental prison at the top of the hour every time you hit me with a three-minute ad break, and I can't get out of it. So they have no c way of conceptualizing how devastating it is that you can't move around freely and do things that you want to do, okay? Even now, when I trap you in the prison of the three-minute ad break, you have a way out of it subscriptions for five dollars or for free with a twitch prime by connecting your amazon prime account to your twitch account where you get one free prime subscription a month okay all of those dudes at prison land in the california penitentiary are stuck because they're watching me in the common hall on their computer on one computer that they're sharing and they can't even subscribe because they're in prison anyway here's the three minute break now do you think rape is murders and pedophiles can genuinely be rehabilitated yes do they deserve tax money to be humanized? Yes. I understand that every case is complex, but the Chris Watts and Peter Scullies of the world shouldn't be on a Norwegian-ass holiday. It's not a holiday. So yes, the answer is yes. The idea, even if everyone can't be rehabilitated, the idea should be that you operate as though they can. Does that make sense? Like, because the overwhelming majority, like 99% of people in prison aren't the the examples that you mentioned okay of course just like every law doesn't stop uh uh you know crime from happening uh, and and uh make it so that like there's zero crime okay prisons are not going to rehabilitate every single person the goal should always be to try and rehabilitate every single prisoner no matter how gruesome their crimes are and this is something i believe in it's also the reason why i believe in rehabilitation of chatters as well even when they come in here and say ridiculous, unhinged shit, even if they have opinions that I don't agree with, I still, I might yell at you in that very moment, but ultimately I do believe that if you stay in here long enough, if you stick around, you're, ha you're going to be convinced. You're going to have your mind changed. It's, it's something that I uh, abide by in my own life. It's something that I believe in. I, I believe in rehabilitation of people who have done wrong in the past, when it, whether it be like actual crimes, like I have mentioned, or whether it be like, uh, you know, things that are worse than crimes in the minds of uh, leftists online, like people that used to be right wing or people that used to slur, or people that have said and, done, uh, said and done awful things, but have attested for them and have uh, uh, recounted those experiences and tried to become a better person. So turn the prisons into I can fix them type shit. Yes, that's the funniest way to approach what I'm saying. You know, my fiance was shocked that the Norway mass shooter was sentenced to 25 years, which I believe is the max. No, uh, I mean, they have at the end of the 25 year process, and I don't even think it's 25, I think it's 15. There is a, there is a, a board that looks at it and says, it, has this person been rehabilitated effectively? And then they reassess. And obviously the Norwegian terrorist dude is not going to get, uh, is probably not going to get out. It's just... The most, like, it's the maximum punishment that you can give. What is it, 21 years, someone said? And then, at the end of the 20 years, at the end of the 20 years or 21 years, you still, you, you get a, an additional assessment, a reassessment. Yeah, we're talking about Anders Breivik. I agree with you, but it's hard for me not to want the worst for those who have wronged my loved ones. Yeah, well, you know, that's what being an adult is all about, is overcoming those things. It's the basic distinction between the main schools. A lot of conservative thinks people, conservatives think people are bad. Liberals think people are rational. Socialists think people are good. I mean, I don't think people are bad or good. I think people are operating on their own uh, interest. But ultimately, everyone has the capacity to do things that I believe are quote-unquote good, I guess. The goal is to solve. The goal is to examine and solve the underlying problems that create or that make it more likely for people to engage in... Uh, uh, violent actions or, or actions that are declared criminal. I don't think that any person, like, I don't think that there is any genuine difference between someone born in the South side of Chicago to a broken home versus someone that's born into a very wealthy family in Connecticut. Let's say there's no real difference 
but their material conditions part uh, nurture and, and part nature, I guess. Well, their material conditions and their environment is what turns them into who they are. And it is what turns them into uh, or, or their opportunities, their educational opportunities, their job opportunities, what uh, causes them to move in a certain direction. A mass murder is never going to be fully accepted by society again. I don't know why you people think that these people are going to be scot-free after they get out of prison. Wait, what? Why do you believe pe prisons need to be punitive in the first place? Bro, even Scandi prisons are still bad. Why do you believe prisons need to be punitive in the first place? I'm so confused. What are you saying? Uh, anyway. I mean that society will continue to punish that person, I think. They're, he's saying that punishment of mass murder faced after prison is punitive enough. Will we hear about Jason Whitlock tonight? Yes. Give me the give me the link and we'll watch Stephen A. Smith absolutely cook Jason Whitlock, who he called a fat bastard. Does anyone have it? I'm gonna have. A, it's gonna be hard for me to openly agree with Stephen A. Smith, but how how long is it? I mean, I just want the good parts. And please do not allow this to be a reflection on my character because this is not how I act every day. There's a few things going on. But I mean things it going on in the world soul. of sports that need to be addressed. But on this particular day, they don't take precedent. Instead, one would be Aaron Rodgers and his situation with the Pat McAfee show. That's necessary to address because, after all, I'm an employee for ESPN. The other would be a fat bastard that has gotten away for far too long talking his bullshit. You wanted some? Fine. I'm happy to give it to you piece of shit the Stephen a smith show up next right now okay so the first 20 minutes are ah, about aaron Rodgers. so right here over the digital air you're somebody that was involved in some kind of public incident that i had to speak on whether you're the wife or ex-girlfriend or some uh, of a former player or whatever i get it you're a present day athlete and you don't like my evaluation so Stephen a smith is a very famous uh sports commentator Okay, Jason Whitlock is a washed up sports commentator and is basically like fat male Candace Owens. I don't know how else to describe it. I, I like it's like imagine if Candace Owens was also not like had no redeeming qualities. Like you can't even doesn't even look good. You know what I mean? Is that a way to describe it? Well, I don't know. He's he's also somehow dumber than Candace Owens, too. Like it's it's really odd. Like he. Candace Owens at least sometimes like will remind people that she's black in her commentary while she's doing white supremacy. Whereas like Jason Whitlock will literally forget. Like it's, it's odd. Like it's the closest I've ever seen uh, someone behave outside of uh, Jesse Lee Peterson is the closest I've ever seen someone behave like uh, the, the Dave Chappelle character. And of what has transpired before I very eyes and what I'm witnessing. That's cool. But I swear to you, on everything that I love, it's not personal. I'm a sports reporter and sports commentator. That is what I have been throughout my career. It is my responsibility to tell you what I see through my lens, how I feel about it, what my perspective is, etc. It's not like I'm sitting at home with absolutely nothing to do and no obligation to touch on anything, but I feel the need to... Aaron Rodgers is an anti-vaxxer. Josh Giddy is a pedophile. Zion Williamson is fat. That's what Stephen A. Smith said, actually. Dude, what's up with, like... Dude, I swear to God, sports commentators are either, like, insanely in shape. I think... Did Felix tweet about this before? I can't remember. Like, everything I've seen as sports commentators are, like, either they're, like, rail thin or they're just, like, super bloated. But the rail thin ones hate fat people with the same intensity of like doctors, gay doctors, okay? Which is, I think, like probably the most fat phobic community I could think of is like both being a doctor and gay. There's no, there's no one that's more fat phobic than a gay doctor, I assume. And then you have like, and then you have like, a, I guess, Stephen A. Smith beat. I mean, I don't know. People, people shit on Zion Williamson a little bit too much, I think, about being fat. And most of NBA Twitter is way fatter than he is. And he could dunk on you. So shut the fuck up. Calling Zion fat isn't fat phobic. How about you chill out, okay? He would destroy you. I have a lot of respect for him. 
I do, because, like, yeah, he's a big boy, okay? He's a big boy. Nah, he's overweight and blowing his NBA prospects. I Fine. Oh, my God, why are you glazing Zion, dude? Because <laughs> I think it's funny that there's a dude who's just, like, kind of fat. Which is weird because, like, I've never been a big NBA guy, but I used to say that about Carmelo Anthony, like, which is, in my opinion, I mean, much worse to say about than Zion, who actually kind of deserves it. I know, I know, I know. I don't know why. I know, I know that uh, Carmelo Anthony was not technically fat. I just always, I just always thought he was kind of chubby. <laughs> All right, let's keep invoke going. and ingratiate my thoughts, opinions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, upon the world. I actually get paid to do this, and because of that, sometimes my opinions, my thoughts, my feelings, etc., are things that you would not like. I've grown, is what I'm saying. I've grown. I've grown. I always thought he was like kind of chubby in a way that like bothered me, but now like Jokic is is obviously in that same standard, and it like it still doesn't matter. Because now I love uh, a, a little bit chubby boys in the NBA because, like, I'm also a chubby boy myself, and I think that's great. All right, let's continue. Let's just but stop I have talking never about never lied to you, ever. If I wrote a story or I wrote an article, it's based on the things that I've been told, what I've seen, and what I feel. It is rare that I talk about myself on a personal level because my personal life is not anybody's business, and I don't get into other people's personal life. It's not something that I do. Many figures in the world of sports find themselves in personal situations, not lawlessness, not unlawful things or anything like that. But there's plenty of situations, Michael, Sherry, Juvie, where I've seen certain things and I turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to it because it's none of my business and I leave it alone. And one of the other things that I never do, I never attack my colleagues. I might disagree with something somebody says or does, and I might have an obligation to speak on it because it's in the news or whatever, but I don't speak against <coughs> my colleagues. Once humanity comes into play, that's a given. Here's the other. That's not real work. Think about this for a second. I'm supposed to be covering sports, but I make a career out of talking about my colleagues. That ain't work. Okay. Okay. We get it. You, you take, you, you take a lot of seriousness to your job. Like this part is like, I feel like he builds up a lot. Okay. He builds up a lot uh, leading up to the to the pop-off moment where he's just like, you know, I, I called my priest and I told him, you know, I asked him for forgiveness ahead of time. I told my sister, uh, you know, you're going to hear some things that you've never heard. And it's just like, come on, dude. His name was Harvey Stoller. It was Thomas A. Edison Vocational and Technical High School. I played there my senior year. I was in a basketball tournament at Fashion Institute of Technology where I dropped 27 points and got a scholarship because the coach came calling me after that and what have you. If you listen to him, I never had a scholarship to Winston-Salem State, even though it's on the books. Just call the university. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm an honorary doctorate member. I have an honorary doctorate from Winston-Salem State University because of my contributions to Winston-Salem State. I'm called Dr. Smith. Has something to also do with the contributions that I make because I believe about upliftment. I'm an ambassador for HBCU Week, and I've partnered with Ashley Christopher and Mir Persicki in Delaware and others to generate over 10,000 scholarships in excess of over $65 million in scholarships for African-Americans. But this man will tell you I'm lying. He even went so far as to say my autobiography, where I talk about my mother, my father, my sisters, the business, my hiring and firing and rehiring at ESPN. I didn't write it. I didn't write my own memoir, which, by the way, is a New York Times bestseller, something he wouldn't know anything about. Yeah. Did you know that it's now on paperback? It just came out yesterday on paperback. Okay, okay, come on. Come to on. get my selling ten thousand Deadspin, the type. When when old heads start pr doing printouts, you know shit is about to get real. Okay, listen. When boomers in radio and on television, like when you're in a when you're in a legacy publisher, when you're at a legacy publisher, and you you pull out. A printout is over. How Jason Whitlock is poisoning ESPN's Black Grant land.
Because remember, Bill Simmons, who's now at Spotify doing a great job, oh, obviously had Grantland at ESPN. And upon his departure, Jason Whitlock was supposed to take it. up the mantle and create a black website, folks. This article was written by a Greg Howard, published on April 27th, 2015. The same Jason Whitlock that said he's seen my writing. The same Jason Whitlock that implied that I couldn't write. The same Jason Whitlock that said that I'm lying. That I'm lying. What does this man do? Why would I call up this article? There's a plethora of reasons why I would do so, ladies and gentlemen. One of the reasons would be because it's as in-depth as it gets about how scurrilous, how trifling, how despicable this man is. But there's also another reason that I'd pick up this article. Let me read the graph to you that it says. Keep in mind, Stephen A. can't write. This staff, the one Whitlock was praising by way of warnings that if the writers and editors wouldn't align with his vision, he would get rid of them, was not the one Whitlock wanted. The undefeated... Okay, I'm skipping this part too. This is boring. Okay, where does he get... TV spewing that bullshit to people. Did you tell him that? Did you tell them how you stood outside, outside of first take begging me to talk to you? Did you tell them that once the same article in Deadspin came out, weeks later you wrote a lengthy apology to me in an email begging me to forgive you, pointing out how you were betrayed by this particular writer so you know how I must feel that you betrayed me? Did you tell the folks that, you bitch? Did you tell them? You fat piece of shit. <laughs> Did you tell him that? Got the names. We got Jamel Hill. We got Howard Bryant. You want me to bring up the other writers that wouldn't work for you? Why it took you nearly two years to get an article out? Because you ran that shit so bad you were running it into the ground? What a disgrace you were to John Skipper, the former boss of ESPN, or the host of others. You want me to talk about that? Because I got receipts. I got the email. When we talk about that now, just for everybody that wants to understand, how could this possibly be? Because once upon a time, I actually tried to speak up for this damn Cretan. I knew he was a piece of shit, but I said, look, maybe he's misunderstood. Why would I do that? Ladies and gentlemen, because sometimes as black folks, we get in our own way. We think that all of us must be of one monolithic thinking that we need to be completely and totally aligned. And any deviation from that brings into question our quote unquote blackness. Martin Luther King was a man of peace. Malcolm X was by any means necessary. They can't possibly be on the same page. <laughs> Wait. Even. What? I'm sorry, what? Bro, <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> Though their agendas was for the upliftment and the preservation of our race of people. So I understand when we talk about stuff like this. How people can sit up there and say, how did it get to this? How did it get to this? Remember when I got suspended years ago? You know what's out there writing stuff, smiling in my face one minute, talking smack about me behind my back, and then ultimately writing it? It was him. Remember when I supposedly used the, and people were speculating that he used the N-word on the air and all of this other stuff? He was the first one out there trying to say that I did it. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't do it on the air, in my humble opinion. I'm telling you that. However, it's not like I didn't use the N-word when I was off the air, when I was talking to my fellas, or I was talking to other folks who happened to Did he say the N-word on air? I mean, what's the, was this a big deal or something? Like, I don't get it. I mean, I guess you can't say it on TV, but like, if it slips out, you know. Stephen A. Smith says N-word on air claims it didn't happen. <laughs> oh was discussing whether or not Kobe Bryant will play in the Lakers' season opener. Oh, my God. I'm a New Yorker. I speak very, very fastly. Sometimes when words are misconstrued, and I get that. I mean, yeah, okay, he slipped up. Going on, you know, he'll be just fine. Opening night, uh, opening night, Kobe Bryant is going to miss it because my foot is sprained. Are y'all crazy? Then the please. It's okay, enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I like that he doesn't even address... Like, what he possibly could have said. Anyway, the brass at ESPN have decided not to suspend the analyst for this on-air incident. It should be noted that this is the same network that suspended a sports center host for saying chink in his armor when talking about Jeremy Lin earlier this year. Wait, what? Actually? I haven't seen that. Yeah, because it's kink? No, it's not, isn't it? 
Wait, it's not chink in his armor? No, it's not kink. It also has nothing to do with like you keep saying it. Guys, it's not a it's not a slur. What are you saying? I mean, it is a slur if you say it separately. It is a slur if it's separately. It's not a slur in that context. What are you talking about? <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, it just means like vulnerability. Exactly. It's traditionally been used to refer to a weak spot in a figurative suit of armor. The standard meaning is similar to that of an Achilles heel. But it does look kind of bad when talking about an Asian person. Okay, but like, wait, what? An editor used the phrase as a headline? Okay, that's, okay, that's a little bit different. Like, it's, it's written down. This, on the other hand, is ridiculous. Like, on-air ESPN commentator Max Bredos also used the same phrase when referring to Lin, asking, if there's a chink in the armor, where can Lin improve his game? Like, that, that is totally valid. That's not, that's not, like, racist at all. This feels very racist. This feels like a, like a regular term of reference. I mean, he was just using the normal term, definitely unintentional. Notable controversies. Well, the phrase itself is innocuous. It's used in contemporary times has caused controversy in the United States due to it, including the homonym, which can be interpreted as an ethnic slur to refer to someone of Chinese or East Asian descent. Yeah, it comes from literally the mid 17th century. Okay. Motherfuckers didn't even know what Chinese was. Okay. <laughs> like, what, what are we talking about? It is based on a definition of chink, meaning a crack or a gap dating back to around 1400. Anyway, but it's a double entendre, like you're being obtuse. No, this is a double entendre. This is not a double entendre. That's the difference. This is a double entendre and definitely does not meet the muster. This is being used in a, in, as, a, as a regular term within context in the completely appropriate context as it is a perfectly normal reference that I have used, like it's a perfectly normal phrase that you use in normal conversation. Like the Achilles heel is like perfectly valid to talk about when you're talking about like, I don't know, what are areas of improvement in defense or something like that? Where can live improves game? Bredos apologize saying my wife is Asian would never in inter intentionally say anything to disrespect her and that community. Wait, he probably said my wife is Asian because his wife is probably not Chinese, okay? And he didn't want to come across as, like, even more racist by saying, oh, my wife is Japanese. I would never disrespect a Chinese person. And then motherfuckers will probably jump on that and be like, oh, this guy thinks Chinese people and Japanese people are the same. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, not a Chinese guy wearing armor. Anyway, um, people's bubbles are really showing right now. There's no way you haven't heard this term. All these people saying they've never heard in their entire life in America. Yeah, I mean, I've used it. And every time I use it, every time I use it, chat will like meme about it. And it's really annoying. And I didn't realize that that was like a real thing that people would get mad at. But like I said, um, but you don't say it around Asian people, right? Wait, what? What do you mean? I've like, if the situation it called for that reference, like that term, in the armor within the appropriate context like it's a common phrase yes i would use it i would not like modify my language what are you talking about it's weird to be like oh i shouldn't say it your chat is the worst dude lamont it reminds me when people use the phrase off off the reservation which has been rightfully abandoned as a phrase like i said this is weird though i mean that's like you wrote that as a title that's a double entendre you know what i mean you were surprised as a commentator in the leftist space yeah anyway but going back to the other thing this I think it's pretty funny, and it also, once again, shows how white the audience is. It's something that I talked about yesterday, if you recall, and that is that, like, white audiences love black culture, but, like, don't want black people to be people, like, black people, you know what I mean? And that's where this kind of comes from. I, I mean, it, it, like, the expectation that he'd be suspended for this would be ridiculous, obviously. Um, and I like that... That article also puts this on top of this. This is a black dude slipping up and accidentally saying the N-word. This is a white dude that is being misconstrued. It's not even in the same uh, you know, situation, though. It's not like he, he said cracker and was canceled for it or potentially suspended for it. Anyway, anyway, the, the, other, the other more damning part about this, in my opinion, is like, 
ESPN has regularly. God, I'm such a fucking nerd. It's like I don't I don't even watch sports, and the only thing I know about sports is the political aspect of sports. Where like ESPN has regularly contributed to white supremacist components in the way that it has analyzed black athletes in the NBA and in the NFL, and have like routinely routinely criticized and oftentimes even black anchors have routinely criticized athletes in worse ways in worse ways than even white commentators have from the same framework of of white supremacy like you know calling them thugs and and things like that and that is a byproduct of the fact that a lot of the sports world is is very conservative and and a big chunk of the sports watching audience is still very white. Anyway, yeah, the commentary on the Malice of the Palace is a great example of this exactly. Which also there's a very good documentary on it too. But Jason Whitlock takes it way 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 further than all of the the average commentators on on uh, ESPN and whatnot to be black. I I'm not a proponent of using that word often, nor am I advocating that that word be used now. I'm just acknowledging the guilt that comes associated with me in terms of when I was younger. But I was always saying we as black people communicate how we want to communicate with each other. I love John Wooten, who's been associated with the Pritz Alliance, uh, you know, uh, the Pritz Alliance, uh, the Fritz Alliance, I'm sorry, Fritz Pollard Alliance. Love that man. Love his contributions to the NFL, but when we would get into it in the past on rare occasions, it wasn't that he wanted the eradication of the N-word, because I support that. My issue with him was, hey, you shouldn't be encouraging the NFL to fine us and penalize us for using it amongst ourselves. How can a race of people who actually made the word iniquitous be in a position to punish us for using the word with one another? I had a problem with that, and I stand by that, but I digress. My point is, in bringing up all of that, Jason Whitlock pounced on it because that's what he does. The audio. You see, what he does crazy. is he's the one that puts himself in front of white folks. The white folks, not all white folks, not most white folks, but the white folks that dare we say may have a problem with. He says, I'm your man. That's what he does. You think I'm lying? Ask ESPN. Ask Fox. Ask the Kansas City Star. Ask them all. Jamel Hill, Rob Parker, Chris Broussard, Skip Bayless, yours truly, along with a host of black folks all over this country. Every single one of them will confirm what the hell I'm saying about this piece of garbage. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I think he's as so, a black man. I think he's so racist. Even white people recognize that he's racist. Unless they are like really racist white people, in which case they love him. I often told y'all, I cannot imagine as a black man, knowing our history, anything worse than a white supremacist. That is, until Jason Whitlock came along. He's worse than them. The only, the only people that are, that are racist in sports Twitter are LeBron haters and Jason Whitlock. <laughs> he is the worst, most despicable Lion, no good, fat ass human being I have ever <laughs> known in my life, and I'm gonna take a break. Oh my I god! I got more. Oh my god! In a minute. Come on! You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show, right? He's here. such a he's such an old school radio guy. Just it's so funny, like an old school commentator. Let's take it to the commercial break. Mind everybody, as I'm sitting here talking about Mr. Jason Whitlock. First of all, um, it will never happen again. He's irrelevant, he's not important, he's insignificant, and he knows it, and he did all of this to try and bait me into this, all of this stuff. I know that's how people are looking at it, my family and friends, and everybody thinks the same thing. My point is I don't care. And the reason I don't care is because I've been holding it in for nearly 10 years. And so there comes a point in time where, at the very least, at least one time, you have to address it. It's necessary, it's important, okay? And as we sit here today talking about this subject, there's certain things that we just don't need to let go. You know, it, we just don't need to let go. Cinnamon roll, hold up. Because there comes a point in time when enough's enough and that time has arrived. Getting back into him and to really elaborate extensively on us. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> John Skipper, the former boss for ESPN, wanted to start this website. 
And if you remember, when The Undefeated first came into existence, it was labeled the premier platform for intelligent analysis and celebration of black culture and the African-American struggle for equality. That's what it was labeled as. Now that I read you that quote, let me give you a quote that this guy, Greg Howard, has a recording of Jason Whitlock saying to his staff at that time. If you're more comfortable working for white people rather than working for me, and that sounds humorous, but it's the truth. Fine. This is according to an audio obtained by Deadspin back in 2015. Some black people are far more comfortable answering to a white person than a black person, no matter how black they like to pass themselves off to be. Far more comfortable because they know a white person is going to overlook their shortcomings. Ugh, it's good for a Negro. I'm not about that. But if you're more comfortable working for a white person, I will find a white person for you to work for. We have a higher standard here. Everybody has to get on board with that or I'm going to find a way to move them someplace else. That was Jason Whitlock. And then he went out and hired a senior writer and editor, Mike Wise, who's white. This is the man that's in charge of black culture. Why can I say that? And by the way, I'm not casting any aspersions against Mike Weiss. I'm cool with him. I've always been cool with him. He used to work for the New York Times, used to cover the Knicks long before he went and moved on to the Washington Post. He's a credible journalist. I have no, nothing negative to say about him. I'm just saying black website, but you bring in your white friend in part because black folks didn't want to work for you. But I digress. Ladies and gentlemen, how serious I am? Am I? I have a contract that I negotiated with ESPN and I signed in 2015. I don't know of anyone who has this in their contract. I had it in my contract and I have a copy of it where it specifically stipulates that I never work with Jason Whitlock. <laughs> it's in writing. No wonder you didn't see him on first take. Um, you didn't see him on undisputed with Skip Bayless either. Skip Bayless wouldn't allow him on there. You didn't see him on numbers. Never lie. Wow, I raises. <laughs> Jamel Hill and Michael Smith wouldn't allow him on there. Christopher Broussard. For Fox Sports and Fox Sports Radio. Let me take a moment to tell you about Chris Broussard. If Chris Broussard were not in this industry. I don't even understand why Jason Whitlock is like, like, did he have to be on any of these shows anyway? Like, why is Disney like, this is our guy. We have to have him on. Do you know where he'd probably be? Probably, because I don't know for sure, but probably be, y'all, in a monastery. He's one of the most... <laughs> Whitlock's Twitch averages 300k viewers. I feel like Jason Whitlock would get banned off Twitch. Religious, God-fearing, decent human beings you will ever encounter. It doesn't get any better than Christopher Broussard. And he can't stand Jason Whitlock. Look around. Don't y'all notice why black people scurry away whenever this roach of an individual is around named Whitlock? Because we know what he is. We know what he is. Blaze TV, you may not know. Glenn Beck. Oh, God. Dave Rubin. Oh. The great one himself, Mark Levin. Oh, my God. He's mentioning Dave Rubin's name. What is happening? He said the great one himself to Mark Levin. Oh, my. oh no. Okay. I'm sorry. But if you don't like Jason Whitlock, but you like a white guy saying the same shit, then what's the problem? You just don't want a black guy being a white supremacist? Is that what it is? I hope he's being sarcastic. I bring up Blaze TV, which is where Whitlock works, because I want Bla Blaze TV to understand I'm not talking about you. I know you're a conservative arm. You're conserv you know, I get all of that. I'm not judging accordingly. I know Mark Levin well. We have one another on speed dial. We talk all the time. Yeah, that that's what I'm saying, bro. He No, he's not being sarcastic. He said he has... Mark Levin on speed dial. Ew, dude. What do you guys talk about? Your hairlines? The same applies to Sean Hannity. The Andrew Wilkows of the world. What? Okay? I talk to these folks. I'm not one of those people that's married to one side or the other. And decent people are everywhere. Oh. Be careful that you don't get your stuff. Okay. I'm sorry. But, like, I stand, I stand here not corrected. Okay? I'm right. He's like, oh, yeah, both sides. Uh, I don't have a side, and I don't have a dog in this fight. But then also, if you're shitting, again, if you're shitting on Whitlock, and he deserves it 100%, while simultaneously glazing Sean Hannity and Mark Levin, then it's like you just don't want, you're fine with, like, white guys 
doing white supremacy. You just don't like it when a, when a black guy is doing white supremacy. Self-stained and stenched by Whitlock, he can do that to people. He is the worst. He's not ethical. He's not moral. Clearly, based over what I've told you about me, he's also not factual most of the time. He will lie. He will denigrate. And he will turn against anyone to serve his own good. The real reason, and casting no aspersions on what Blaze TV presents and what it has to offer, the real reason he's there is because he can't get a job anywhere else. He hasn't burnt bridges. He's napalmed them. Call Eric Shanks and Charlie Dixon at Fox. Call Jimmy Pitaro, Burke Magnus, Dave Roberts, Norby Williamson at ESPN. Call him. Call him. Call John Skipper at Metalock Media. I'm giving you names. Stephen A is a closeted conservative. He's been on all these guys' shows. Chris Bassard, the good Christian he mentioned earlier, is also a conservative fuckhead. I mean, I remember the conversation between him and uh, what's the other guy, Max, um, who would like regularly, who would like regularly uh, duke it out with him, and would be like defending the black position. I guess Max Kellerman, yeah, who is white himself. But yeah, he's not like. Um, um, I don't think he's like a closeted conservative. I think he has a lot of conservative takes. Names. I'm giving you names. That's just a, I already gave you on air talent names. I gave you reporters and on air talent. Ladies and gentlemen, this same Jason Whitlock that wanted to talk smack about me is the same Jason Whitlock that wanted to hire me. It's the same Jason. Stephen A admitted publicly too that he was the one who got Max taken off the show because he didn't like working with him. Um, you basically can't work at ESPN at this point unless you're a conservative or a both size guy. Dan Liebetard was doing a sp sports show and that didn't talk about sports, mainly politics. And it was the best show on ESPN after ESPN was forced to cover George Floyd protests against their will. They waited until the problem is it's like three hours long. Jason Whitlock that stood outside doors trying to get me and coax me into even having a conversation with them because they knew I was so disgusted with him. Presumably after he hit a strip club. Because we all know ain't nobody trying to go out with him. But Monty Jones is great, yes. Um, okay. The same Jason Whitlock. That guy is the same guy that sent both Dan Lebertard and Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas, the two-time champion, the Hall of Famer, one of the greatest point guards in NBA history, now working on NBA TV. That guy. That same Jason Whitlock sent those folks. Please. Is there something that could be worked out? Can you forgive him? Can you talk to him? My words and my promise to them was that I want nothing to do with him. I will never hurt him from getting opportunities. You like Stephen A. Smith? I don't care about Stephen A. Smith. I like, I like Shannon Sharp. I like Bomani Jones. And that's pretty much it. Those are the two guys that I like. And I guess uh, Max Kellerman is fine. But I don't really know Max Kellerman like that. I've only seen certain clips. And I like I like Shannon Sharp, not because he's a LeBron dick rider, but because he's jacked. Like impossibly jacked. What about Keith Olbermann? I don't like Keith Olbermann. I think Keith Olbermann was fine and then he lost his mind. ESPN had a CNN type shift where they got rid of people like Dan Le Dan Lebetard, Bamani Jones, Max Kellerman, Jamel Hill, and anyone who spoke out politically and wanted a more, more center right framing of sports. The whole Kaepernick kneeling was a bigger divide for the conservative guys in sports. They couldn't handle anyone defending Colin, and a lot of heads got rolled because of that. Yeah. Um, I, I remember just kind of covering some of that at the Young Turks. Fuck Kaepernick is jokes about Gaza. Wait, he made jokes about Gaza. What are your, th what are your thoughts on Alper and Schengen? That's the goat. That's my goat. He's Turkish. That's a Turkish brother. Damned. If I'm going to help him by being associated with him in any way. Do you know why I said that, ladies and gentlemen? As black people, and I guess I was wrong, I should say at this particular moment in time, I was wrong to call him a fat bastard or a roach and all of this other stuff because that's not my name for him. My name for Jason Whitlock is religiously Cain, C-A-I-N. You see, a lot of black folks, we talk about how with the original man on the face of this earth. Well, that means Cain was the original murderer because he's the one, according to the Bible, who killed Abel. That's Jason Whitlock. There is nothing good about him. Damn. Absolutely nothing. And I challenge anybody.
that knows anything about him to refute what I'm saying. I have the facts. They're all here. I know what he's done. The biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes that John Skipper could have ever made as the former boss of ESPN was hiring that man. Everyone knows it. That's why he attacks ESPN. That's why he attacks colleagues and contemporaries in the industry. It's not just because he thinks he's smarter. It's not just because he's fearful of anybody smarter than him in the same room. It's not just because of those reasons. It's because he truly despises us all. It's who he is. And the funny part about it is. Okay, the way that Twitter hyped this up, I thought this was going to be way more. Like, I thought he was going to ether him way harder. Damn, dude. Fucking sports Twitter gets, like, very little drama when it comes to actual commentators duking it out. It seems. I feel like they saved the best shit for television. It, this is just, like, 59 minutes. Like, it, it was way funnier when he was calling him fat. It hasn't started yet. What? It's 46 minutes? And it hasn't started. Okay, I'm just watching the fucking short version. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's unacceptable, dude. That's not all right. That's not all right. And please do not allow this to be a reflection on my character because this is not how I act every day. But I mean it from my soul when I say this is the worst human being I've ever known. I don't know of another human being worse than Jason Whitlock. He is a piece of shit. He's the dude that's going to have a funeral and ain't going to be no pallbearers. Might be two people to show up. He's that dude. He is the absolute worst. And he lies. And he incriminates. And he tries to set people up to fail, to big up himself because he can't do it on his own. He had a television show. He failed. He's had opportunities one time after another. He doesn't measure up. And now he's coming at the big dog. And let me tell you something right now. I am the big dog. I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one. There's plenty. Skip Bayless, apologies to him too for bringing. <laughs> he's saying. Jason Whitlock, worse than Hitler? Question mark. No, Jason Whitlock's name in the same sentence as him, but we all know what time it is. Everyone knows. We do. It's time for the top of the hour ad break, which, by the way, is literally the exact same length as this condensed version of the rant. And if you no longer want to see those ads, if you want to actually see the fucking final culmination of this whole process, this rant, without the three minute ads, then all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account where you get one free Prime subscription a month. Use it on your favorite broadcaster. You can also get gifted a sub if you're lucky. Use the three minute ad right now. Knows. All the executives at all the networks, they know what a piece of shit he is. And they begged me not to do this. But even my pastor, A.R. Bernard said, I'm not happy. But every now and then we got to do what we got to do. I promise you. And last to my sister, Carmen, I won't do this again. I promise you. I know you cringing. You didn't want me to do this. I'm sorry, sis. It was necessary. He's a sorry fat. Pastor said, let that chopper sing when it needs to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think getting a blessing from your pastor before you go in on Jason Whitlock is pretty funny. Piece of shit. A no of the worst order. That's who he is. Amen. And I want to make sure everybody knows that. And I said to Isaiah Thomas and I said to Dan Lebertard, if you care anything about our friendship, don't ever call me about him again. I'm a very forgiving person. Not with him. I don't care what beef I had. I don't care how many of you out there that hate me, whatever former athletes, all this stuff. Man, please, I'm sorry because I certainly don't hate y'all. We might have our differences from time to time. But ain't never that. This is the exception. I hate this bastard. <laughs> Not even far more than a little bit. He is the worst human being any of you will ever meet. You get within a mile of his presence. Wrap your arms around yourself to protect your soul. He is Cain. He is a devil. The worst. That's all I have to say. Y'all have a nice day. I'm going to go about my business. I will not speak about this piece of shit again. Peace and love. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Jason Whitlock is, is even A said it's on site if he ever runs the shit lock. I got to be honest, we watched that whole fucking thing and I have no idea what this man has did, done to him. I don't know. I mean, I guess he's like 
fucked him over before. But the real the real thing is that Jason Whitlock is just the worst. Like he he actually um he actually is just a, a horrible person. That's it. I think Stephen A. Smith cares more about how he's a backstabber and how he said he's like doesn't know how to write and things of that nature. Have you ever considered doing this uh, to no one in particular? A little bit. I mean, it's obvious to me that Stephen A. Smith does not care about Jason Woodlock's like white supremacy that much. I mean, I think he does care about it. Oh, he most recently said Stephen lied about his experiences in his book. Yeah, um, he definitely cares about the, the white supremacist aspect of it, but clearly not so much that like he hasn't uh, thrown aside his relationship with uh, Sean Hannity or, uh, or or Mark Levin. Do this for Ludwig? Dude, I got, I got so much smoke for Ludwig. Imagine if Stephen A. had to deal with the drama farming Twitch chat. The stun log or this will, on this will last hours. Let's watch this. I already watched this. I know what this is. I watched it on Reddit, actually, which is embarrassing to admit. Here's what it's like to enter in the house that's controlled by extreme germaphobe mom. So first thing first, I'm usually not allowed to enter in through the front door. My mom wants everyone to enter in through the garage because she believes the inside of my shoes are dirty. So I got to switch to sandals, but actually take off my socks first and put it in there. All I'm saying is, you know, his ass was wearing those sandals outside right off the jump. When I watched this video, that's my first thought was that that motherfucker did not actually change his sandals when he walked into the garage. He was wearing those sandals outside there. So my clean feet goes into the sandal and then close the garage door. But I got to wait until it's closed all the way first. And that's because she believes that light attracts flies. And then she doesn't. Also, she's right about that. I want the kitchen door open. So she wants the kitchen door to stay closed until the garage door is closed. So I no agree flies with that. Can fly in. Now, my house is two stories high, but I'm only restricted to the first floor. Now, my mom doesn't touch or sell anything in the first floor, and she doesn't allow my dad to as well, because I apparently made everything dirty. This is the only chair that she sits on in the kitchen to eat by herself. And she makes my dad sit in that one clean chair, and then these are my chairs. Anyways, I eat. I mean, he does keep it dirty. Look, look, what's this? You got a Celsius, a Red Bull, and a half-empty vitamin water. Clean up. Turns out your mom... It's not wrong, okay? Anyways, I usually just walk into my room and chill by myself and close the door and like shut everything out. This room is extremely big. Yeah, it's a really nice house, but I don't fucking feel happy in it. Cause here comes the other restrictions. I'm not allowed to use the other bathroom because it's clean for my mom. Okay, first of all, how is she gonna know? All I'm saying is she's not gonna know. Mom, I'm only allowed to use my bathroom in here because it's dirty. I remember what I said earlier. My mom doesn't use anything, nor does she allow my dad to use anything downstairs. Yet she still doesn't allow me to sit on these chairs or sit on these sofas right here because it's clean. Here's the weird part. She doesn't sit on them either because she thinks it's too dirty for her, but it's cleaner than me. So therefore, I am the dirtiest. Yeah. I cannot sit on these kind of clean sofas, but then she's way cleaner and she cannot sit on these either. So Yeah, she just has like severe OCD. No one just sits on them. I'm allowed to the bedroom next to my bedroom because this used to be a living room renovated as another bed. What I don't understand personally is like why the mom, I think has carpet in the kitchen. Like, or not. Yeah, like, look, this is the kitchen table area and there's a carpet there. Like, I don't have OCD, but I would lose my mind, okay? Like in the dining area next to the kitchen, there's like a carpet on the floor. Are you kidding me? How do you not rip that out? got an upstairs too this house is massive bro what do you live in a what this house is not massive okay unless you live in like new york city or something this is a very normal house chatter is a super common house in america okay <laughs> what the fuck you said this house is massive this is the most standard house in like the midwest nice house but i don't fucking feel happy in it i like to use my beer. i remember what i said earlier my mom doesn't use anything, nor does she allow my dad to use anything downstairs. Yet, she still doesn't allow me to sit on these chairs or sit on these sofas right here because it's clean. Here's the weird part. She doesn't sit on them either because she thinks it's too dirty for her, but it's cleaner than me. So therefore, I am the dirtiest. I cannot sit on these kind of clean. Be nice with poor people don't be used to this shit. Bro, this is literally dependent on what, dependent on what like time frame you're 
grandparents or your parents were able to get a house. This is like what every standard house used to look like. Like this was the standard American house. You know when like people talk about like the American dream in like from like the 1950s onward until like the 1990s, this is the most this is the most standard cookie cutter starter home that you would get and you just sit on it and you bought it for like $11 and a pack of gum and now it's worth like 7 gorillion dollars. So like you're looking at a house like this with today's eyes and you're thinking, "What do you mean? I went on Zillow and this house is 11 gorillion dollars." They bought the house in like 1974 for yeah, two packs of gum. Not one. I was lying about that. You're you're talking about a house that was purchased for two packs of gum on like a one person salary. And it was like, like there was no, there was no need for a mortgage even, but then they got a mortgage, $15 and some chewing tobacco. Yeah. So fuss. But then she's way cleaner and she cannot send these either. So no one just sits on them. I'm allowed to the bedroom next to my bedroom. Cause this used to be a living room renovated as another bedroom. This is actually my sister's room. This is where my friend was staying actually earlier. Cause my sister has gone for college. This room has been like dirty because of me. So she just gave up and gave it to me. I'm actually not allowed to go upstairs, even though we have two more rooms. My dad stays in that room up there. My mom stays in the room down the hall. Right now they're out. So usually they will come back, transfer from the shoe and step directly into these shoes. You cannot step <laughs> on anything else because it's dirty. You have to step from your shoe directly into these shoes. So you have a massive space then, classic bullshitter. Me, my house is probably the same size as this house. I would assume maybe a little bit bigger. And then my parents will walk around this house in sandals so their feet stay clean. But then they transfer to another set of sandals when they go upstairs. So they keep their feet even cleaner. But the upstairs is still cleaner than the ground down here. I don't know if you guys are following. Because it's fucking complicated. I have restrictions. I've never been upstairs ever since we moved back to my childhood home of trauma. But yeah, that's pretty much what it's like to walk around my house. And all these restrictions apply everywhere. Are you going to recap the ICJ hearing? Bro, it's so funny. This guy came in and he kept asking. I think this is the same guy that was like, are you going to talk about, are you going to talk about Yemen? Are you going to talk? Oh, it's not this guy. Never mind. There's like a couple people that keep asking about whether I'm going to talk about Yemen or if I'm going to recap the ICJ thing. Brother, I talked about this for hours. Okay. Literally for hours early on in the broadcast. Okay. It's fucking dumb as shit. Anyway. Chatters do not pretend like this mother is sane. No, I don't think anybody... I mean, I was memeing. Yeah, no, she's definitely severely not right. <laughs> Restrictions in that house is still so privileged. Okay, everybody calm down. Like, what? He posted another video of her yelling at him over stupid shit. As a child of one extremely clean parent and one who's a hoarder. I've had to implement shit like that just trying to keep it manageable and it's not insane. He goes upstairs and her part of the house is messy as fuck. Wait, let me see. Give me the give me the next tweet. These moms are like that. It's pretty common, I think. Or maybe I'm just traumatized. I don't think it's common. It's not common for me. <sighs> upstairs tour. Oh, I want to see the upstairs real bad. All the things I'm not allowed to do when I'm living at home with a mom that has all these issues. By the way, he's just reading his mom to filth a little bit. You know what I mean? It's like at this point, it might be a HIPAA violation. You know what I'm saying? My mom is OCD, germaphobe, narcissist, ADHD, bipolar. Just like, doesn't seem like, doesn't seem like he likes his mom that much. He's being so ableist. Wait, what? Wait, why is he being ableist? He's just like, he's just upset about the conditions that he's, he has to live Jeez. in. Because I'm dirty and my mom's clean, I'm not allowed to cook in the kitchen. I'm not allowed to use this dining table. I'm not allowed to use this half. Okay, there's something wrong with me, but like, I do think this color of like green hue blue is actually very cute and it's clearly consistent throughout the entire house the accents are all this color and i think it's like the most like it, it actually in my opinion is the saving grace of the whole thing the doors were that color the the kitchen cabinets are that color and even uh the cabinets in the other room in his sister's room are also that color i thought it was cool i was to use this dining table i'm not allowed to use this half of the table only this half because it's mine and it's dirty yeah you die it's dirty this side is clean it's from my dad mm. i'm not allowed to go inside this bathroom like these I'm doors are cute this printer or the tv no one's allowed to sit on the sofa and chair inside the living room okay but i don't give a fuck because my mom's not home 
I have an area in the refrigerator that only me, I can use. It's right here. All the dirty stuff is right here. Everything else here is clean. I'm not allowed to go upstairs because the entire upstairs is clean. It's divided by clean sandals and they also have All right, come on, get up there. Let's see. Downstairs. But I don't give a fuck right now because again, they're not home. So I'm fucking going upstairs. I don't give a shit. This is literally my second time sneaking up here when they're gone for like what, the past year since I moved back? Okay, and my mom's room just looks like a fucking mental asylum. What the fuck is going on? She hides stuff up here too. So I know a lot of shit that she's lying. Literally. Why is everything like a fucking weird mess right now? This is my dad's room. I don't know. She does have a fucking sewing machine, so she is lying to me. She told me it's not working. I still remember running up and down these hallways as a kid. The few times that my mom didn't force me to stay in the garage. But yeah, my theory kind of applies is that my mom has been going crazier and crazier. Her OCD before made her stuff actually... That doesn't mean it doesn't work. I have severe OCD. It's not about the actual cleanliness of that. It's about how it feels. These rules are because they feel wrong for her. Honestly, incredibly sad for this kid. Yeah, but also, like, his vibes are kind of fucked. You know what I mean? Like, maybe the mom doesn't even have OCD, and she's just like, bro, you're not chill. You're, like, not a chill-ass kid. You know what I mean? If you were more chill, we could be blazing up here, you know? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Please don't get mad at me. <laughs> It's right. so really neat, organized in an aesthetic and artistic way because my mom was a graphic designer growing up. That's where I got the art talent from. But her other disorders are taking over, her OCD just getting worse. She places stuff in a very peculiar way that keeps stuff clean and also more convenient for her. So to the average organized person or a person with slight OCD, her room did not look fucking aesthetic at all. It's just fucking crazy. I don't know, man. She needs help, but she just won't get it. Why did she force him to stay in the garage? Because he's dirty. I mean, but then again, he did grow up in a, in a fucked up household. So that's probably why the vibes are a little off. You know what I mean? The vibes are a bit, a, a, the vibes are a bit off. Anyway. All right. Speaking of the vibes being off, that's it for me today. That's nine hours again. Dude, I have been posting up, dude. Nine hours of nonstop wall to wall coverage content. We did sports Twitter. We uncovered a new front in the war in the Middle East. What is happening in the Gulf? Crazy. Who's out here doing it like this? Okay, nine hours. Please, no more sports. No, I, I, I every now and then I enjoy Stunning diving into the world of sports chatter. You got to do it to them. Um, anyway, are you enjoying streaming more now? Like, why the uptick in hours? I am enjoying streaming. Um, I think it's because, like, today's the first day I yelled. I broke my yelling fast. So that's why. I mean, hopefully I won't break it again. I'm going to go back to not yelling. Tomorrow's a fresh start. Um, I, I'm a no fap, no yell Andy, you know? Anyway, love you guys. See you tomorrow, okay? No yelling. Kind of one another. LGBTQ Air Force The hole left at your fingertips On A at your door The H3 crowd update The Young Turks online show Three full fucking years of this Plenty more to go 90 day fiance talks of champagne bourgeoisie A Trump rally live reaction on mass riot at DC There he is again, a sun is streaming, a sun is streaming Austin's
show child bites And all the ways the right wing pipeline can suck you in the line JCS React Lord frame is broken cover blown A full blown mess pandemic monster streaming at your Total radicalization coming out to find The system you were taught to trust in was broken the whole time and All these daily streams, whether big or whether small Have helped me and so many find the meaning through it there he is again, the sun is streaming, the sun is streaming. There he is again, the sun is streaming, the sun is streaming.